The makers of Chase and Sanborn Coffee bring you Etty Bergen, Charlie McCarthy, and Mortimer Snurd with Ray Noble and his orchestra, Joan Merrill, yours truly, Jim Amici, and Charlie's special guest, Orson Welles. We have a song by that lovely, vivacious, charming personality, none other than... Your obedient servant, Orson Welles. You may applaud if you care to. What is this? That's quite all right, gentlemen. Don't bother to curtsy. <laughs> Orson Welles. <laughs> Long time no see. But not long enough. Yeah. <laughs> ah, Charles, Charles, it's indeed a great pleasure to meet my old compatriot and worthy opponent of many a battle of wits. Yeah? Mm. Gee, do you mean that, or, or is this a booby trap? <laughs> yeah, Charles, I really mean it. Well, that's nice, gentlemen. Then we should have a very pleasant reunion this evening. Oh, I'm sorry, Edgar, but I must hurry off to give a very important lecture at the museum tonight. Yeah. Uh, you give a lecture at the museum? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. I'll have you know I have brains. I'm not just a pretty face. <laughs> no, you're not. No. Charlie, but let's attend Orson's lecture tonight. Yeah. Yeah, that has possibilities, yeah. Oh, I doubt if you can find me. I'll be on the third floor among the anthropoid apes. Well, wear your hat so we'll know you. Yuck, 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 yuck. We have very funny lines here tonight, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> uh, please uh, stick to the script, Orson. Maybe you can't read. Oh, no. Uh, well, I shall prove it. I shall prove it by doing a uh, reading as only Orson Welles can do it. Would you like to hear a soliloquy from Hamlet or a speech from Julius Caesar? I'd like to hear a song from Joe Merrill. Oh, that's nice of you, Charlie. I'll be glad to sing for you. You mean I don't give my reading? Uh, no. Very well. May I say it was nice being among friends, even though they weren't mine. <laughs> Goodbye. <laughs> And now, Joni, getting back to your song. How many hearts have you broken? Oh, I really haven't kept track. <laughs> Must be hundreds, even thousands. Must add them up sometime. Yeah. How many hearts have you broken? With those great, big, beautiful eyes. Those great, big, beautiful eyes. That tell such beautiful eyes. How many times have you kissed somebody Like you kissed me just then I don't believe you mean it But baby, kiss me again How many hearts have you stranded On the dreamy road to romance Baby, I'll take a chance I need some lovers I just can't resist you Even though I'm wise how many hearts you have broken With those great, big, beautiful Hearts you have broken with those great big beautiful eyes. <laughs> oh, Mr. Bergen. Yes, Charlie. You know it's uh, it's getting mighty close to Halloween time now. Yes. And uh, I was uh, 
I was wondering what you were going to do to make my Halloween a happy one. I see. Just wondering how much you were going to do. That's all. I see. Well, of course, Charlie, I do want to do something. Oh, I just knew you'd come through. Yes. Could you give me an inkling? Well, I, yes, yes, I know what I'll do. What? I'll, um, I'll tell you a ghost story. He, a ghost story? Yes. Can you afford it? Oh, yes. <laughs> I say, Edgar, old boy, uh, couldn't you tell us one now? Well, I'd be glad to, Ray. <laughs> yes, I love ghost stories, you know. They frighten me out of my wits. It was just me good to get out once in a while, you know. <laughs> May I listen to? Well, of course, Joni. You know, I'd better hold your hand. You know, you might get scared. Oh, Charlie, I'm not afraid of ghosts. Oh, you know. Well, I am, so you better hold mine, then. <laughs> there. You comfy now? Hmm? Comfy, yeah? Oh. Now, first of all, do you folks believe in ghosts? I hardly believe in people. All right. Now. <laughs> well, you believe this one because it's not only a ghost story, but it's an actual experience. <laughs> They all start that way. <laughs> this one is an actual experience. Tell it. Don't sell it. All right. <laughs> You'll find this story very fascinating. Well, hold everything while I put on my fascinator. Yes, all right. <laughs> to begin with, a friend of mine named Joe Franklin bought an old eight-room house in Hoosick Falls, which is a small town in Upper New York. How far is Hoosick Falls? From where? Thank you. <laughs> Doesn't seem like the right answer. No, no. Well, anyway, my friend bought this old eight-room house. Was it a two-story? No, it's a ghost story. All right. <laughs> As a matter of fact, Joan, it was a two-story house. But the upstairs was never used. Why? Because there was a rumor that it was haunted. It was, huh? Yes. It was what? Haunted. Inhabited by ghosts. Yeah, but, uh, look, uh, didn't Joe Husick know that before he bought the place? Well, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, no, Ray, his name is Joe Franklin, and the house is in Husick Falls. I see. Yes. Well, you want to watch that, eh, do Yes, I'm... Careful. <laughs> <laughs> you mean... Well, <laughs> no, are you... He's really sharp. Yes, yeah, yeah. Did, did Joe Falls know that when Husick was haunted? Oh, oh not me. The name is Franklin, and the house was in Hoosick Falls. Well, don't get sore. Don't get sore. It was an eight-story, two-room house. No, I mean, no, no, no. But you mean it was an eight-house, two-story room? Yeah, yeah no, no. no. <laughs> Sounds very unlikely. Yeah. Anybody live in it? Well, of course. Hoosick lived downstairs. Now, wait And raised goats upstairs. <laughs> I got well, wait a minute. One. Who lived in what? Mr. Poughkeepsie lived in Schenectady. Oh, now stop it, Charlie. Now, if you don't want to hear this story, say so. So? No. <laughs> oh, now, come on, chaps. Huh? Oh, now, come on, fellas. I mean, uh, Edgar, tell us the rest of the story. Now, uh, uh, now wait a minute. Let's get this clear. Uh, what is your friend's name? Oh, let's forget he's my friend. Oh, all right. Yes. Oh, forgetting friends. That's fine. Uh, too good for him. No, no, I'm not too good for him, and I'm not forgetting friends. You're not? No. Isn't so, Becky? Isn't so? No, no. I shall proceed. I was the first person brave enough to enter this house and spend the night in the upstairs bedroom. Stout fella. Stout fella. The man has good... Uh, gumption. <laughs> Fooled you, didn't I? Yes, yes, yes. Boldly, I walked up the stairs, and bravely, I entered the room. And then you fainted. No, I didn't. <laughs> At the stroke of midnight, I heard peculiar noises, as if someone were tapping on the walls. And I heard footsteps. Footsteps on the ceiling. Where? Uh-huh. Snootful, huh? No, no, no. First I thought the noise was a ghost. And then I thought it wasn't. And then I thought it was. But this is no time for shilly-shallying. Either it was or it wasn't. Let's face it. Then all of a sudden, a white figure seemed to be moving around the room. Moving around without a head. I say, you know, that's quite a coincidence, old boy. Yeah. really is. Yes, the other day, you know, there was something running around my room without any legs. No. <laughs> yes. <laughs> what was it? Water, old boy. Water. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that settles it. Settles what? That. 
I'm not going to finish the story. Why? I am not going to make a fool of myself. Oh, I don't know about that. Yes. You're right. I have made a fool of myself. Oh, come now, Bergen. You're so sensitive. And so right. <laughs> The crowning pleasure at the table, with meals, of course, is your coffee. Besides that, if you've chosen well, coffee by itself can be an occasion. When you've chosen Chase and Sanborn coffee, every cup is an occasion. Ample reason in itself to take a few moments mid-morning or mid-afternoon to enjoy its superb flavor. What's more, hand-in-hand with the extra flavor of Chase and Sanborn coffee comes the boost that helps you get things done. So, on every count... This longtime favorite goes on winning new friends every day. In the past year, more people changed to Chase and Sanborn coffee than to any other kind on the market. That's the biggest swing in coffee history. A swing to finer flavor. Take advantage of this opportunity. Get all the flavor you're entitled to. Get the product of 80 years of experience blending the choice coffees of the world. That's the secret of Chase and Sanborn flavor. The secret of your satisfaction. Always ask your grocer for Chase and Sanborn coffee. Oh, Jim, Ray. Uh, yes, Edgar. Yes, yeah, I want you to both keep Tuesday night open. I've decided to give Charlie a Halloween party and surprise him. Why, certainly, Edgar. I'll be glad to come. Yes, yes me too. I say it sounds awfully jolly. Uh, are we going to play games? Yes, yes. And I also want you to wear costumes. Oh, fine, fine. I'll wear my dark brown suit, put a lump of sugar behind each ear, pour cream on my head, and come as a cup of Chase and Sanborn coffee. No, no. <laughs> and I'm going to put a candle in my mouth and come as a, as, as a Johnny Lamp. Yeah, a Johnny Lamp. Yeah, Johnny Lamp, yeah. No, yes. no, you... Oh, you mean a jack-o'-lantern. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yes. Oh, you see, that way, Edgar, that way I can be lit all evening. Yes, you can. Yes. You get it, don't you? I mean, about the lantern no. being lit. Yes. Lit the lantern. You don't have to go any farther, <laughs> no? No. Who else is coming, Edgar? Well, I've invited everybody. Joel Merrill and... Uh... Oh, I almost forgot. Where's Mortimer? Mortimer! Mortimer! <laughs> Help, help. Is you is or is you ain't my bergen? All right. <laughs> well, Mortimer. Well, yeah, that's me. Yes. Say, I want to tell you. Oh, quite. Now, show us now. Mortimer, hmm? I'm giving a party. Well, that's nice. That's nice. Yes. Who's it for? Hmm? It's Halloween. Hmm? For Halloween. Well, I don't believe I know him. No. <laughs> it's a Halloween party. Oh, I see what you mean now. Yes, and you're invited. Hmm. That's nice, ain't it? Well, of course it is. Do, do you want me? Do you want me to? Uh, uh, do you want me to wear a wear a a, a false face? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> no, no. I don't think you'll need one. No. <laughs> You're just flattering me. No, I'm not. Uh. Then we shall expect you. I, I, uh... Mm hmm? I, um... I say, then we'll expect you? Expect me to what? Uh, well, uh, to be at the party. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think so. I'll, I'll be there if I can get the time off from, from the job. You see, I got a job. You have a job? Mm hmm. Yep. Yep, so he goes on. Mm. How to do? Damn. What kind of work are you doing? Hmm? I say, what kind of work are you doing? Well, I've been, uh, I've been, uh, uh, I go to work, uh, I see, uh, what was the question? Well, was the question? Yeah. <laughs> what kind of work are you doing? Well, uh, what do you, what do you call a fellow, what do you call a fellow that, uh, washes a window? That washes a window? Yeah, uh, you call him, um, see, uh, a window washer? Uh, yeah, yeah, that's right. Uh, well, is that what you do? Yeah, that's what I do. Well, hanging on the outside of those buildings doesn't seem like a very good job. Yeah, well, it keeps me off the streets. Yes, it does. Yeah. 
Wait, who? <laughs> That's pretty good. <laughs> yeah. Mortimer, how long does it take you to wash your window? I, um, I say, how long does it take you to wash your window? Well, there's, um... That, of course, depends on. Yeah. On what? Well, on uh, what's going on inside the window. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Do you get paid by the window? I, mm, I say, do you get paid by the window? No, no, no. Get paid by the boss. By the boss, yeah. <laughs> Mortimer, how can you be so stupid? Well, I get plenty of sleep and good exercise. I imagine. <laughs> You know, you know, fellas, this should be interesting. I, I hope it's free. Right this way, right this way, gentlemen. Buy your tickets here. Buy your tickets oh, you gotta here. Oh, you got to buy tickets, right I see. Yeah, Ray, you and Charlie go ahead. I, I got a stone in my shoe. Oh, come on, Bergen. He always pulls that near a box office. <laughs> I say, uh, how much are they? Twenty-five cents. Children, ten cents. Babes in arms, free. Uh, no, you don't, Bergen. Put me down. <laughs> all right, all right. Put me down. That'll be sixty cents, bud. Yeah, uh, but yes, uh, sixty cents. Yes, uh, but 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 my name is Edgar Bergen. Sorry, but all people have names. Yeah. 
All right, here's your money. Here's your, here's your tickets. Thanks, suckers. <laughs> I'm certainly going to report that smart, Alec. Here you are, folks. Get your programs. You can't tell a chattering baboon from your mother-in-law without a program. <laughs> Why, Orson, I thought you were giving a lecture here. What are you doing with that guide coat on? Well, it's rather cold in here. I see. <laughs> that explanation ain't so hot either. <laughs> Don't tell me, Orson, that you're just a guide. Well, certainly. I'll do anything to further the cause of education mm -hmm. and also to pick up an extra buck. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have a complaint to make. After we paid our admission, the ticket seller called us suckers. There's no admission charge here. There isn't? No, sucker. Uh, sir. <laughs> Wait a minute. Now, here's a ticket right here. It says good for one admission to the New York World's Fair. Yeah, well, there you go. <laughs> no, no, look. No, fellas. Look, we came to hear a lecture. So, uh, get on with it, my good man. <laughs> Very well. Gentlemen, right over here is the first exhibit. It starts with the evolution of man. It was over 80 million years ago that Lobar Molossus, or the lungfish, first crawled out of the deep, abysmal swamp, reeking with a dank, sultry smell of fetid vegetation. What do you suppose it did? Held its nose? No. <laughs> No, it continued to adapt itself to its new environment so that upon that supposition we believe that man is a descendant of the fish. <laughs> Are you descended from a fish, Ray? <laughs> <laughs> well, of course. Uh, I must confess that in the spring I, I do have a mad desire to swim upstream. <laughs> you know... <laughs> We have the Mastanoni, uh, the Triceratops, and the Monoclonias. Leaving on track two. <laughs> and in this group are the Tyrannosaurs, the Brontosaurs, and the Dinosaurs. And a whiskey sour. Make it two. Uh, please. Please. Quiet. Are there any questions? When did they live? Well, they were here as recently as 15 million years ago. Hmm. Oh, that's a shame. We just missed them. <laughs> I say, uh, uh, was this, uh, uh, this fossil uh, a man-killing beast? No, this was a docile fossil. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and stop feeding it peanuts. Can't you see it's only a skeleton? I know, old chap. I was only feeding him the shells. <laughs> well, in that case. Now, let's all get back to the Miocene age. Uh, you go. I'll wait here. Mm -hmm. This period goes way back when old faithful Geyser was just a little squirt. Or even before the Dead Sea took sick. <laughs> Isn't that keen? <laughs> I made that up myself. Yeah. Well, I did. Yeah. Orson, you're forcing. Yeah. <laughs> let, let's see now. Where was I? Yeah. Uh, something interesting. Something yeah. very interesting. Oh, yes. I was talking about myself. Yeah. Are there any questions? How can we get our money back? <laughs> now, if you'll step a little closer, we want to keep the sidewalk clear. I'd like to give you a scientific demonstration of the little marble potato peeler. No, no, no I'm sorry, sorry. That's, sorry. that's another lecture I have. It's quite a different subject now. That's Say, what is that skeleton? Uh, well, it's the duck-billed dinosaur, or trachodon. Well, make up your mind. Which one is it? Well, it's one and the same. Oh. You know, there are some people who actually don't know... The difference between a stegosaurus from a brontosaurus. Oh, right. heavens, let's have nothing to do with them. <laughs> Are there any questions? Yes. Where can we get another guide? Quiet. A good point. Now, over here we have the Hall of Living Mammals. Well, where are the pebbles? Home with the kittles. So. Oh. Now, shut up. Yeah. Now, we come to the Paleontholic exhibit. Here is the Neanderthal or Homo Neanderthalensis. <laughs> They hardly got in, did they? <laughs> what does that mean? Are uh, the Homer Neanderthalans sisters? Yes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I'm darned if I know, but doesn't it sound impressive? Yeah. <laughs> uh, now, according to the genealogist, there was the trineal man, or mm. pithecanthropus, followed by the piltdown man, or aoanthropus ventriloquus bergoni. Yes. Would you mind dragging that past again in low gear? <laughs> Quiet, please. You're so noisy, I can't hear what I'm saying. You're not missing a thing. <laughs> now, in this case here, we have the perfect example of the pre-Neanderthal man, or missing link. Yeah, but, Professor... Notice the expressionless eyes, the receding forehead, and the flat, 
cranium. Yes, but Professor... It's the most illiterate face I ever looked at. I got a TL for you. You're looking in a mirror. Yeah. <laughs> well, Edgar, how was your visit to the museum? Well, it was very interesting. We learned all about the Neanderthal man, the Cro-Magnon man, and the Java man. Well, speaking of Java, man, that really yeah. starts me on a train of pleasant yeah. memories. A good food, good company, and your own good pleasure at sight of a cup and saucer. The sight of your coffee cup is a promise, too, when there's Chase and Sanborn coffee on hand. The promise of all the coffee satisfaction a cup can possibly hold. So fill it up, drink up, and have another. Enjoy the richer, more flavorful blend that made the second cup famous. Through the past 80 years, Chase and Sanborn flavor has made history become a tradition. And in the past year, more people changed to Chase and Sanborn coffee than to any other kind on the market. That's the biggest swing in coffee history. But even so, it's only half the story. Besides that, in the hotel and restaurant field where coffee simply has to be good, Chase and Sanborn are the leading coffee roasters. You're entitled to all this extra goodness, so make sure that you get it. Ask your grocer for delicious Chase and Sanborn coffee every time. Well, Charlie, after visiting the museum, I suppose you can tell your schoolmates where all the prehistoric monsters came from now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's from the prehistoric club. No, 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 no. No, they remember, they, they came from the Ice Age. Yeah. And that was way back when Mother Nature, for thousands of years, wore an ice cap. Oh, she must have had a terrific hangover. Yes. <laughs> And do you realize those dinosaurs we looked at in the museum? Yes. Do you realize that they weighed 30 tons? No. Yes. 30 tons? Yes. Is that strip? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the strip. Yes. Be with us again next week when Edgar Bergen, Charlie McCarthy, Effie Clinker, Austin Wells, Joan Merrill, Ray Noble, and all of us be on hand. And Charlie will take over tips on models with that famous authority on the subject, Mr. John Bowers. This week, when you're buying coffee, think of us and ask for Chase and Sanborn coffee. Coffee made to serve in times like these. This is Jim Amici saying goodnight from New York's Radio City. <laughs> already know about vitamins, but here's something you may not know. According to a U.S. government survey, three out of four people were not getting an adequate diet. Thus, they probably lacked not merely vitamins, but minerals as well. More than that, science tells us that without adequate minerals, you cannot even hope to get the full benefit of some vitamins. And that's why millions will want to try exciting new STAMS tablets, for STAMS give you both vitamins and minerals. Yes, Stams give you minerals, too. Not just a few, but nine. Nine minerals. And these nine minerals are added to eight vitamins, including every vitamin as well as every mineral recognized as essential by the U.S. government. Yes, eight vitamins plus nine minerals are in Stams. Just read the label for full information and dosage. And today, ask your druggist for S-T-A-M-S. Stams. <laughs> This is the National Broadcasting Company. Adam Hatz presents... The Strange Dr. Weird. Good evening. Come in, won't you? Say, what's the matter? Surely you're not nervous. Uh, perhaps it will help calm you if I tell you a story I heard just the other day about a fortune that can be yours for the taking. All you have to do is go and get it. I call the story The House Where Death Lived. Before you and I walk into the terrifying darkness of Dr. Weird's world, I think it's only fair on behalf of our sponsor to warn you 
that you'd better hurry if you want to see the latest fall line in up-to-the-minute Adam Hat. Believe me, gentlemen, there's no better hat value anywhere in America than an Adam, worn by the famous, favorite of millions. There are thousands of Adam hat shops and authorized dealers from coast to coast. Stop in your nearest Adam hat shop tomorrow. Now, Dr. Weir. My story, The House Where Death Lived, begins with two men crouching in the bushes, staring at a great lonely old mansion on top of a windswept hill. Well, there it is. Spooky old joiner. Yeah, I don't like this job. Hey, you're nuts. We couldn't ask for anything easier. Yeah, but somehow that place gives me the creeps. What do you mean? You're a detective, remember? A private dick here to protect the old boy. Yeah, yeah, all right. Well, okay, let's get on inside and tell the old guy the detectives, Murphy and Smith, are here. Now, wait a minute. In town, they said old man Crawford has a handyman who stays with him until after dark and then goes home. We're going to wait. I'd rather see the old man alone. You get me? And so the two men waited in the gathering darkness outside until Frank, the handyman, left for the night. Two moments later, they banged the old bronze knocker on the front door of the ancient house. What's that? It must be a loudspeaker, of course. Yeah, quite right. Here's a loudspeaker. Are you Smith and Murphy, the detectives I sent for? Yeah, yeah, we are. Come in, please. You'll find me upstairs in my bedroom. A minute later, old Joshua Crawford, sitting up in bed, surveyed his two visitors. So you're my detectives. Which of you is Murphy and which of you is Smith? Uh, I'm Sam Murphy and this is my partner, Bill Smith. I... I'm glad you're here. Very glad. I have work for you to do. In a vault in the cellar are jewels worth a quarter of a million dollars. And those jewels must be carefully guarded. Because they're bait for a trap I'm setting. A trap to catch seven murderers. A trap to catch seven murderers? Yes. Ten years ago, I was a wealthy man. I had a home on Long Island. And I had a daughter whom I loved. I had a son-in-law who was like a son to me. Then one night, when I was away on business, a gang of thieves, seven of them, invaded my house. They were after the jewels I kept in a vault there, a vault to which only I knew the combination. Say, do you mean to shut shut up? Uh, go on, Mr. Crawford. Those seven men would not believe I was the only one who could open that vault. In the end, they killed my daughter and her husband. I see. So uh, you're that Crawford, huh? Yes. I spent my entire fortune trying to trace the criminals. In the end, I succeeded. Huh? You did? Yes. I learned their names. They were called Big Jim Donovan, Trigger Thompson, Nicky Lavender, Tony Morton, Freddie Lake, Johnny Frisco, and Lefty Williams. Uh, a tough bunch of monkeys. How do you know their guilt? I know. I spent a million dollars to find out. And all my money was gone. All with the jewels for which my children were murdered. Those I kept. I came here with them to bait a trap for murder. You mean that... Listen... I know where five of those seven men are. All except Johnny Frisco and Lefty Williams. Yeah. Now, if I say I know those men are guilty, even though I couldn't prove it in court, would you agree that they should be punished? Absolutely, Mr. Crawford. And if I can lure them here, would you help me execute them? Uh, uh, Execute them? Yes. Help me to punish these men I've named. And the jewels in the vault are yours. Well, what do you say? We're your men. Those rats deserve executing. And, Mr. Crawford, if you can get them inside this house, we'll be the executioners. In just a moment, we'll return to our story and learn what happens to the murder trap set by old Joshua Crawford. Meantime, I believe Dr. Weird would welcome a brief escape from his shadowy world. Am I right, Doctor? Yes. Yes, young man, you are right. All of us welcome the world of bright sunshine, far from the terrors of the night. I could say uh, more. But... You rest a moment, Doctor. I'll say more. How pleasant it is, gentlemen, during these bright days of fall sunshine to step along knowing you're feeling right and looking right. And nothing gives that right look to a man like a really smart fall hat. Next time you're near an Adam hat store, stop for a minute and glance into the window. Some style, huh? Notice the variety of fall hats on display. Then step inside and try one on. You'll find the hat for you. 
perfect fashion, perfect fit, no matter what shape head you have. See the latest Adam 5, genuine hand block, fine all fur felt hats, up to the minute in style. Price, only $5. They're America's famous hat value. Other Adam hats are $3.45 to $10. Now, I see Dr. Weird is ready for the rest of tonight's play. Doctor? Now to continue my little story of the house where death lived. Old Joshua Crawford, promising to tell the detectives more about his strange plan for vengeance in the morning, has dismissed them and fallen asleep. And Smith and Murphy are talking. <laughs> the idea of him trying to punish seven tough killers. Yeah, there's something about this setup I don't like. Ah, forget it. It's just luck he sent for us. Our good luck, see? Someday we'll run across Big Jim Donovan or one of the others and tell him about it. Oh, will they get a laugh? Yeah, come to think of it, where is Big Jim and Trigger and Nicky these days? Keep our ears open. We ain't heard a word of them for months. Yeah, they're smart and lying low, that's all. Now can it, will you? We got something to do tonight. We got to prove we're good detectives by finding that vault those jewels are in. Come on, let's get going. <laughs> For an hour, the two men silently prowled the big house while old Joshua Crawford slept. Then, in a far corner of the cellar... Hey! Hey, I found it! This door's a dummy, see? Well, look, here's the door of a vault right behind it. Yeah, yeah, but look at it. It's like a bank vault. We'll never get it open. Well, what are we going to do? Wait till tomorrow and see if we can get the old man to tell us the combination? No. We'll get that combination from him tonight. How about that combination, Mr. Crawford? Or shall I tell Sam to use that cigarette again? Oh, no, I'll tell. Seven right, thirteen left, four right, ten left, and zero. Seven right, thirteen left, four right, ten left, and zero. Now, try it. That does it. He was telling the truth. Yeah, a fat lot of good it'll do him. Come on. Let's see what's inside. Great gosh, the whole room in here. Yeah, I'll say it is. The walls are solid stone, too. Look, here's a little table with a cash box on it. Open it. Has it got the jewels in it? <laughs> I'll say it has. Look at them. Diamonds, rubies, emeralds. A quarter of a million bucks worth. <laughs> yeah, what's so funny? Oh, what a laugh, that crazy old coot. Saying he was going to use this ice for bait for seven murderers. <laughs> now we got the bait. <laughs> I don't like it down here. Come on, let's put the ice in our pockets and get out of here. Okay, I'm ready. <laughs> huh? What is it? That vault door. It's shut. No, it can't be. Well, it is. There's no way to open it from this side. But it's got to be. Push against it. It's got to open. Uh, it's, it's locked. We're locked in. Yeah, but how could it be? Hey, how did it happen? It happened when you lifted the cash box. An electric mechanism locked the vault door when the rat took the bait. That's him. That's his voice. Yes, I mean to the loudspeaker. The whole house is wired with loudspeakers and microphones, you see. I've heard every word you uttered. Listen, Mr. Crawford, you got us wrong. We weren't really going to hurt you. No, no, no. Now you got to let us out of here. To be sure. Push on the stone directly behind the cash box. Yeah. A hidden door will open. A hidden door, yeah? Yeah, I got you. Come on, Bill. Right, here's the stone. Help me push it. The whole wall's open. Here's the room on the other side. I find it a much larger room in there, I assure you. Come on, Bill. Must be a way out. Now the wall is close on my head. It's time to go there. No, it's too late. Never mind. You won't be lonely. Look about you. Huh? You'll find many old friends to keep you company. What's he talking about? I don't know. Shine your light around. Yeah. <laughs> Look. Seven coffins. Seven coffins in a row on the floor. Look inside them. You'll find your friends. The dry air has preserved them very well. Big Jim Donovan on this one. And here. Here's Trigger Thompson. Mickey Lavender. Tony Morton. Freddie Lee. These last two arrested. Yes. They're for you unless you wish to confess and stand trial. Confess. What do you mean, confess? That you are Johnny Frisco and Lefty Williams. The last two of the seven murderers I've been seeking for ten years. No, no, no. It took my detectives a long time to find you. You were clever. From being crooks, you changed your names and became private detectives. But I found you at last. Now will you confess and stand No, down? no, you're wrong, I Mr. gave the others the same chance, but each refused to confess. Look at them. They died a far more painful death than the electric chair. They died of starvation. Okay, Mr. Crawford. 
Crawford, we confess. I am Johnny Frisco. Bill is Lefty Williams. Yes, yes. Now come down, let us out. You got a lot of stand trying to hear. You got him. <laughs> I can't come down to let you out. You've tied me up. I can't get loose. You'll have to stay there until Frank arrives in the morning to set me loose. <laughs> Unfortunately, poor old Mr. Crawford was unable to release his two victims from the trap he'd set for them. In the morning, he was found tied up and laughing, unable to speak a single intelligent word. He's in an asylum now, still laughing. The Frisco and Lefty, well, they're still down in that secret room. Their pockets stuffed with jewels. But by now, of course, they're probably quite dead. So if you want the jewels, you only have to go there and open the vault, and you have to go now. Hmm, too bad. But perhaps you'll drop in on me again soon. I'm always home. Just look for the house on the other side of the cemetery. The house of Dr. Weir. That man will be back here again in a moment with a word about next week's scalp tingler. Meantime, it's not very far from scalp to hat. And having gone that far, perhaps I should remind you that this program is brought to you by Adam Hat, America's famous hatter. Seriously, gentlemen, I hope you'll take a look at the latest fall line of Adam Hat. Their top quality, identified by the famous Adam Crest. And their price, three forty-five to ten dollars. Visit your Adam Hat shop tomorrow. Now, that man, Dr. Weir. I hope you'll drop in again next week. I want to tell you about a cat that had a human soul. Or at least acted as if it had. And so it... Ah, but the rest of the story will have to wait until your next visit. Good night. <laughs> Join us again next week at the same time for another visit with the strange Dr. Weir. The strange Dr. Weir, directed by Jock McGregor, is presented by the makers of Adam Hats. The hats that are always topped in quality. This is Mutual. Adam Hats presents... Strange Dr. Weird. Good evening. Come in, won't you? You seem a bit nervous. Perhaps it would calm you a little if I were to read to you from the secret journal of Professor Drake. It's a fascinating tale. I call it Journey into the Unknown. There are some extremely interesting entries in Professor Drake's journal, particularly those beginning with the entry made October 1st, which reads, Today my son Paul has reached the final stages in the preparation of his serum number 17. After two years of intensive work and 16 failures, he believes that he's at last succeeded. But just think of it, Paul. Before you took the serum, you could only lift 200 pounds. But now you can lift 400. Why, your strength has been doubled. Yes. With the added strength my serum will give him, man will be able to resist diseases that he succumbs to now. His lifespan will be lengthened by 20 or 30 years. Perhaps he... No, I'll answer it, Paul. Oh, it's you, Julia. Yes, I want to see Paul. Oh, you can't, Julia. He's right in the midst of an experiment. But I haven't seen or heard from him in two weeks. After all, I am his fiancé. But, Julia, he can't be disturbed. He's in the... Oh, oh. hello, darling. Why, Julia. Oh, oh Paul, you... You squeeze me so tightly. I'm... I'm sorry, dear. I'm afraid I don't know my own strength. Oh, that's all right. 
Well, what kind of experiment is it you're working on? Darling, I can't reveal anything yet. Not even to you. But when my work is done, you'll be the first one to hear about it. Here's the entry for October 7th. Theorem number 17 is effective beyond Paul's wildest hopes. Oh, think of it, Paul. Today you were able to lick up 600 pounds with ease. Yes. Why? Why are you staring at yourself in the mirror so? Father, do you notice any change in the shape of my head? Why, no, Paul. And I'd certainly notice a change if there were one. Yes, of course. It must be just my imagination. On October 8th, he wrote, This morning when I entered the laboratory, I found Paul fast asleep at his desk. I woke him. Paul, wake up. Huh? You should have gone to bed when I... <gasps> oh. No, it can't be. What is it, Father? What's wrong? Your face. My face? Quick, hand me that mirror. Uh, here. here. No. No. I was right. Look at me, Father. My face has become broad. The features flattened. The cheekbones prominent. And notice how thick the hair on my body has become. I've reverted to the Neanderthal man. The Neanderthal man? But Paul, he existed 50,000 years ago. Yes, I know. At the swift pace I'm going backwards, it may only be a week, a few days, before I revert to an ape completely. And Paul, what are we going to do? There's only one way I can save myself. I must find a neutralizer that will stop the serum from changing me into an ape before it's too late. In his entry for October 10th, he wrote, Paul has been working 48 hours without rest, and so far has been unsuccessful in finding a neutralizer. This morning when I entered the laboratory, I could see that he is looking more and more like an ape every day. Paul, you just can't go on this way. You've got to get some rest. I can't rest. Every minute is precious. I I lost four hours last night. What? You lost four hours? I, I don't understand. While I was working here last night, I glanced at the clock to find it was just three o'clock. Then, the next thing I remember was finding myself in the hall. And the clock was just striking seven. What? I can't remember those four hours. Where I was, what I was doing. Those four hours... I lost my ability to think as a man. My mind became that of an ape. During those four hours, I... I actually was an ape. We return to the story of the terrible danger threatening this young scientist in just a moment. Meanwhile, for a breathing spell, a word from Dr. Weird. Yes. Yes, a breathing spell. Something pleasant to think upon. And what subject could be more appropriate at this fall season than hats? I'm sure my young friend here can tell you something most helpful about Adam Hats. Thank you, Doctor. Gentlemen, Adam, hatter to famous Americans for many years, has created a brand new value in fine headgear for men. It's the Adam Five. Nowhere in America can you find a better buy. Try on an Adam 5. See for yourself. Notice the perfect fit, the up-to-the-minute fashion, the quality feel of the lustrous fine fur felt. Every Adam 5 is fine fur felt. Hand-blocked by master craftsmen. And you have a great variety of correct styles from which to choose. Try on an Adam 5 tomorrow. You'll look right and feel right in one. Proud to be seen wearing one anywhere. For other Adam hats, choose from prices ranging from three forty-five to ten dollars. If it bears the Adam crest of quality inside the crown, you can be sure of honest value. Now, let's return to Doctor Weird and his tale, Journey into the Unknown. The entry for October eleventh in Professor Drake's journal reads as follows. The changes in Paul's appearance continue. His body is now completely covered with a heavy growth of hair, and his skin is rapidly turning to a deep brown and becoming coarse and callous. His arms have lengthened almost five inches, 
And he walks more and more in a stooped manner, with hands almost touching the floor. As yet, no change in voice has been noted. On October 12th, he wrote, Last night, Paul suddenly dropped a test tube and snarled at me. In that moment, he was completely an ape. The entry for October 13th reads, Last night, when I came into the laboratory, I found a window open and Paul gone. I immediately rushed out into the night to find him. A few blocks away on the university campus, I saw police gathered around the body of a girl who had just been murdered. Every bone in her body had been crushed. A few hours later, Paul returned to this house. He could recall nothing of what had happened, or where he'd been. To prevent another uh, accident from occurring, today I had steel bars placed over Paul's bedroom window. Oh, it's you, Julia. Good evening, Mr. Drake. I want to see Paul. No, I'm sorry, Julia, but Paul can't be disturbed. He's asleep in his room. You've been putting me off for days, but this time I am going to see him. Hey, Julia, come back. You can't see him now. The light switch. Oh, here it is. Julia, you should... Well, he... Huh? he isn't here. This room's empty. He isn't here. What were those bars put over Paul's windows? It's all part of the experiment, Julia. Well, this window over here is as though someone had bent the bars apart to escape. But no man could have bent bars as strong as these. That ape. What ape, Julia? The one that the police believe crushed that poor girl to death last night. No, really, Julia. Do you think he for a moment that... He was using an ape in the experiment. This room was his cage. And now he's escaped. Julia, you're wrong, I assure you. He's out looking for that ape, isn't he? And the ape's a killer. Please, Julia. I'm going to get the police. <laughs> That's the latest by day after tomorrow. And now, a special message from police headquarters. Twenty minutes ago, an unidentified girl was found crushed to death. It is believed she was killed by the ape that murdered Betty Ryan late last night. All residents are warned to get off the street. That... Father, I heard what that announcer said. I killed that girl tonight, didn't I? And the one last night, too. I'm a murderer. Oh, Paul, listen to me. The police are looking everywhere for you. We haven't a moment to lose. The neutralizer we were working on last night. It should be ready by now, shouldn't it? Yes. And this time, I'm certain it will work. You must take an injection before it's too late and you revert forever, Johnny. Open up, officer! The police! Quick, Father. The neutralizer before it's too late. I have to fill this hypodermic, Paul, before I can give you the injection. All right, you men. Break the door down. Hurry, Father, hurry. I am. It's too late. The yes, there he goes, man, out the window. Paul! Paul, come back! Mike, flash a warning to every patrol car. Issue Tommy guns to all the men. The orders are, shoot to kill. <laughs> All right, men, spread out. We've got the ape cornered now. Please, Chief, you've got to listen to me. If you'll only let me inject this neutralizer into him, then there won't be any need for all oh, this. don't listen to him, Chief. That ape's a killer. Yeah, we're going to put an end to that ape once and for all. Oh, no, you can't. You don't understand. It isn't an ape. It's my son, Professor Drake. Your son. I know an ape when I see one. Yes, I know, but it's my son changed into an ape. This neutralizer will bring him back to you normal. You must be crazy. Okay, Mike, let him have it. No, 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 I won't let you. I'm coming, Paul. I'm coming. Mike, come back. Come back, you hear? Hold your fire, Mike. Here I am, Paul. Paul, it's father. I have the neutralizer. Paul, I have the injection. Here, give me your arm. Paul, no, no, no. No. Drop the old man's body now. Let him have it. Oh, my chest. Father, where am I? What's happened? Oh. It was a great pity about poor Professor Drake, wasn't it? He was so young. What am I going to do with his journal? I thought I might carry on his experiments. But I would need someone to assist me as a sort of uh, human guinea pig. So perhaps you would like to volunteer. Oh, you have to go. Too bad. Perhaps you'll drop in on me again soon. I'm always home. Just 
Look for the house on the other side of the cemetery. The house of Dr. Weir. Adam Hatz presents... The Strange Dr. Weird. Good evening. Come in, won't you? Why, what's the matter? Surely you're not nervous. Perhaps it will calm you if I tell you a story. The story of a prodigal son's homecoming. I call it Murder Comes Home. My story, Murder Comes Home, starts in a small house on the bank of a river just outside the city. Mrs. Barnes, who was very feeble, lived there with her younger son, Tom. One evening after the doctor had paid her a visit, Tom stopped him as he was leaving. Doctor, tell me the truth. How is she? She's very weak, Tom. Unless we can persuade her to go to the hospital within a few days, I'm afraid I won't be able to save her. I see. But you know how she is about not leaving this house until my brother Harry comes home again. Mm, She hasn't seen him for ten years, has she? No. She doesn't know that he's in the state penitentiary for life, for murder. It would kill her if she ever found out. I see. Well, perhaps you can get her to agree to come to the hospital just for a few days. Uh, suppose you go in and see, huh? I'll wait downstairs. All right, Doctor. I'll try. Tom, is that you? Yes, Mother. Would you like me to close the window? No, Tom. Leave it open. It's foggy out, isn't it? Yes, You can hardly see your hand in front of your face. I like to hear the river. (laughs) I've heard it every day for 30 years. For 30 years, I've watched the cliffs on the riverbank coming closer and closer as the river eats them away. Mother, I wanted to talk to you about that. Yes? It's not safe here now. We're going to have to move out of this house soon. Not till Harry comes back, Tom. He wouldn't know where to find me if we moved. Yes, he would, Mother. Please listen to me. You could... No, Tom. Not till Harry comes home. He is coming home soon. I I know he is. I, I can feel it. He'll be here soon, Tom. Then we can move. After Harry gets here... All right, Mother. I can feel him getting closer and closer. It won't be long now, Tom. We must be ready for him. Yes, of course. Good night, Mother. It's no use, Doctor. She has a mind made up that Harry will be here any minute. Well, that's rather... Excuse me. Certainly. Hello? Yes, speaking. Oh, hello, Sheriff. What? He did? Yes. Yes, I understand. Of course I will. Goodbye. Doctor, that was Sheriff Goodright. He said Harry and a companion escaped from the penitentiary early this evening by killing a guard. What? Then they stopped a motorist and took his car. The sheriff thinks they may be heading this way. Maybe that's why Mother felt Harry would be here soon. Our cast returns in a moment with the final action in tonight's story of Dr. Weird. Meantime, I'd like to ask the good doctor one little question. What question, young man? Uh, Do you always think of horrible, terrifying things? No. 
Only last evening I was out getting a breath of air. Ah, you breathe. Yes. And I saw some Adam hats. They were fine-looking hats. I walked in, tried one on. And what do you think? What? I look just like a person. Well, thank you, Doctor. Gentlemen, if Dr. Weird can look just like a human being by just putting on an Adam hat, think how much a smart Adam hat can do for a normal-looking man. Seriously, I hope you'll stroll by an Adam hat store yourself sometime soon. The latest fall and winter line is in. You'll see a great variety of up-to-the-minute hats in every size, color, and style, including the Adam 5, made of fine fur felt and only $5. You'll be proud to wear an Adam, and you'll be correct, too. Select your favorite at any price from $3.45 to $10. There are thousands of Adam hat stores and authorized dealers from coast to coast. Now, here's that man again, Dr. Weird. Now I'll finish my story, Murder Comes Home. After the doctor left, Tom remained on guard with a loaded revolver. And just after midnight... Hello, Tom. So you did come here. Uh, where else would I go? Come on, Jake. Okay. No, you can't come in. It would kill Mother to... Oh, yes. Hmm. How is Mother? Tom! Tom! Isn't that her calling now? Quiet. Yes, Mother? Tom! Is that Harry? Yes, Mother, it's Harry. Come to see you. Oh, I, I knew you'd come, son. I'll be up in a minute, Mother. Oh, well, Tom, aren't you going to ask us in? Now that she knows you're here, I have no choice. Thanks. Oh, Tom, meet a pal of mine, Jake Paget. What is this, Harry? You said we'd be safe here. This mug meets us with a gun in his mouth. Oh, mitt. don't worry about Tom. He'll warm up to us presently. Now, you stay here and talk to him while I run upstairs and say hello to my dear old mother. Mother was so glad to see me, Tom, that you really ought to put that gun away and ask us to stay a while. Yes, Harry. Now you are going to stay until the sheriff gets here anyway. Hey, you're not going to turn us in. No. No. I told Mother I couldn't stay, that I had a long journey to make. But suppose tomorrow she learns that I've been arrested. Then what? It would kill her. But I'll see to it that she doesn't find out. And I'll see to it she does. If you turn me in, you'd kill your own mother. That won't be necessary if you'll just be reasonable. All we want is to hide here for 24 hours. I... I... Listen. A car just stopped outside. Probably the sheriff. Well, Tom, make up your mind. All right. Get in the closet there, both of you. I'll send the sheriff away. That's well, more like it. Come on, Jake. I'm with you. Coming. Oh, what's you, Sheriff? Yeah, yeah, Tom. We're sure your brother's someplace in the neighborhood. Thought we... You might have come here. Seen any sign of him? No, not yet, anyway. Uh, you never know. Want me to leave a man with you just in case? No, no, I'll be all right. I have a gun. All right, okay, I'll be back later. All right, Sheriff. So long. All right, he's gone. You can come out now. Now, you're acting like a brother, Tom. Yeah, that's more like it. The Sheriff said he'd be back later, though. Well, in that case, suppose I just take the gun of yours, Tom. You can't... Good work, Harry. Now, Tom, you just do as we agreed and everything will be all right. We can't get any place in this fog tonight. It's so thick you can't see a foot ahead of you. But tomorrow night, they'll be off guard. We'll be able to get away. Harry, listen. Dogs. They brought up bloodhounds to track us with. And they're coming this way. What do we do? It's no use hiding. If the dogs track us here, they'll know we're inside someplace. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, we'll oh, it's right. Fight for it. 
If we can get two or three of them, we may have a chance to break through. No, Harry, listen. I've got a better idea. Oh, yeah? What is it? My rowboat. You remember how we used to run the rapids when we were kids? Yeah, I remember. The boat's still there. In this fog, you could float down the river 20 miles before morning. Yeah. They'll never catch us that way. I promise they won't. You can go out the kitchen door and down the steps into the backyard. Then follow the path to the riverbank. Okay. Jake, get going. Through the kitchen there. I got you. I'm on my way. Now, Tom, I'll just take this coat of yours. Hurry! I'm coming. Hurry. I hear somebody outside. Okay, home. Get going, Harry. I'm going. They'll never catch me. Never. Come on, over. Tell him, why didn't you... Well, man, what's the matter? I had to do it. I had to. I'd have killed you. What are you talking about, Tom? Harry and Jake. They were here. I told them how to escape. Through the kitchen and down the back steps to the path that leads down to the riverbank. To my boat. Well, they won't get away. I'm going to wait, sir. Wait, wait nothing. Let go my arm, Tom. I'll get those two murdering rats. Sheriff, wait. You don't understand. Shine your flashlight down there at the foot of the steps. <sighs> Great glory. There ain't any ground at the foot of those steps. When they stepped off the last step, they had a sheer hundred foot drop to the river and the rocks down there. Well, they escaped this time right enough. From human law, anyway. Yes, Harry and Jake escaped, all right. Even if it was in a way they didn't quite expect. And Mrs. Barnes at last agreed to move. Just in time, too. The house was merely standing on the edge of a cliff. And it was only a month or so before another slide carried the house away completely. Do you live at the top of a cliff? If you do, you... Oh, you have to go now. Too bad. But perhaps you'll drop in again soon. I'm always home. Just Look for the house on the other side of the cemetery. The house of Dr. Weir. Adam Hatz presents... The Strange Dr. Weir. Good evening. Come in, won't you? You seem a bit nervous. Perhaps the cemetery outside this house has upset you. But there are things far worse than cemeteries. Such things as dark, forbidding swamps, stretching for hundreds of miles and inhabited by snakes and mosquitoes and alligators as in the story I want to tell you tonight. The story I call Death in the Everglades. My story begins in the vast shadowy wastes of the Florida Everglades. A small dugout glides through the dark swamp water, pulled along by a weather-beaten guide. The guide's passengers, Gerald Drake and his wife, Kitty, sit nervously in the center of the dugout, subdued by their strange and uncanny surroundings. Gerald, how much further do we have to go? It's been two hours now since we left the mainland. I'll see. Guide, how much further is it to my uncle's home? It ain't much further. Get this small piece. Hey, Gerald, are you sure your Uncle Jason has money? Well, up until my mother died a year ago, Uncle Jason was sending her $500 a month. 
And he owns thousands of acres of valuable Florida property. If he has money, why should he choose to live here all alone in these horrible swamps? Because he's an eccentric. Oh, Gerald, please, let's turn back. This horrible dark swamp with its alligators and snakes frightens me. I have a feeling that something dreadful will happen if we don't turn back. Don't be a fool, Kitty. We can't turn back. We're broke, do you understand that? Uncle Jason is our last hope. We must go on. Why have you come here, Gerald? Well, after all, Uncle Jason, I am your only living relative, and, well, I wanted to find out how you were getting along. Gerald worries about your living here alone in the swamp. Oh, I'll yeah. always live here in the swamp, always. It's quiet and peaceful here, and I have my friends. Your, your friends? Yes, didn't you see them as you came here, singing in the trees, swimming in the water? I know them all. They're my friends. They protect me from harm like true friends do. Yes, yes, of course, Uncle. I, I just... I want... know why you come here. You want money. That's why you come here, isn't it? Well, why, yes. You, you see, Uncle Jason, we... we... Get out! Get out, you hear? I won't give you a cent. Not a cent. But, Uncle Jason, after all, you must remember that I'm your only... Leave my house at once! Get out! But we can't. The guide won't be back until four o'clock this afternoon to take us to the mainland. Yeah. Very well, then. You must stay here until he comes. I'm going out now, and when I come back at sundown, I don't want to find either of you here. Gerald, what are you doing? I'm trying to, trying to break the lock on this metal cash box. Cash box? Yes, my darling. A short talk with Uncle Jason convinced me that he kept his money someplace in this house. It wasn't too difficult to find his cash oh, box. But if my dear uncle won't part with his money willingly, he's going to have to part with it unwillingly. My, my cash box! What are you doing with it? Uncle Jason! You're, uh, you're home a bit early, aren't you, Uncle Jason? You're trying to rob me. You're like all the others. Well, I won't let you rob me. Give me my box. Give me my I box. don't like to do this, Uncle Jason, but I must have that money, understand? Come on now. You mean to kill me, but you'll never get away with my box. Give me that. My friend in the swamp. They'll see you don't. You'll never leave this swamp. Never you... Very well, Uncle. If you insist... You let go of him. Let go or you'll kill him. That's exactly what I'm doing. You're the one who's never going to leave the swamps, Uncle. You're going to stay here with your friends forever. While I go back to the mainland with your money... There! Gerald. Gerald, you killed him. You killed him. They'll send us to prison for this. Don't be a fool. If anyone should come looking for Uncle Jason, they, they won't find a trace of him. What do you mean? I'm going to get rid of dear Uncle Jason. <laughs> yes. Give me a hand with this body, Kitty. We're taking Uncle Jason to his friend. Gerald, how much further do we have to carry him? This is far I... enough, darling. Uh, just I... set him down here. Here? By the water's edge? Yeah. It's a little perfectly. Let's drop his legs. Yeah. That's it. Ah, uh, well. George, you aren't just going to leave him here, are you? Why, of course, darling. Uncle Jason's friends will look after him. His friends? Why, oh, yes. We'll go over there. See him swimming this way? Alligators. Monster alligators. George, they're coming up out of the water. Yes, so they are. Look. One of them is crawling up to Uncle Jason's body. He's going to... Yes. Goodbye, Uncle Jason. <laughs> Our mystery will be continued in a moment. But, Dr. Weird, if, uh, if you'll come over here, I uh, have a mystery of my own. Mystery is my business, young man. All right, uh, here's the clue. The number five. Five dead men? Oh, no, I'm afraid you're wrong, Doctor. I'm talking about the famous Adam Five, the quality hat made of all fur felt, available at the thousands of Adam hat stores and authorized dealers all over the country for only $5. And it's far from dead. In fact, it's the liveliest number you've ever seen, mister. Why not step into an Adam hat shop and prove it to yourself? Try on your size in a famous Adam 5. Examine its snappy style, its lively color, the look of distinction. You don't have to be a master detective to see that in quality and style, an Adam is America's top hat. Now, Dr. Weird. <laughs> 
And now I'll finish my story, Death in the Everglades. An hour after Uncle Jason's death, Gerald and Kitty sat on Jason's dock, waiting for the guide to arrive. While they waited, Gerald tried to break open the metal cash box, but without success. Suddenly, they heard a shout. Hello there! Sorry if I kept you folks waiting. And just hop in the dugout. We're on our way back to the mainland. we are getting dark in a few hours. You don't want to be caught in the... What are you staring at? That box you got there. That's the box your uncle keeps his money in. I've seen it when he's giving me money for provisions. What are you doing with it? That's my business, and I don't have to explain it to you. You do if you want me to take you in my dugout of the mainland. Perhaps this will help you change your mind about that. A gun? Yeah. Now, if you value your life, you'll have us on the mainland within two hours. Two hours, you understand? Yeah, two hours are almost up. Why haven't we reached the mainland? It's already dark. It's just a small piece beyond this island we're passing. You hear that, Kitty? In a few minutes, we'll be on the mainland. But, Gerald, the guide will go to the local sheriff and tell him everything. Don't you worry about the guide. I'll take care of him. That fool! Why's he gone so close to the island? Have us a growl if he doesn't Gerald. want to... Charlie's gone. He's not in the boat. Gone? Hey, you're right. He must have swung on an overhead branch as we were passing the island. Gerald. Gerald, there he is. You see, standing in that small clearing on the island. Find your own way to the mainland, you thieving murderer. I'll never take you there. Oh, Gerald, what will we do without him? Kitty, get hold of yourself. We're going to reach the mainland safely. Oh, but how can we find our way? The sun's setting. It is already dark here in the swamp. We may be miles from safety. Miles of these tiny winding streams. These horrible cypress trees growing together over our heads so we can't see where we're going. Stop it, Jenny. Listen to me. We're not in any danger, do you hear me? I admit that we can't get out of the swamp tonight. All we have to do is stay right here in the dugout until morning. When it's light again... No, no, we'll never find our way out. Even the guides get lost in the Everglades sometimes. Anyway, anyway, they won't let us go. They'll stop us just like he said. Who'll stop us? Uncle Jason's friends. Listen to them. All around us. Waiting for us. Look there in the water. They're coming for us. The alligator. Kitty, you mustn't say that. We're going to make it, do you hear me? And we'll be rich. There's a fortune in this cash box. I'll open it for you. Then you'll see how rich we are. Here. It's, it's a hard lock to break off. Maybe I can shoot it open. Ah. Kitty, the lock's broken. Kitty, look. Money. Money? Yeah. It's 50, 100, 150, 200, 210. You mean there's only $210 in that box? Yeah, but look, look. There's a paper in the box. It'll probably tell us where the rest of the money's hidden. Come on, let's, let's see. Ah, uh, it's a real estate deed. 20,000 acres. Assessed value... Assessed value... $1,000. No, it can't be. Look, your uncle was a wealthy man. He had money and land. He has $210 and 20,000 acres of worthless swamp. Well, there must be more than this. There's got to be. Stand up, Gerald. Look around you. 20,000 acres of worthless swamp. It's all yours, Gerald. And we committed murder to get it. Kitty, sit down. Sit down. Do you hear me? You'll turn a dug out over. We're lost in your vast kingdom full of snakes and alligators. Why don't you ask one of your loyal subjects how to get to the mainland? Go ahead, Gerald. Kitty, the go. Let's turn it over. Church in the mainland. We can't be more than a few hundred yards from the mainland. Well, that means we'll be able to reach the mainland. Yeah. All we have to do is write the dugout and. Get up. Get... Something's about to get me. Ah! Kitty! Kitty, where are you? What happened? No! No! Too bad about poor Gerald and Kitty, isn't it? Such a nice young couple. But so unlucky. How were they to know that Uncle Jason's cash box it contained only a few hundred dollars and a deed to some worthless swamp land? And then to die in such a horrible way, only a few hundred yards from safety. 
in the jaws of Uncle Jason's friends, the alligators. You know, it occurs to me that perhaps Uncle Jason buried his fortune someplace in the swamps. Uh, perhaps you'd be interested in going with me to the Everglades to search for it. Oh, you have to go now. Too bad. But perhaps you'll drop in on me again soon. I'm always home. Just look for the house on the other side of the cemetery. The house of Dr. Weir. Adam Hatz presents The Strange Dr. Weird Good evening Come in, won't you? Why, what's the matter? Surely you're not nervous. Perhaps it will calm you if I tell you a story. It's a rather odd story. About a rather odd individual. You see, he was a morgue keeper. I call his story, The Man Who Talked With Death. My story, The Man Who Talked With Death, begins in the city morgue on a raw autumn evening. Two men have just entered the badly lighted basement of the gloomy stone building. Uh, what is cold in here or outside? Uh, where's Pop Hanson? I want to get my pictures and get out of here. This place gives me the creep. All oh, Pops are on someplace. He probably... Hey, isn't that him? Talk to somebody down there by the ice boxes where they keep us stiffs? Yeah, why, there's nobody there. Pop's talking to himself. Unless he's talking to a ghost. Come on. Yes, see, there is some place else you go on to, but it's not a place you have to be frightened or believe me. Now it's time for you to go. Goodbye, Jean. Goodbye. Hey, Pop? Oh, hello, boys. I didn't hear you come in. Hmm. Say, Pop, who are you just talking to? <laughs> oh, that was Jean Williams. She came in last night. What do you mean, she came in last night? I mean her body was brought in. Here, I I'll show you. And there she is. So young and so pretty. No wonder she was frightened when she found she was dead. You say you were talking to her? Why, yes, Harry. You see, when you die, a part of you goes on to someplace else. But it always stays near its body for a while till it gets used to things. It was that, Jean Williams, I was just talking to, of course. Pop, you've been working down here among these stiffs too long. You mean I just imagine I talk to them and they talk to me? <laughs> no, Tom, it's really true. Someday you'll know I'm telling the truth. Well, maybe. Let's can the chatter. We want to get the picture of John Wainwright. Wainwright? Oh, yes, they brought him in last night. Everybody who dies a violent death comes here for old Pop to talk to. Him. Yeah, here he is. Okay, Harry, get yourself a couple of pictures and we'll be gone. Yeah, it won't take a minute. I sure would like to know who killed Wainwright. The killer didn't leave a clue. Why, right, it was that young Professor Higgins who shot oh. Wainwright, Tom. Higgins? The pride and joy of the City University? How'd you know? Wainwright told me so himself. Wainwright told you? What are you giving me? It's true. You see, he was a blackmailer and he was blackmailing Higgins' wife. Professor Higgins had to kill him to save her. Wainwright told me so just before he left a little while ago. But Wainwright's dead. There's his body right there in the icebox. I know. I explained about that. Oh, you're crazy. But I'm not, Tom. Wainwright even told me that the gun Professor Higgins used is hidden now in the left-hand bottom drawer of the professor's desk in his home out at the university. Okay, Tom, we can cram now. Just a second. Pop, I don't know where you got your tip, but I'm going to look into this. Oh, no. You mustn't. You see, Tom, the things that the dead tell me, they can't be used in any way by the living. It's too dangerous to the living. They just can't be used. Well, this can if it's true. If Higgins killed Wainwright, and I can prove it, boy, what a story it'll make. No, Tom, you mustn't try to prove it. It'll do you no good. Try and stop me. Come on, <coughs> Harry. Uh, 
Now, thanks very much, Dean. Goodbye. There you are, gentlemen. You've just talked to the dean himself on the phone, and he's told you I was playing cards at his home at 11 o'clock last night. Does that satisfy you? Yes, Professor Higgins. Wainwright, Wainwright was shot at 11, so the alibi lets you out. Who in the world ever suggested that it was I who shot Mr. Wainwright? <laughs> Nobody in the world, Professor. It was a ghost. Wainwright's ghost. I'm afraid I don't understand. Oh, it's just a gag, Professor. Thanks. Come on, Harry. Let's get back to town. I told you the whole thing was a wild goose chase. You don't mean you really believe that crazy stuff Pop told us about talking to Wainwright ghost? No, of course not. But I thought maybe Pop knew something and was trying to give us a tip without admitting it. Say, wait a bit. Huh? What is it? Higgins is a smart guy. Maybe that alibi was fake. Oh, now, Tom. Pop said the murder gun was hidden in Higgins' desk. I think we ought to go back and search that desk. Oh, but that's crazy. Hey. Hey, Tom, what are you doing? Just putting on the brakes. I'm going to turn around and go back. Yeah, but the road's all wet here. Hey, Tom, we're skidding. I'll get us out of it. Yeah, there's a hundred foot drop into the gully there. Hey, look out. Look out, Tom. We're going over. Jump, Tom. <laughs> While my pimples go away and we all wait to learn what happens next, I'd uh, like to ask Dr. Weird a question. Yes, yes, young man. I'm all ears. <laughs> well, point them the other way, please, and answer me this. One of our listeners wants to know why you're on the air only 15 minutes instead of a half hour. If we can scare people half to death in 15 minutes, why well, take twice as long? <laughs> Very logical, Doctor. The Adam Hat people use similar logic in their business. Take the famous Adam 5, just for instance. Their feeling is, if we can deliver real hat quality for $5, why charge twice as much? And so on with Adam hats in every price range. Every Adam hat might well sell for more. Master craftsmen design every Adam style, up to the minute in fashion, correct in the best of good taste. Stroll into the nearest Adam hat store and look around a bit. Try on a few that strike your fancy. You'll find perfect fit, perfect style, and perfect price. And Adam does something for a man. Now, Dr. Weir. Now I'll continue my story of the man who talked with death. It's a few moments after the crash, and Tom and Harry are picking themselves off the ground on the very edge of the deep gully into which their car has just plunged. Harry! Harry, where are you? Over here. I'm right, just making sure I'm all in one piece. How about you? I'm all right, I guess. It's a miracle we weren't both killed. Look at the car down there. It folded up like an accordion. Yeah, I got the car door open. I saw we were going over and must have both been thrown clear, but now what are we going to do? We're going back to the university. And we're going to get into Higgins' office and see if the murder gun is really there in his desk. Uh, Pop was just talking nonsense when he said we'd find it there, Tom. Maybe and maybe not. I don't believe in his little conversations with ghosts, but I do believe he knows something. And if he does, I'm going to crack this case. A short time later, Tom and Harry reached Professor Higgins' residence again and gained entrance to his office unseen through an open window. Okay, here's the desk. Which drawer did Pop say? In the bottom left-hand one. Oh, this is the one, then. And it's open. And there is a gun here. Look. Yeah. 45 automatic. And Pop was right. You bet he was. And he was also right when he said Professor Higgins shot Wainwright. Higgins faked his alibi. Yeah, I'll get the gun out with No, you. no, don't touch it. The cops will have to find the gun here in this desk to be convinced it really belongs to Higgins. Yeah, of course. Then let's call him and get him out here. No, no, not yet. We're going back to the morgue and ask Pop a few questions. Back to the morgue? Hey, Tom, listen. Do you suppose Wainwright really could have told Pop all this after he was dead? Of course not. That stuff of talking to the stiffs is a lot of malarkey. Pop knows something, and he's hiding it. We're going to find out what he knows and how, and then we're going to break the biggest story this town has ever seen. Slipping away in the darkness, Tom and Harry tried vainly to thumb a ride back to the city. In the end, they had to walk the whole distance. And it was well after midnight when they once more stood outside 
The cold, gray morgue building. Oh, what a night. I've never walked so far in my life. Hey, why do you suppose those drivers wouldn't stop and give us a lift? I don't know. I guess they're afraid of a stick-up. Well, let's get inside and give Pop the old third degree. Yeah, wish we didn't have to. I hate to go in there again, Tom. This place upset me. Oh, come on. We're the lucky ones. We can walk out again. <laughs> hey, somebody's left the door open. Come on in. Tom. Tom, I'm frightened. I don't want to go in there where they keep the bodies. I, I just don't want to. Oh, you're acting like a kid. Now, come on. There's Pop over there by the ice boxes. Oh, Pop! Oh, hello, boys. I've been kind of expecting to see you, too. Pop, we want to ask you some questions. Tom, oh. you went out to talk to Professor Higgins, didn't you? And I asked him not to. I told you it wouldn't do you any good, not any good at all. Oh, but it did. We found the gun just where you said it to be. Boy, what a story this town's going to read tomorrow morning. No, they'll never read it. The Wainwright shooting's never going to be cleared up. It's always going to be a mystery. It has to be that way. <laughs> like fun it does. Pop, how'd you know about Higgins and that gun? Don't you realize yet I was telling you the truth? That Wainwright himself told me after they brought his body here? Tom, I think Pop's telling the truth. Well, you may be crazy, but I'm not. Now, Pop, come clean. I should never have told you, Tom. That caused all your trouble. I'm sorry, Tom. I'm awful sorry, but I warned you not to go, remember? If you hadn't, it would never have happened. What are you talking about? What would never have happened? Tom, I think I know what Pop means. I think I know. Sure you do, Harry. Tom will understand in a minute, too. Look, Tom. Look here. Uh, two bodies badly smashed up. Well, so what? Tom, don't you know now? It's true. Pop really can talk to the dead. He really can. That's why he can talk to us. Harry, get a hold of yourself. What's the matter with Tom? Those two bodies, they're ours. We're both dead. We were killed when our car crashed into that ravine. So Pop could talk to the dead after all. At least Tom and Harry found the proof very convincing. But if you find it hard to believe, why not drop in at the morgue and see for yourself? Of course, you'd have to go there as a dead body. But we could easily arrange that. And, oh, you're leaving now. Well, perhaps you'll drop in again soon. I'm always home. Just look for the house on the other side of the cemetery. The house of Dr. Weird. The Strange Dr. Weird. Good evening. Come in, won't you? You seem a bit nervous. Perhaps a story would take your mind off whatever's worrying you. I have one I'm sure you'll like. It takes place on a tiny island in the mystery-haunted South Pacific. And I call it White Pearls of Freedom. And now for my story, White Pearls of Terror. In the small harbor of the tiny island of Barota, a barren, desolate bit of coral lost in the South Pacific, a dilapidated purling boat rides at anchor. In a trading shack of corrugated iron on the shore, two burly, bearded white men watch a half-breed merchant gather together supplies, listening as they wait to the monotonous beating of a native drum in the darkness outside. For Pete's sake, Wong, what's that infernal racket anyway? I had father sacrifice his chicken to turn away anger of the storm god, Captain Blake. Well, tell him to stop it. It's getting on my nerves. Take it easy, Blake. We'll be gone in a few minutes. The glass is falling fast, and there is a storm coming up. We're in the typhoon season now, you know. And I'll be plenty glad to see the last of this rotten speck of coral, believe me. Even though we're leaving with empty pockets, we can't go too soon. Wong, sorry you'll find no pearls. Another year better, maybe. Uh, here are supplies. Eleven dollars, please. 
All right, pay him, Phelps. In a moment. Wong, why do you and your father live all alone here on Barota? Don't you ever find it lonely? Wong, an honored father never lonely, Mr. Phelps. You know, Wong, in Tahiti, I met a native who knew you. He told me your mother was Chinese and your father used to be a Tahiti witch doctor. That is true. You pay now, please. He told me something else, too. He said the two of you live here because you know a secret pearling bed down the reef. No. And that hidden in that stinking back room of yours, you have a leather bag full of the finest white pearl that ever came out of the South Seas. No, no. It's not true. Oh, I think it is. Grab him, Blake. No, 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 no. Stand no. still, Wong, or I'll break your arm. It's not true. Wong, I'm honored, Father. I have no belt. Can I say it is true? Oh. And so we're not leaving Baroka with empty hands. Before we leave, Wong, you're going to tell us where you keep those pretty white pearls. Oh. Phelps, I'm going out there and put a bullet through that infernal witch, Dr. Father of Wong's. That drum is driving me crazy. Oh, stop it, Blake. we got to finish with Wong and get away. There's a storm coming up, and we got to be well offshore when it hits. All right, then, make him talk. A little more pressure on this cord around his forehead. Oh, oh. Yeah, well, oh, Wong. Yes, Wonka. Wonka, oh. Yeah, it's more like it. Ah, where are they? The corner behind you. Oh, a board is loose. Take a look, Blake. Right, you are. Oh. Oh. Yeah, there's a loose board here, all right. And a little leather pouch under it. I've got it. Bring it here, let's take a look. Yeah, hold out your hand, I'll pour them out. Oh. Oh. Look, six white pearls as big as marbles. Only six. Yeah, there should be more. Where are the rest? Oh, oh no more pieces. Six pearls all... Wait a minute, I think he's telling the truth. It helps. Listen to that thunder, will you? we got to get outside the reefs in a hurry. All right. I thought there'd be more. But these six will do nicely. Ah, they should bring a couple of thousand apiece. In two months, we'll be in San Francisco living like kings. No, too late. What do you mean? Huh? Listen. The drum. It's getting louder. Listen to it. Now it stopped. And God of the storm has answered. Prayer of honored father for vengeance accepted. What are you talking about? Honored father knows you touch a wong. In the darkness, he makes prayer to bring punishment. Now he will make sacrifice. Listen. Ah! What was that? Honored father makes greatest sacrifice to his gods. He gets his own life. What? Now you have pearls, but they bring you only evil. They bring you death, the creeping death that walks with you in life. When you hear the drum, think of the father of Wang and the death. Help, shut him up, will you make death. him stop? Oh, death. shut him up. Oh, death of terror. Oh. Oh. Yeah, that's that. Now they're both dead. Come on, we got to get to the boat. Yeah. Hey, Phelps. Huh? Listen to that wind. It's too late. We can't get away. We can't get away. Our story will continue in a moment. But first, is there a doctor in the house? Young man, I am a doctor. Oh, so you are, Dr. Weird, after a fashion. But uh, can you handle this case? I cure all cases, <laughs> permanently. Well, here are the facts. The patient is seen frequently in business offices, on street corners, everywhere. His clothes are always neat, impeccably stylish, yet something about him just isn't right. Brief diagnosis shows he's in perfect shape, except for his hat. Gentlemen, this may be your case. Too often, a poorly made shapeless hat can spoil your whole appearance. Don't take chances. Choose a smart, up-to-the-minute Adam. They're correctly shaped and styled and made of the finest all-fur felt. No wonder men who are tops in the business, sport, and entertainment world wear an Adam. For Adam is tops in hats. So stop in at any Adam store or authorized dealer. There are thousands from coast to coast. And set yourself up in a nice new Adam hat. Now, Dr. Weird. Now to continue my story, White Pearls of Terror. For two days, a typhoon raged over the tiny island of Barota, while Phelps and Blake cowered inside the trading shack that had belonged to the dead half-breed merchant Wong. The wind hurled their boat on the reefs and sank it, blew down most of the palm trees on the island, carried away the storehouse where Wong's provisions had been kept. When at last the wind died and the sun shone again, Blake and Phelps, crawled out of the shack 
to stare dazedly at a scene of utter desolation. Phelps, look, the boat's gone. We're stranded here. I tell you, we're stranded here. Oh, stow it, Blake. There'll be a trading vessel along soon. Yeah, but suppose there isn't. We'll, we, we'll die here. The grub's all been washed away. The palm trees are down. We'll starve to death. It's the curse. The curse Wong's father put on us. We shouldn't have taken the pearls. We shouldn't have taken them. I said stow it. Suppose we have to stay here a few months. We got the shack for shelter and we can live on shellfish. We still got the pearls. When we do get away, we'll live like kings. We'll never get away. We're going to die here. All during the storm, I heard that drum beating, the witch doctor's drum, telling us we're going to die here. Get that grip on yourself, will you? Wong's dead, and the old witch doctor's dead too. Their bodies are gone. The sharks have finished them by now. When we are rescued, we only have to say they were killed in a storm, and we'll be in the clear. We'll be all right. No, now the drum. I heard it beating. We'll never get away. We're going to die. This will shut you up. Oh, yeah. I say we're going to be all right. days became weeks, and the weeks became months. Blake and Phelps lived on shellfish and coconuts and drank rainwater. Day after day, they scanned the horizon, a sign of a rescue ship. And day after day, Blake's despair mounted. Blake, Blake, come on, get up. It's your turn to go down to the beach and dig clams and keep an eye out for a ship. No, it's no use. We're never going to be rescued. We may be rescued today. Come on now, turn out. I tell you, we're going to stay here forever. We're going to die here. We're still alive, ain't we? Alive. Nothing to eat but clams and crabs and coconuts. I'd rather be dead. You hear me? I'd rather be dead. I tell you, we're going to be rescued. Maybe today, maybe tomorrow. Listen. Did you hear that? No. I didn't hear anything. There it goes again. Don't you understand? It's a ship. We're as good as rescued right now. I didn't hear anything except the drum. The old witch doctor's drum. It's beating again, just like it did that night. Blake, get hold of yourself. Come on. I'll prove that was a ship we heard. Here, come on down to the shore. The drum. I can hear the drum. Look. Look, Blake. A British gunboat off the reefs. And a ship's boat heading for the shore. We're saved. No, it's too late. The drum. He said when we heard the drum... To remember his vengeance, the creeping death. Blake, get hold of yourself, will you? They see us. They're calling us. Oh, we're saved. And we got the pearls. In a month, we'll be in San Francisco living like kings. No, no, it's too late. The drum is beating. It's bewitching the pearls. We haven't got any pearls anymore. They've stuck to your face now. Little round pearls, two of them, three of them. They're stuck to your face. No, I tell you, there's no drums beating. It's just your mind. It's a... There. Now you hear it too, don't you? No. But on your face, two little white spots. Silvery white spots. Yes, they're the pearls that have been bewitched. The drum. You listen to it? Go on, blank. Oh, silvery spots. The drum, it won't stop. Blake, we've been on this island almost a year. Living in that stinking little shack where Wong and his father lived. Eating out of their dishes. Sleeping in their blankets. Yeah, it's louder and louder. Now I know why Wong and his father lived here all alone. And they didn't want anyone to know. That's what the marks on our face mean. The creeping death. The drum, it says that we're never going to get away. That we're going to die here. Yes, you're right. We are going to die here someday, because now nobody's ever going to take us off the island. Wong and his father were lepers, and now we're lepers too. Since we've been on this island, we've both become lepers! Well, how do you feel now? Perhaps what you really need to steady your nerves is a nice trip, a voyage to the South Sea. You could stop at Barota and meet Phelps and Blake. Yes, they're still living there, quite alone. They'd welcome a little company and... A... Oh, you're going? We'll drop in again soon. I'm always home. Just look for the house on the other side of the cemetery. The House of Dr. Weir. The Strange 
Dr. Weird. Good evening. Come in, won't you? Well, what's the matter? Surely you're not nervous. Perhaps a story might calm your nerves a little. A story about an undertaker and death. I call it Stand In for Death. My story begins in the small, dimly lit undertaking parlor of Charles Thompson. Thompson and his son, Paul, are listening to the news broadcast. As yet, there has been no further news about Tony Williams, the notorious gangster who less than an hour ago shot and killed Detective Walter O'Hara and fatally injured a six-year-old child in making his getaway in a stolen car. The entire police force is on the search for Williams. It is believed that... Ah, to think that Tony Williams is our cousin, a man like that. Oh, Dad, you mustn't take it so hard. Uh, After all, it... No, I'll answer it. Tony, shut up. Want the whole neighborhood to know I'm here. Lock the door and pull on the shades. Yeah. Hurry up. Why have you come here, Tony? What do you want? I need a hideout, and this is going to be it. No, Tony. I won't let you hide out here. You're nothing but a mad killer. Yeah? Tony, put away that gun. This gun's the reason you're going to hide me out here. You understand? Yeah. You understand? We understand. And just do as I say, and you may live. I'll have to lay low here for a couple of days until the heat's off. I've had a chance to make some plans. Well, come, Paul. It's four o'clock. We must leave. Wait a minute. Where are you going? We're taking old Luigi Gambon to Woodcrest Cemetery to bury him. Woodcrest? Uh. It's about five miles out of town, isn't it? Yes, that's right. Are there going to be any mourners at old Luigi's funeral? No. Luigi had no relatives. The city was going to bury him in a pauper's grave until we claimed his body. Ah, this gets better and better. Why are you so interested in old Luigi's funeral? Because old Luigi's funeral is going to be my funeral. What? What are you talking about? This. I'm substituting myself in a coffin for Luigi. All you two have to do is drive to the cemetery. There, I'll get out of the coffin and head for my hideout. After I'm gone, you bury the empty coffin and nobody will be the wiser. But, but Luigi's body, what do we do with that? That's your problem. No, oh, no, 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 I won't do it. You'll do as I say. It'll be three corpses in this room instead of one. Uh. Now dump Luigi out of that coffin and make it fast. We're starting now, Tony. Okay. Remember... If the cops stop you, don't let them get suspicious of us. No, Tony, we won't. We're... Paul, there's a man signaling us to stop. No tricks. If you try anything, I'll come out of this coffin shooting, and the first two bullets will be for you. Be quiet, Tony. Here he comes. It's O'Hara, the private detective. O'Hara? The cop's brother? Yes. Now be quiet. Oh. Hello, O'Hara. Hello, Charlie. I thought it was you. Lucky I caught you. I was just going to drop in on you. Drop in? On me? That's right. Where are you headed for? We're going out to bury old Luigi at Woodcrest Cemetery. Old oh, Luigi, huh? Yes. I suppose you heard the latest about Tony Williams. Yes, I heard it over the radio. I, I'm sorry about your brother, O'Hara. He was a good man. Yeah. You haven't by chance seen Williams lately, have you? Uh, you know I've never had anything to do with Williams. Never. Sure, sure, Charlie. It's just that I thought you being Williams' cousin, he might just possibly have come to you for help. Oh, no, no. We haven't seen him in almost a year, have we, Paul? Uh, no. No, we, uh, we haven't. Oh, that's all right, Charlie. Say, do you mind if I ride along with you? Huh? There's a few questions I'd like to ask you about Williams and his habits. But I just got through telling you I haven't seen Williams in almost a year. What are you getting so excited about, Charlie? All I want to ask you is a few things about Williams. Get this. I'm going to see that Williams gets what's coming to him. And I'm going to be awful suspicious of anybody who doesn't cooperate with me. Well, you uh, mustn't mind my father. He always gets excited when someone mentions Williams' name. You know we'll be more than glad to answer any questions, Mr. O'Hara. Uh, yes, uh, of course, O'Hara. Uh, what do you want to know? You can get started, Charlie. I'll ride part of the way to the cemetery with you. You can answer my questions on the way. Uh, but, but we can talk here. We uh, we wouldn't want to take you out of your way. Oh, no, that's all right. We private dicks always have plenty of time. I think there's enough room for me to sit up front with you. Just slide over a bit, will you, Charlie? Uh, that's it. Uh, this is fine. All right, Paul. Let's be on our way to the cemetery. Uh, 
Dr. Weird's merry tale will be continued in a minute. Uh, which reminds me, Doctor, did you have a merry Christmas yesterday? Young man, don't mention Christmas to me. Why, what's the matter, Doctor? I was hoping to get a skeleton this year, but... Oh, no, but... Dr. Weird, I know just how disappointed you are. And gentlemen, if you were hoping for an Atom hat this Christmas, but didn't get one, I can sympathize with you, too. The new line of Adams this year certainly are tops in design and quality workmanship. So don't be disappointed. Get an Adam yourself. Walk into any of the thousands of Adam hat stores or authorized dealers from coast to coast and try on a fine-looking Adam. There's an Adam hat just for you, styled to bring out your best features. The soft-looking, genuine, all-fur felt and the smart new colors also add distinction to the wearer of an Adam. And remember, that fine array of hats you see in the Adams store window is on the shelves, too. You're sure to find the hat that's right for you in an Adams store. Now, here's Dr. Weird. And now I'll finish my story, Stand In for Death. The hearse has left the city behind and is nearing Woodcrest Cemetery. Mile after mile, Paul is driven in silence as O'Hara questions his father about Tony Williams. Well, here we are, O'Hara, the uh, entrance to the cemetery. Huh? Oh, so we are. Huh? Go ahead, Paul, drive in. But, O'Hara, if, if you go into the cemetery with us, uh, how will you get back to town? Uh, that's all right. I don't mind walking from the grave back to the main road. Go ahead, Paul. Drive in. But, but, but O'Hara, you... Go ahead, Paul. What are you waiting for? I'm certainly glad, Charlie, that you and Paul aren't mixed up in Tony's escape. You know, if you were, it'd mean ten years apiece for you in the penitentiary. Yeah. You know we wouldn't help a killer like Tony Williams? Oh, I know that. But guys like Tony have a way of intimidating people. Oh, but not me, O'Hara. Yes, Charlie, even you. Tony's smart. And he has an even smarter lawyer. Remember when he was on trial for the murder of that state trooper? He beat that rap because witnesses refused to testify. Tony had intimidated him. Uh, and he was acquitted even though everyone knew he was guilty. Yes, but, but this time he wouldn't have a chance of escaping the chair. I'm not so sure, Charlie. And even if he were convicted, let me tell you, the chair would be far too good for him. Don't you agree? Oh, yes. You're, you're right, O'Hara. Well... Here we are. Oh, is that the grave you're going to bury old Luigi in? Yes. There doesn't seem to be anybody around. Where are the men that lower the coffin into the grave and do the burying? There aren't any. You see, Luigi died penniless. I, I'm burying him out of my own pocket. I couldn't afford the men to do it. You mean that you and Paul are going to bury him by yourselves? That's right, O'Hara. Well, I'll give you a hand. But, uh, oh, but that isn't necessary. My father and I can manage alone. Yes, the coffin is only a little cheap pine one, and old Luigi weighs very little. It, it's nothing at all to manage. Oh, nonsense. If you two are paying for old Luigi's funeral out of your own pocket, the least I can do is give you a hand. Come on. But O'Hara, uh, it'll take at least an hour to bury him, and, and uh, there's no sense in your wasting all that time. Yes, besides, it's getting dark fast, don't you think? I'll it? help you bury old Luigi. And then we can all go back to the city together. But, oh, Hara, your clothes. Just an old suit. A little dirt won't hurt it. Come on, let's get the coffin out and get started. Now, now let's ease it out of the house, down to the ground. That's it. Say, you two forgot to lock the coffin. Yeah, that's better. Hara, did you want to say something, Charlie? Uh, Paul were mixed up in Tony's escape, it would mean ten years in the penitentiary. No. No, Harold, I didn't want to say anything. Okay. Paul, have you got the ropes you used to lower the coffin into the grave? Yes. Uh, here they are. All right. Let's get it over with. <laughs> All right. Let the coffin down easily. That's it. Uh, old Luigi isn't as light as you might think. Where are the shovels, Paul? Here. Fine. You use one while I use the other. But Charlie, you'd better take it easy. While Paul and I shovel the dirt in. 
No, don't do that. Let me out of this coffin. Let me out. Let me out. Oh, Harry. What's the matter, Charlie? You're as pale as a ghost. You look as though you're hearing voices. Oh, Harry, don't. Don't you hear? I don't hear a thing. Oh, Harry. Listen to me. I surrender to her. I'll confess. I'll confess to everything. The state trooper I murdered. Killing your brother, the little kid I ran over. Let me out of her. Let me out. Oh, Harry. You heard what he said. He confessed everything. I didn't hear a thing. And neither did you two. Do you understand? Yes, we... We understand of her. Do you, Charlie? Yes. I... I understand. Okay, Paul. And let's start shoveling the dirt in. No, hurry! Go! Go bury me alive! I'll confess everything I have! Go bury me alive! Too bad about poor Tony, wasn't it? It must be unpleasant to be buried alive. You know, I've often wondered how long it takes a person to suffocate in a coffin. Now, if some brave soul would have volunteer for an experiment, I could... Oh, you have to go now. Too bad. But perhaps you'll drop in on me again soon. I'm always home. Just look for the house on the other side of the cemetery, the house of Dr. Weir. The Strange Dr. Weir. Good evening. Come in, won't you? Why, what's the matter? Surely you're not nervous. You are? Then perhaps a story might help calm you. I think I know just the one. It's about a cat, among other things. That's why I call the story The Tiger Cat. My story, The Tiger Cat, begins in a little homemade laboratory in a great gloomy old house in the suburbs. Young Professor Carl Emery is bending over a cage containing a huge rabbit when the laboratory door opens. Carl, have you seen Rana, Madame Elsa's cat? She's disappeared and Madame Elsa's worried. Mm, uh, what? Oh, it's you, Laura. No, I haven't seen Rana. Oh, Carl, how are your experiments coming? I get so little chance to see you to ask you about that. Now, I'm getting close, Laura. Look in this cage. That's a rabbit. Why, well, it's as big as a dog. It weighs 40 pounds and it's still growing. My vitamin injections have done that. Then your growth serum's a success. No, not quite. But I will succeed yet. If I can keep my experiments a secret from Madame Elsa. If she knew what I was doing, she'd throw me out of the house. Oh, that crazy idea of hers. That when people die, their souls go into animals. It's insane. It's the old age-old theory of reincarnation, but she believes it absolutely. Then she mustn't find out, that's all. Because once your growth serum is perfected... It'll revolutionize farming. Rabbits as big as horses, chickens as big as ostriches. Why, think how the world's food supply will be increased. And I'll be famous, rich. Then we can admit we're married. Oh, Carl, it's so hard pretending to Madame Elsa that I'm just a maid, that I have no interest in you, her brilliant protege. I know, darling. And it may take months, even years, before my experiments are finished. I know she's left me this house and some money in her will. All our problems would be solved if she'd only die. Oh, so that's how you repay my generosity, is it, Carl? By wishing me dead. Uh, Madam Elsa. Yes, Carl. I came in looking for Anna. So you've been deceiving me all these months. Madam Elsa, listen. Get out of this house at once, do you hear? Both of you. Leave this instant. But my animals, my experiments. Get out. You disobeyed me. Nothing here is yours. I paid for it all. So get out. Get out. Get out. Oh, catch her, Laura. Uh, my, my medicine. She's having a heart attack. Carl, get her medicine. She's in her room. No, I won't. Do. But Carl, she'll die unless you do. Yes, she must die. To solve our problems. It's the perfect answer. Let it down gently. All right, Carl. My medicine. You're trying to kill me. You're murderers. Both of you. Another few seconds and it'll be all over. Yes. Yes, but you won't escape. 
You hear? I'll return. I'll return. And... Uh, 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 uh. Carl. She's dead. And all our problems are solved. We... What the... Oh, it's Rana, her cat. She's been hiding in the cupboard there. She knows we've killed Madame Elsa. Nonsense. She's just... Oh, so that's it. What, Carl? Why, the stork has just visited Rana. She's just given birth to a kitten. That's a peculiar coincidence, isn't it? Madame Elsa dies just as Rana's kitten is born. Our story will continue in a moment. At this part of the program, I generally have a little talk with Dr. Weird. But tonight, I'd like to speak with you men. 1944 is over. 45 is here. Even though the sixth war loan drive is ended, your first New Year's resolution should be to keep buying bonds. After that, one of the best resolutions for any man is to decide to improve his personal appearance. Many men are keeping that resolution by getting a new Adam hat. And Adam just naturally does something for a man because its style is as up to the minute as one minute after New Year's. And quality. Mister, there's no beating the quality in an Adam with its genuine all fur felt and careful workmanship. Step into one of the thousands of Adam hat stores all over the nation and ask to see the famous Adam 5, handsomely styled in the smartest shade, expertly shaped to fit your head, and priced at only $5, the Adam 5 is truly a great hat value. Others priced from $3.45 to $10. But remember, no matter what the price, every Adam is right, this year or any year. Now... Dr. Weir. And now to complete my story, the tiger cat. Carl and Laura were completely exonerated of responsibility for Madame Elsa's death. And so he was able to continue his strange experiments unhampered with Laura, his wife, assisting him. Oh, Carl, every serum so far has been a failure. The rabbits, the guinea pigs, they grow tremendously big and we think we've won. And then suddenly they shrink back to their former size, as if to mock us. But we will succeed. We must. Oh, of course, Carl. I guess I'm just a little tired. But... Oh, that kitten again. Why can't we get rid of it, Carl? It's always behind me, always yowling like that, as if it's trying to startle me. Well, now, Laura. Carl, Madame Elsa believed that when she died, her soul would go into the body of some animal just being born. And that kitten was born at the exact instant Madame Elsa died. Suppose... Suppose her soul is reincarnated in Now, Laura, you mustn't be silly. Look at her eyes. They're the same peculiar green Madame Elsa's were. And her fur is the exact reddish-brown color of Madame Elsa's hair. It can't be a coincidence. Laura, you're being ridiculous. If we didn't have to take good care of Rana the Second by the terms of Madame Elsa's will, I'd use her in one of my experiments. But as we can't touch her, I'm going to get hold of another kitten, the same age, to experiment on. Then, by comparing Rana's weight with the other kittens... I'll know how much faster than normal my serum is making the other one grow. Oh, oh we must get rid of her. I have a feeling... Laura, my decision is final. Rana the second must not be harmed. <laughs> Laura, look. It's only a month since I injected my serum into this kitten, and she's already twice as big as Rana. I'm going to call it Tigress. At the rate she's growing, she'll soon be one. Oh, it... It's wonderful, Carl, but can't we get rid of Rana now, please? For heaven's sake, Laura, are you still harping on Rana? Why, she's just a kitten, perfectly harmless. I tell you, she sits and watches me as if she hated me. As if she were just waiting for the right moment to be revenged on both of us. See, she knows we're talking about her. Laura, if your nerves don't improve soon, I'll have to send you to Bermuda for a rest. I'm sorry, Carl. I'll try not to be upset. That's better. I'm going to give Tigress here another injection. And I predict that in one more month, Tigress will be bigger than any house cat ever seen before on this earth. And Carl finally had to do as he had threatened and send Laura to Bermuda to get over her, her nervousness. Well, in her absence, he carried on his experiments alone and was overjoyed to see the kitten he had named Tigress gain in size at an astounding rate. In fact, when Laura returned at the end of three months, Carl had an astonishing sight to show her. Now, Laura, 
Now, be prepared for a surprise when I turn on the light. Then you really succeeded at last, Carl. Succeeded? Look. Look there. Uh, Carl! But that can't be Tigris. Uh, oh, you're playing a joke on me. No, I'm not, Laura. In that special cage is the kitten we named Tigris only four months ago. Now she weighs 200 pounds uh, and looks and sounds just as fierce as any wild tiger in the jungles of India. I can't believe it. Look, you see how small Rana looks standing there beside Tigris' cage? Oh, she, she's trying to get out. No, she's not. She's just playing with Rana. She and Rana have become great friends. Rana spends most of her time beside that cage. But I believe that they really talk together. Listen. Well, they are talking to each other. And Carl, look. Rana is pawing at the bolt that keeps the cage shut. So she's trying to open it. Oh, now, Laura, Rana's just playing the way a cat will. Why, I've seen her pawing at that bolt dozens of times. But suppose she did slide it back and the cage came open. Tigers could kill us both. I tell you, Rana's just playing. Carl, no. Rana is trying to slide that bolt back. Laura, am I going to have to send you away? Carl, look. She's done it. Carl, push the bolt back. Tigers' cage is unlocked. And Tigers is coming out. Quick, I have a revolver in the library. Come on. An instant later, Carl and Laura had slammed and locked the heavy door of the library. And outside it, Tigress roared in baffled rage. She's trying to get in. She's going to kill us. Ron deliberately opened that cage so Tigress could kill us. She had a plan all along. I'll shoot through the door. That'll drive her away. Oh, you just made her more angry. Oh, she's getting in. She's going to kill us. Look out. Oh. like animal the police found in the room killed by revolver bullets. In fact, the only living creature anywhere about was a reddish-brown kitten with green eyes like Madame Elsa's. She was calmly sitting beside Carl's body and purring to herself. Have you been unkind to some cat lately? You better be careful. There's no telling... Oh, you're leaving... We'll drop in again soon. Just look for the house on the other side of the cemetery. The house of Dr. Weir. The Strange Dr. Weir. Good evening. Come in, won't you? Why, what's the matter? You seem a bit nervous. Perhaps the cemetery outside this house has upset you. But there are things far worse than cemeteries. For instance, a ship at sea. A ship doomed by fate. As in the story I want to tell you tonight. A story I call Murder Ship. My story begins aboard a coastwise liner, the SS Arctic Star, as it slowly gropes its way through a thick, all-enveloping gray fog. On one of the decks of the liner, a man and a woman stand by the railing. Now, look, Millie, you don't want to go ashore broke, do you? But Larry, I'm afraid. I tell you, I saw this guy Abbott's bankroll. He's carrying at least 20000 in cash. But Larry, it's too dangerous. There's nothing to it. The two of us go to a stateroom. You hold his attention, and I let him have it with a knife. When we dock two hours from now, you and me just walk off the ship with the other 500 passengers. But... We'll be on a train in New York with 20 Gs in our pockets before they even discover the body. Larry, I have a feeling that we'll be caught. Please give it up. All right. That's the way you want it. Then you and I are through. You don't mean that, do you? I do. Unless you pull this job with me. All right, Larry. I'll do whatever you say. This is 
out of the state room, Millie. Don't forget what you're supposed to do. I won't. Hello, Mr. Rabbit. May we come in? Why, well, yes, of course, Mr. Sanders. How are you, Mrs. Sanders? Oh, quite well, thank you. Larry and I would like you to have a drink with us before we dock. Why, I'd like to very much, but I haven't oh, much... Surely to... you can spare a few minutes. Well, if you put it that way, I guess... Get up! Why, you stabbed me. Is he... Is he dead? Yeah. Oh. Now, where's that bankroll? It is. Ah, here it is. Look at the size of it. Let's see. Larry, let's get out of here. Nine. Ten. Twelve. Fourteen. Six. Oh, Larry, eight, please. Eighteen. Twenty. Twenty-one. A little over twenty-one thousand. Well, Millie, was it worth the risk? Oh, yes, yes. Only let's get out of here. I have a feeling that something... Oh, no. Larry. Larry, what's happened? It felt like a collision with another ship. Come on, let's get up on deck. <laughs> Larry, what's wrong? Oh, well, seem to be able to open this door. But it's the only way out of here. It's jammed. Maybe I can break it down. Uh, <coughs> uh, oh, yours, it's too solid. Well, if we don't get out of here, we'll go down with the ship. We'll drown. Maybe if we yell, someone will hear us and break the door down with a knife. Yes. Help! 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 We're in stateroom D7. The door's stuck. Help! Oh, Larry, it's no use. It's no use unless we're behind the door. No, don't say that, Millie. Help! Help! Oh, Larry, look. The floor of the stateroom is beginning to slam. The ship's sinking. No, no, it's your imagination. No, look. Water's coming in under the door. Oh, we're sinking, Mary. We're sinking. Help. 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 Dr. Weir's mystery will be continued shortly. Say, by the way, Doctor, is mystery your sole pleasure? Young man, what could be more pleasant than mystery? Well, music, for instance. That's music, a, that's... why, of course. Have you ever heard my clanking of chains? Uh, Doctor, I'm afraid you've got me wrong. I mean the kind of music men hum or whistle when they feel on top of the world. And gentlemen, one of the many things that give you that tip-top feeling is the pleasure of being well-dressed. Perfect taste is the criterion. And in hat, there's nothing smarter than an atom. From stem to stern, your atom hat gives off that look of quality. You see quality in the carefully molded shape and in the richness of the genuine all-fur felt, and in the subtle color shade. Next time you pass an Adam hat store or authorized dealer, stop in and try on an Adam. Once you see and wear an Adam hat, you'll agree that today, as before, Adam is one of America's outstanding hat values. Now, the uh, good Dr. Weird. <laughs> Now I'll finish my story, Murder Ship. It's a half hour since the SS Arctic Star was rammed and started sinking. Trapped in the stateroom of the late Mr. Abbott, Larry and Millie find themselves waist deep in water. Larry, fear in his eyes, stands by the porthole, looking out at the water which threatens any moment to burst through and claim their lives. In the eerie semi-darkness of the stateroom, <laughs> Millie... Oh, it's the use we're going to die. I know we are. Don't say that. Look. The water stopped rising. Grant must close the ventilator grating. Room's air tight now, and the pressure of the air is holding the water back. What difference does it make? We can't get out. They may send divers down to rescue us. Like they save men trapped in sunken submarines. Yes, but no one knows we're trapped in here. There's always a chance of something. Sorry, what's happened? I think we said bottom. Oh. The ship doesn't seem to be moving anymore. The floor of the stateroom. It's still sliding downwards. It's because the bow of the ship's on the bottom while the stern's above us. Oh, it's keeping the stern up. But the air pockets in the stern, just like in the stateroom. Oh, I know we're going to die trapped down here. Hundreds of people on the surface. Millie, what's the that? There's always a chance of rescue. No, we're going to die here. I know it. How long have we been trapped in here, Larry? About five hours. I'll be glad when it's over. We're dead. I can't stand. Sorry. Millie, what is it? I thought I saw something go past the porthole. Porthole? Let me see. Millie, there's a diver out there. Did he see you? No. I only had a flashlight or something to signal him with. Your cigarette lighter. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Oh, hurry, Larry, hurry. Yeah. Oh. I'll have a light in a second. There. Did oh. he see it? If only he'd look up. There's only a few feet below us. I'll move the lighter from one side of the porthole to the other. All right. Millie, he sees it. He's waving to me. He's trying to signal something to us. He's holding up four fingers. Millie, you know what that means? We'll be rescued in four days. How can they possibly get us out of here? I don't know, but they'll do it somehow. All we have to do is hang on for four days, Millie. I'd better single back so we'll know we understand. Yeah. Here, look. 
He sees the four fingers I'm holding up. He's waving at me. Yes, you're right. Look, he's settling to the surface. They're pulling him up. He's gone. Oh, Larry, do you think they'll really be able to rescue us? Of course. Send down a diving bell or something like that. I'll get us out of here, Millie. Only it'll take a little time. Boy, days. Larry, what if the oxygen in here doesn't hold out? Yeah. You're right. There may not be enough air in here to last two people for four days. Oh, we just have to hope there is. I'm afraid I can't afford to take that chance. What do you mean? A knife? Yes, Millie, a knife. Oh, Larry, you're not, you're not I'm going. afraid I must, Millie. Can't allow you to breathe the air that may save you. No, Larry, no. I won't let you kill me. Where'd you get that gun? Oh, my purse. Now oh, you keep away from me. Give it to me, you hear? Give me that gun. No, you're going to kill me. Stay away from me or I'll shoot him. Stay away. Uh, I, you son <laughs> I didn't want to shoot you. You made me do it, Larry. You... Well, now I'm alone. All alone, hundreds of feet under the surface. Larry. Larry, don't look at me like that. Larry, please don't stare at me like that. Larry, stop staring at me. I can't stand it here any longer. I can't get it out of here. The porthole. I'll leave through the porthole. I won't stay here with you another minute. As soon as I... Open this portal. Oh, I can't open it. It's stuck. I've got to find something to open it with. I've got to find something to open it with. All right, Mike, take it easy. I'll have your helmet unscrewed in a minute. Then you can tell me whatever you have to say. Yeah. Take it easy while I take it off. George. George, you'll never believe what I saw down there. A mermaid, I suppose. No, 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 George. There are two people trapped in one of the staterooms on that ship. What's that? A man and a woman. They're trapped in the stateroom on D-deck. You sure? I'm positive they signaled to me. But well, I'll be done. Well, the way I figure it, they're only alive because their stateroom is an underwater air pocket. How far down is their stateroom? Yeah, the porthole is about six feet below the surface. Six feet, huh? Aye. Oh, that's a break. As soon as it's low tide, the porthole will be just out of water. We can get him out easy. Did you signal that to him? Oh, sure. I held up four fingers to show that we'd have him out in four hours. Fine. They're so close to the surface, we shouldn't have any trouble at all. In four hours, we'll have him out of there safe and sound. a nice couple, but so unlucky to die in such a horrible way, only six feet below the surface, all because they couldn't wait just a little while longer. Uh, their bodies are buried in the cemetery right outside my door. Perhaps you'd like to visit their graves and... It... Oh, you have to go now. Too bad. But perhaps you'll drop in on me again soon. I'm always home. Just look for the house on the other side of the cemetery. The house of Dr. Weir. The Strange Dr. Weir. Good evening. Come in, won't you? Well, what's the matter? You seem a bit nervous. Perhaps the cemetery outside this house has upset you. But there are things far worse than cemeteries. For instance, the feeling of being cut off from the world by an insanely jealous man. As in the story I want to tell you tonight. The story I call... 
Beauty and the Beast. My story begins in New England on a lonely, desolate cliff overlooking the Atlantic Ocean. Near the edge of the cliff, which towers 200 feet above the rocks below, a young man stands, a mere shadow in the darkness of the night. Time and time again, he impatiently turns to look at the huge, foreboding old manor house, which is perched near the cliff's edge. Suddenly, out of the darkness, a beautiful girl appears and runs to his outstretched arms. Oh, oh Kathy, darling, why are you so late? I couldn't slip out of the house any sooner, Alan. Jason was watching my every move. Oh, Kathy, he's twice your age. I know. The ugliest man I've ever known. Whatever made you marry him? I don't know. After my father died, I was all alone. Jason kept after me to marry him. Something in his eyes forced me to say yes. I was afraid to refuse. Well, you're not going on living with him. I'm going to take you away. Oh, Alan, you don't know what you're saying. I can't leave. Why not? If I were to run away, Jason would follow you and kill you. He'd kill you the way he killed... The way he killed... whom? Uh, well, you remember George Davis, don't you? Why, of course. He was Jason's secretary. Well, one evening, two weeks ago, Jason found me talking to George in the library, a thing he'd forbidden me to do. And the next morning, Jason told me he discharged George and that he'd already left. But then I discovered that all of George's clothes were still in his room. His clothes were in his room? Yes. Surely if he'd been discharged, he'd have taken them with him. Then you think that I'm Jason... sure of it. He must have killed George that very night. He'll kill anyone he thinks is trying to take me away from him. Oh, darling, I couldn't stand to have anything happen to you. <laughs> now, darling, nothing's going to happen to me, nor to you. I'm taking you away from here. What time can you meet me here tomorrow night? I think I can manage to slip away around 9 o'clock. All right, darling, 9 o'clock it is. Now, you better return to the house before Jason misses you. <laughs> Catherine! Jason! Where were you, Catherine? Oh, I was just out getting some fresh air. You're lying. You slipped out to meet someone. No, Jason, really. I. Oh, <coughs> Jason! My arm! You're hurting me! Who was it? Alan? What did Alan? Tell me, or I'll. Beg pardon, sir. But Sheriff Rogers is here to see you. Very well, Charles. Show him in. I'll do all the talking, Catherine. Good evening, Mr. Winthrop. Miss Winthrop. Sorry to intrude, but I must. What can I do for you, Sheriff? I understand you have a secretary, George Davis. I did have. I discharged him two weeks ago. Why are you so interested, Sheriff? Because his body was washed ashore this afternoon, oh. 20 miles down the coast. Well? There were deep gashes on the body as though it had fallen from a great height onto the rocks and the sea. It may be suicide, and it may be murder. You say it may be murder? Yeah. Surely you don't suspect I had anything to do with it, do you? I don't know. There have been some mighty strange things happening around here. Four months ago, Sam Arnold, your chauffeur, was murdered, and now... Sam Arnold? Murdered? You seem surprised, Miss Winthrop. Don't you know he was murdered? I am afraid she doesn't, Sheriff. She's been ill for quite some time, so I kept the news from her. Oh, then she doesn't know that Arnold was stabbed to death less than a hundred yards from this house. Oh, no, no. I thought he'd been discharged. Who... Who did it? Well, we haven't found Sam's murder yet, Miss Winthrop. Now we have another mystery on our hands, the death of George Davis. Mr. Winthrop, I want you and your wife to be at the coroner's inquest in the village day after tomorrow. Quite a few questions we want to ask you about the deaths of both Sam Arnold and George Davis. There's a lot more going on around here than meets the eye. Dr. Weird's story will continue in a little while. And now I'd Young like... man, before you go on, remember where you are. You know what happens on this program to people who aren't careful what they say. Oh, uh, I'll be careful. I'm always careful. Careful with my facts whenever I talk about Adam Hats. You see, Adam Hats are so downright good-looking, I have to be careful about my enthusiasm. And the makers of Adam Hats are careful, too. Careful to see that every Adam is well-made. Look at any Adam, and you can see for yourself the quality workmanship that goes into the designing of Adam's smart styling, perfect fit, and correct details. 
Care, too, is taken in the choice of material and color. That's why only genuine all-fur felt in the newest shades is used in Adam hats. So if you're a careful dresser and a careful spender, choose an Adam. Still priced at $3.45 to $10. Still America's outstanding hat value. Now, back to Dr. Weir. And now I'll finish my story, Beauty and the Beast. 24 hours have passed, each one of which has been an eternity to Kathy. Try as she would, she couldn't forget the deaths of Sam Arnold and George Davis. One thing seemed perfectly clear to her. Jason had murdered the two men in a jealous rage. He would stop at nothing in his madness. Her mind in a turmoil, Kathy waited tensely for nine o'clock and her meeting with Alan. Catherine, why do you keep looking at the clock every other minute? I am uh, not aware that I am. Is it because you have some secret rendezvous with someone? No, 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 I haven't. You're lying. Whom are you going to meet? Tell me. Oh, Jason, my arm. Oh, tell me. No one, no one. You're lying. I ought to kill you. Yes, kill me. Get rid of me. So I can't testify tomorrow at the coroner's inquest. What are you talking about? You want to kill me because you're afraid of what I might tell them. You, I know you killed Sam Arnold and George Davis. Is that what you intend to tell them tomorrow? Yes, you're nothing but a murderer. Jason. Jason. Don't look at me that way, Jason. I'm not going to let you kill me. Stay away from me, Jason. I won't let you kill me. Put down that poker, Catherine. Put it down, I say. No, if you come any closer, Jason, I'll use it. Jason, do or I'll use it. I warned you, Jason. I warned you. Kathy, Kathy, you mustn't cry. You struck Jason in self-defense. Oh, what are we going to do? We're going through with the plans I've made. I have two tickets and a plane for Mexico, and we're going tonight. Catherine! Jason! Oh, there you are. You're, you're not dead. I didn't kill you. No, the blow you struck me only... Helen, what are you doing here? I've come to take Kathy away, Jason. Helen, you don't know what you're saying. I'm warning you, Jason. Don't try to stop me. You don't understand, Ellen. She's a murderess. She killed two men. What are you saying? I never killed anyone. Ellen, I'm telling you the truth. She killed Sam Arland and George A. Davis. You're lying. You're lying. I didn't. How could she possibly kill two men and not know it? Because she's insane. Insane? A homicidal maniac. There are times when she loses control of her mind. And when she does, she kills. And then she comes to and has no memory of it, I suppose. Yes, yes, that's it exactly. Huh. Just a minute before she pushed George Davis off this very cliff we're standing on, I heard her talking to him. Her voice was low, excited, the voice of a homicidal maniac. Before I could reach them, she'd pushed him off this cliff. And then she fainted. And when she regained consciousness, she had no memory of what had happened. No, no, it isn't true, Alan. He's trying to blame me for murders he's committed. Yes, I know, I know, dear. Your story's very <laughs> clever, Jason. But account rather nicely for the deaths of those two men, wouldn't it? I'm telling you the truth, do you hear? And I'm going to tell it to the coroner's jury tomorrow. I've protected her as long as I can. You're not going to tell the coroner's jury anything tomorrow. Ellen, she's insane. No. She has to be exposed for both our sakes. Right. Ellen, let go of me. Oh, you let don't go, deserve Ellen. to live trying to make Kathy pay for your crimes. No, no, no Ellen. No. Don't. No. You, you must listen no. to me. No. Ellen, don't. Ah! Oh, Ellen, no. There was no other way out, Kathy. He was insane, utterly insane, trying to make it appear that you murdered Sam Arnold and George Davis when he did it himself. Why, he... Alan, what is it? What's wrong? I just remembered something. When Sam Arnold was murdered four months ago, Jason and I were on a hunting trip in Canada. Why, we heard the news together over Jason's portable radio. You mean Jason didn't kill Sam Arnold? I know he couldn't have. But, but if Jason didn't murder him, who... Kathy. Alan, why are you looking at me like that? You don't think that I did it, do you? Kathy, if Jason didn't do it, then what he said about you might have been true. You believe that it is true, don't you? I can see it in your eyes. You do believe I murdered Sam Arnold and George Davis, don't you? Kathy, your voice... It's different. You do believe I murdered them, don't you? Your voice is just the way Jason said it was before you pushed George Davis off the cliff. It's true. You did kill him, didn't you? Yes, yes, I did. At times like this, I can remember. 
I killed Sam Arnold with a knife. And I pushed George Davis over the cliff. Would you like to know how I did it, Alan? Kathy, your voice, your eyes. Kathy, what are you up to? I pushed him off the cliff like this, Alan, like this, Kathy, Alan. look out! Alan, I'm slipping out! Ah! Huh? Oh, she's gone. She was trying to kill me. And she fell over herself. She was the murderer. And nobody dreamed of suspecting her. Because she was so beautiful. Alan was right. Nobody dreamed of suspecting Kathy because she was so beautiful. But her husband, who was ugly, well, he was suspected right away. You see how handy a pretty face can be? Uh, sometimes. But there's an old saying, beauty is only skin deep. So be careful about walking on clifftops with lovely young women. One of them might be another Kathy. Oh, you have to go now. Well, perhaps you'll drop in on me again soon. Just look for the house on the other side of the cemetery. The house of Dr. Weird. The Strange Dr. Weird. Good evening. Come in, won't you? Why, what's the matter? You seem a bit nervous. Has the cemetery outside this house upset you? There are things far worse than cemeteries. For instance, being lost in an Arctic storm, as in the story I want to tell you tonight. The story I call Survival of the Fittest. My story, Survival of the Fittest, begins in the cold, bleak wastes of Alaska, stretching endlessly as far as the eye can see, in one vast white expanse. The fierce winter wind hurls itself at a small cabin, almost buried by the snow. In the cabin, Four men are huddled around the embers of a fire. Mike, what are we going to do? We're leaving the first thing in the morning for Goldfield. In this storm? It's either make a try for Goldfield or die here of starvation. Mike's right, Paul. We're to stay here. Our food would be gone in five days. Much better we try to get to town. Kiana, how's the weather look to you? You think it'll blow over by tomorrow? Storm bad. Not blow over soon. All right, that settles it. We're getting out of here first thing in the morning. How far do you think we've come in these four days, Mike? I should say about 70 miles. That means 50 more miles to Goldfield. Yeah, it's going to be a hard 50 miles, too. Dogs are all worn out. We only have food enough for one day. Mike, you don't think we'll have any trouble making it, do you? In this country, you always have trouble. Only the strong and ruthless survive. Hold up! Hold! Here! Kiana! Come here! Here come! Why are you calling Kiana, Mike? Kiana's having trouble breaking trail for the dogs. He's slowing us down, eating food that might pull us through. He's no longer useful to us. Uh, I'd be here. Kiana! What do you want? I'm afraid we don't need you anymore. You not understand. Huh? Maybe this will make you understand. Mike! Don't no, don't! Oh. Oh. <laughs> you, you've killed him. Yeah, I had to. I told you only the strong can survive. We need the food here to eat. Paul, you start breaking trail for the dogs. We're going on. Come on! Push! Push! Hi-ya! Push! Mike, it's been two days since we've eaten anything. We can't go on without food, Mike. Why don't we kill one of the dogs? Yeah. Because we need every dog we have to pull the furs on the sled. All right, Paul. Start breaking trail for the dogs. We've rested enough. No, I can't. I'm too tired. The dogs can break their own trail. Why, you young whelp. Go ahead. 
Shoot me! Like you did Kiana! You're not worth wasting a bullet on. If you're too tired to break trail, you can remain behind. Boy, Mike, you can't leave him here to die. Oh, can I? Are you ready, Victor? Yes, I'm ready. Paul, run along behind the sled. All right, Victor. Marsh! Marsh, do you hear? <laughs> Mike! Mike, why don't you let me throw away this bundle of furs I'm carrying? Then I could break trail for the dogs. Throw away $500 worth of furs? I should say not. Come on! Marsh! Paul! Hey, uh, Paul, don't drop behind. Keep running. I will, Victor. Uh, as long as I can. Mike! Mike, look! The dogs are disappearing! Victor, let go of the sled! Mike! Like the dogs and sled to vanish in that crevasse in the ice. Yeah. A year's furs lost in a few seconds. What do we do now? Uh, now we'll start floundering through the snow towards Goldfield. If our strength holds out, we'll make it. If it doesn't, we'll die. Right now, Doctor, I've got a quickie mystery of my own I'd like to solve. A mystery? mystery of two men. You see, these two gentlemen are both nice-looking fellows, act alike, talk alike, even wear similar clothes. Yet there is a difference. The appearance of one somehow seems more distinguished than the other. Ah, <laughs> you've guessed it. The solution to the mystery is simple. One man always wears an Adam hat. Yes, gentlemen, the perfect style and quality of an Adam does make a difference. A difference that all well-dressed men recognize at a glance. Made of rich-looking all-fur felt, the new Adam hats come in a wide variety of distinctive styles and shapes and are priced at only $3.45 to $10 at Adam hat stores and authorized dealers from coast to coast. Mister, if you want to look your best always, always wear an Adam. Now, Dr. Weir. And now I'll finish my story, Survival of the Fittest. It is early the next morning. Three figures, mere specks on the vast white expanse, make their way slowly and painfully across the snow. Finally, one, unable to go any further, stops and sinks into the snow. Mike, Mike, wait! Paul's uh, falling down! Paul, you must get up and keep going. If you don't, you'll freeze to death. I can't walk another step, Victor. I'm too tired. Ah, so he's falling down, eh? Well, Paul, you'll either get up and start walking or stay behind and die. Mike, if each of us took him by the arm, we could help him along. Nothing doing. It's every man for himself. I'm not going to waste my strength. Paul, Paul, you must get up. Here, let me help you. No, leave me alone. I can't go any further. Mike, we can't leave him here to die. Why can't we? Because it's inhuman. It's common sense. The weak die and the strong live. Now, are you going on with me or are you going to stay behind to die with him? Paul... Paul, you must get up. Can't you see nothing can save him now? He's half frozen already. Are you coming, Victor? Yes, I'm coming, Mike. Goodbye, Paul. May the Lord have mercy on your soul. As the uh, two men continued on their way, the snow swept over Paul's body and soon hid it from sight. Hour after hour, Mike and Victor struggled along. For the first time in days, they saw the sun, and its warmth helped them to withstand the cold. Well, late that afternoon, Victor began to fall behind. Mike, Mike, wait for me. Hurry up. I'm coming as fast as I can. Ah, you'll never get the gold field at this rate. Must be at least another ten miles. Ten miles? I'll never make it without food. My stomach feels as though... Like uh, you're eating something. Yeah, that's right. You're, you're eating pemmican. Where'd you get it? Get it? I had it all the time in this pouch. You mean... You mean the food didn't run out four days ago? It ran out for you and Paul, but not for me. I just finished eating the last of it. So you stole the food that might have saved Paul and myself. <laughs> you're nothing but a dirty murderer. A murderer and a thief. Do you hear? Yeah. But when all's said and done, Victor, I'm gonna live and you're gonna die. Someday, Mike, you'll pay for your crime. <laughs> and when that day comes... Hey, listen, a plane. Where is it? My eyes. Everything's a little blurry. Oh, yeah, yeah, there it is. Look. A plane. It's coming this way. They see us. It's an army plane. They dropped something. 
A package. Food. That's what it is. Yeah, and look. Look, it landed in the snow. Only a hundred yards from it. Yeah? Where? Yeah, but darn that sun in my eyes. I can't see it. Yeah, 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 I see it now. That package will do me nicely until I reach Goldfield. I'll make it for sure now. Well, there's plenty for both of us in it, Mike. You are going to share it with me, aren't you? All you're going to get is this son. <sighs> I won't have you telling any tales about me later. After I pick up that package, I won't be back. Mike, Mike, come back. Don't leave me here to die. Where did that package drop? I thought I... Oh, oh there it is over there, half burying the snow. Funny, first I can see it, then I can't. I... <clears throat> My eyes... Oh, they feel as if knives are being stuck into them. I can't see. What's happening to me? My eyes, I'm snow blind. That's it. The glare of the sun all day. I'm snow blind. Victor! Victor, where are you? I'm back here, Mike. Victor, you gotta help me. I can't see a thing. I'm snow blind. You mean, you mean you can't see anything? No! No, my eyes hurt so I can't stand it. It's the sun, the glare all day. That's done it. My eyes feel as if they were full of needles whenever I open them. Well, well, what do you want me to do, man? Now look, crawl over to that package. You still have enough strength and bring it over here. It'll keep us alive. In a day or two, I'll be able to see again, then I'll get us both in the gold field. I, I can't, Mike. My legs are too stiff. What? I can't move them. We'll both die here now. No, 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 I won't die. I won't. I'll find that food myself. I know which direction it was in. I can find it if I hunt long enough. That's what you think. Yeah, you're just trying to confuse me. It's in this direction. I know it is. I can feel the sun on my face. Mike, Mike, come back. Stop. Come back. <laughs> I am going right. Or you wouldn't be trying so hard to stop me. I'll show you, Victor. I'm going to live, do you hear? I'm going to live. And you're going to die. No, no, Mike. Come back, Mike. There's a crevasse in the ice ahead of you. You'll fall into it. You expect me to fall for a sucker trick like that? The crevasse was behind me. I remember that. Mike, look out! Okay. Ah! Too bad about Mike, wasn't it? Or was it? It was really his own fault he fell into the crevasse. Because, you see, Mike, being the kind of man no one could trust, he felt he could trust no one. Victor? Oh, yes, Victor lived. He finally managed to get to the package of food and survived until a rescue party could reach him next day. So if you're ever tempted to sacrifice your friends to save yourself, just remember that... The Oh, you have to go now? Well, perhaps you'll drop in again soon. Just look for the house on the other side of the cemetery. The house of Dr. Weir. The strange Dr. Weir. Good evening. Come in, won't you? You seem a bit nervous. Perhaps it would help if I told you a story about a friend of mine who had a most unusual experience. You see, he was executed first and then committed murder afterwards. I call his story The Man Who Lived Twice. My story, The Man Who Lived Twice, begins on the gallows, where Professor Carl Muller, world-famous scientist, is about to die for murder. As the executioner finishes adjusting the rope around the condemned man's neck, the warden speaks. Well, Muller, is there anything you wish to say? Only this. You are hanging me for a crime I did not commit. Very well. Then I shall become a criminal. 
a murderer. And you, Warden, you shall be one of the first to feel my vengeance. Proceed with the execution. Professor Williams. Yes, come quickly. Of course, everything's ready and waiting, right here. Good. Start the artificial heart pumping. Of course. Thanks to the governor's special order, everything went smoothly. Look, John. So you got it. Yes. The law has Professor Muller's dead body, but we have his head. The head containing the wonderful brain of Carl Muller. The governor thought I wanted to dissect it, but we'll bring it to life. You must work fast. In ten minutes, with luck, we'll have brought back to life the genius that was Carl Muller. We've won, Professor. Look, his eyes, they blinked. Yes. Now they're opening. They're staring at us. His brain lives and knows what we're doing. Now, John, we must find some way to let that mighty brain we rescued from the grave speak to us so that its great work may be carried on. Come, John, we must work fast. For many days, Professor Williams and John tried to build some kind of vocal apparatus which would enable Carl Muller's still living head to speak to them. But each effort failed until at last they became desperate. Another failure. John, I'm afraid we're beaten. There must be some way, Professor. Look, Muller's eyes are watching us. He knows what's happening. I'll bet he could tell us what to do if he could talk. Yes, but he can. What was that? Something in the road outside. Uh, an automobile accident, perhaps. Oh, of course. John, we may not be able to keep Muller's head alive much longer. Unless we can communicate with him. I need his advice. There must be some answer. Muller's notes give full detail. For... Someone's at the door. Quick, lock it. No one must enter this room. Uh, help me. I... It's someone who's hurt. I... He's bleeding. I... That crash we heard. Please help me. Accident. Can I hit the tree? It's thrown out in front of... Hey, catch him, quick. I've got him. Uh... He's fainted. Put him down on the couch here. Uh, let me look at him. Hmm. What is it? This fellow's dead. A bit of steel has apparently entered the temple here and pierced the brain. I'm surprised that he even lived to reach the door. Dead? Well, then I better phone the police to send the morgue wagon. Yes, I... No. Wait. Yes, Professor? John, look at this stranger whose dead body fate has brought us. His head is the same size and shape as Carl Muller's. Professor Muller's brain should fit into this stranger's head almost exactly. Yes, but... Listen. Here we have a sound body with a damaged brain. Over there is Muller's brain alive, but with no body. John, we're going to do it. We're going to put Muller's brain into this stranger's body and truly bring Muller back to life again. Say, uh, Doctor, tonight's story has me a little worried. Do you think you could give us a little idea of what happened next? Mm, certainly. You're going to spend no more than 40 seconds talking about Adam Hatz. Oh, I can do it in 30 Gentlemen, the way an Adam hat keeps its smart appearance is something to marvel at. There's very little fussing with brims or constant blocking, because an Adam is made of high-quality, long-wearing, all-fur felt. Adam hats are designed for fashion, too, coming in a wide variety of distinctive shades and shapes, so that you can choose the Adam that's right for you. There's a flair to an Adam that just naturally does something for a fellow. Prices are only three forty-five to ten dollars at Adam Hat stores and authorized dealers everywhere. Tomorrow, make an investment in your personal appearance. Buy yourself an Adam Hat. Now, back to Dr. Weird. And now to continue my story, The Man Who Lived Twice. For an hour, Professor Williams and John worked swiftly to carry out the task of transferring the living brain of Carl Muller into the body of the stranger, so uh, providentially brought to them by fate. At the end of that time... Look, John, he's breathing. The operation was successful. Yes, I can feel a pulse beat. Switch off the pumps. See? He lives! He lives! The body, yes. But the brain, will that live too? Only time will tell us. weeks, the 
two scientists tended their amazing patient day and night. And then one day, the stranger's body moved, a sign that the transplanted brain had taken control of its new home. Well, after that, it was only a matter of days before Carl Muller was able to get up and dress and inspect in a mirror the new body that had become his. Uh, yes. Yes, Professor Williams, you have done well. Excellently. I find it hard to believe this is truly me, Carl Muller. But it is. And how the world will marvel when it learns the truth. Uh, the world, yes. Tell me, this body that is now mine, to whom did it belong before our little transfer? Hmm? You were named Larry Johnson, Professor. That's about all we know. You see, there was an accident and... Yes, I know. I witnessed the arrival of Mr. Johnson, I remember. But you know nothing of this Larry Johnson who staggered in so fortunately that day to present me with his body? No, we never made any inquiries. We didn't want to attract attention. You are wise. It does not matter who I was. What does matter is that I am now Carl Muller, a genius with 50 years of life still ahead of him. But, of course, I cannot use the name of Muller. What do you mean? Carl Muller was convicted for the crime of murder because the subject died in an experiment. So Carl Muller must stay dead. But as Larry Johnson, a new scientific genius, will arise to astound the world. What that means? It means that no one must ever know what happened in this laboratory. No one ever know? It must be a secret, always. And for another reason, too. Those fools who convicted me, they must be made to pay, and they shall with their lives. What are you saying? I was convicted of murder. I shall become a murderer. The judge, the prosecutor, the jury, they shall all feel my vengeance. That's madness, Muller. Listen to me. Your brain's been affected by what's happened. My brain is clearer and stronger than ever. I shall have my vengeance secretly, cleverly. My victims, they will cower in terror the thought I am striking back at them from beyond the grave. I've been making my plans as I convalesced. No, we'll stop you. Will you? I think not. John, look out. He's got a scalpel in his hand. He's got it! You killed him. Yes. Now it is your turn. No, no, stay away from me. You must die so my secret will remain safe. You're mad. I'm a genius. The world, it will cower at my feet before I am through. But enough of talking. Uh, No. Uh, No. Let me go. Let me go. All who stand in my way shall suffer the same fate. Uh, uh, now, now no one in the world knows that Carl Maller, who died on the gallows, lives again. A few hours later, Carl Maller left the house. His plan was simple. He would take over Larry Johnson's identity, claiming that the accident he had been in had given him amnesia, and he could remember nothing of his past. Confidently, he walked into town, and then stopped to ask the first policeman he met the way to the address he had found in Larry's wallet. Pardon me, officer. Which way is Michigan Avenue, please? Why, you... Larry. Larry Johnson. Why, yes, of course I'm Larry Johnson. What of it? What of it? I'll show you what of it. There, put up your hands or I'll plug you. Just a moment. What is this? I I have done nothing. You have done nothing? Uh, Look, officer, I've been in an accident. My You'll be in a worse accident if you try anything. I've got you now. But I don't understand. You'll understand when the judge sentences you to hang, you murdering rat. Hang? No. No, this can be. You'll find out. No, I've done nothing. Let go of that gun. No. Let go. I'll I'll plug you. Give me that gun. I'll shoot you. I'll shoot you. I warned you. Well, you had it coming. I've only saved the state the price of a trial. Uh, Yes. Yes, you have. What what was Larry Johnson wanted for, anyway? What were you wanted for? (laughs) For holding up a bank messenger and then killing Officer Clancy in your getaway, that's all. Yeah, and for stealing a getaway car which you wrecked and abandoned out in the suburbs. Uh, No. No. Wanted for murder... The body I, I took was wanted for murder. Uh, <laughs> no. Poor Professor Muller. To think that after being executed, he should get a brand new body, only to find himself wanted for murder all over again. 
<laughs> it looks as if fate was determined he should stay dead, doesn't it? And he has, uh, since then. In fact, he's buried in the cemetery outside. He's the only man in the world who has two graves and is buried in both of them. Would you like me to show them to you? Oh, you're leaving. Well, I hope you'll drop in again soon. Just look for the house on the other side of the cemetery. The house of Dr. Weir. Adam Hatch presents... The Strange Dr. Weird. Good evening. Come in, won't you? Why, what's the matter? You seem a bit nervous. Perhaps it would help calm you if I told you a story that I just heard. Strange story about a raven as black as sin that could talk like a man. I call my story The Dark Wings of Death. Before Dr. Weird takes you to his world of mystery, a brief look at the world of fashion. When the new Adam 5 was first designed, Adam's expert hatters spared no time nor expense to make sure that the Adam 5 would be smart. Down to the very last detail. They got what they wanted, and so will you, for just $5. The new Adam 5 is now on display at the thousands of Adam hat stores and authorized dealers from coast to coast. Step into the one nearest you and ask to see an Adam 5. Notice the handsome style, the perfect fit, the quality all fur felt. Then, try it on. Yes, sir. You'll look like a new man in your Adam 5. Now, Dr. Weird. And now for my story, The Dark Wings of Death. It begins in the small east side apartment of Ned and Helen Kennedy, who are having a uh, slight discussion. Ned, I tell you, if your Uncle Simon won't lend you the money, you'll have to kill him and take it, do you hear? But look, Helen, if we just wait a little longer, he's so old and feeble, he may die any day now. We can't wait. That shortage in your accounts will be discovered by next week. We've talked this all over before. Why are you hesitating now? You're afraid? No, no, it's not that. It's that pet raven of Uncle's. It makes me so uneasy. His raven. So that's it. You're afraid of a bird. Now, wait a minute, Helen. That raven isn't an ordinary bird. The way it watches me with those red eyes and the way it screeches whenever I'm in the room. Well, it almost acts as if it knew I was thinking of killing Uncle Simon. All right, Ned, go to prison then. No. no I'll do it if I have to. But I'm going to try to borrow the money from him first. You can try, but you won't get it. Now, you'd better get over to that horrible old tenement he lives in with his supper. After he's eaten it and fallen asleep, remember just how we planned everything. Turn on the gas heater, unlight it, so it'll look as if it had been blown out and he died in his sleep. A few minutes later, Ned Kennedy was entering a small, bitterly cold room on the top floor of an ancient tenement building that stood on the very banks of the East River, its windows looking directly down on the cold, gray water. In a bed against the wall, a white-haired old man lay, his face lighting up with malicious amusement as Ned entered. On the head of the bed perched a huge black raven, and as it saw Ned, it flapped its wings angrily. Five, Lucifer! Come on in, Ned. You needn't be afraid of Lucifer. I brought you some soup and sandwiches for your supper, Uncle Simon. I'll put them on the table here. Not poisoned, are they, Ned? Not poisoned by that pretty little devil you married? Uncle, for heaven's sake, don't be absurd. <laughs> here, eat your supper before the soup gets cold. All right, Ned. Now then, what's on your mind? You want something, I can tell. Out with it, Ned. All right, Uncle Simon. I'm $4,000 short in my accounts at the gas company. Huh? 
I've got to replace the money this week or I'll be caught. And you want me to lend it to you, is that it? Please, Uncle. You've got to. You wouldn't let your only living relative go to jail, would you? I, of course I would. If you've stolen, you should pay the penalty. Why, you miserable old skinflint. No, let go, you joking. Lose him. Lose him. No, get away from me. Get away from me. He's trying to get on my eyes. That'll teach you to try tricks on me. Get him away from me. He's trying to pick my eyes out. Where's your hand? Where's your perch? Look at my hand. It's bleeding. Serves you right. Next time I won't stop him. Lucifer will pick your eyes right out of your head. And your soul right out of your body, Ned. Yes. Carry them away to be Elzebub, his master, too. Oh, for heaven's sake, stop that. Lucifer isn't any ordinary bird. He's a winged demon. Straight from Inferno. Yes, and as sure as ever you harm me, Lucifer will snatch you up and fly off to the pit with you. I said stop it. Yeah. Ask Mrs. O'Rock, the superintendent's wife downstairs. Many the night she's seen Lucifer flying away from the window in the darkness, his eyes gleaming with red fire and his claws glowing with phosphorus, off to pay a visit to the devil, his master. Oh, that's just nonsense. Now, if you've finished, I'll take the dishes away. You... You sure you won't lend me the money then, Uncle Simon? No, I won't. Ten thousand dollars hidden in the wall here beside my bed, as you know. You shan't have that till I die. I tell you, there's no other way. If your uncle won't lend you the money, you have to kill him and take it, do you hear? Good night, Ned. I'm going to sleep now. After they put you in jail, Lucifer and I will come and visit you. Now and then, old skin flint. He's asleep. When he's asleep, turn on the gas heater, unlight it, so it'll look as if it had been blown out. In an hour, he'll be dead, and it'll look like an accident. Yes, I have to do it. I have to do it. <laughs> You're not leaving already, are you? Oh, not yet, Doctor. I just wanted to remind the man of our audience that whatever the hour, they're usually meeting people whose opinions they just naturally value. Calling on business associates, joining a friend at lunch, going to the theater. Those are the times you want to look your best. And nothing counts more in making a good impression than your personal appearance. Naturally, clothes are important. But what's equally important is that every article fits into the picture. That's where Adam hats come in, because the style of an Adam is just right. Made of fine quality, all fur felt, in the smartest shades, Adam hats are the last word in fashion. Carefully designed, down to the smallest detail, and long wearing as well. An Adam is a wise investment in your personal appearance. So if you want to look your best, Stop your clothes picture with a new Adam hat. Now, Dr. Weird. And now to continue my story, The Dark Wings of Death. After leaving the gas heater turned on full and unlighted in his uncle's tiny room, Ned has just reached home. Helen! Helen! Ned, you did it, didn't you? I can tell by your face. Yes, I had to. He absolutely refused to lend me the money. I told you he would. You got it anyway, didn't you? Where is it? Let me see it. Why, I haven't got it yet. You haven't? Why not? Well, I couldn't get it until he was dead, of course. Till the room was filled with gas and he's breathed it for a while. Oh, yes, of course. But I said it'd be easy, and it was, wasn't it? Yes. Except for the raven. It attacked me. Look at my hand. It's just a scratch. Don't tell me you're still worried about that bird. Well, suppose it attacks me again when I go back for the money. Forget it. The raven will be dead, too. The gas will kill it. Oh, yes, yes, of course. In any case, I'm going back with you. I'll wait until midnight. He's sure to be dead by then. Oh, and another thing. The room will be full of gas. We'll have to wear masks of some kind. Masks? Why, I hadn't thought of that. Well, I did. As auditor, you have keys to the gas company office. We'll go down now and get two of the masks the workmen use when they're repairing leaks in the mains. In the morning, you can replace them and no one will ever know. It was just after midnight when Ned stood once more in the cold, dark hall outside his uncle's door. 
Helen at his side. I don't hear any sound inside. Of course not. They're both dead. Come on, put on your mask and let's get it over with. All right. Here, now, this strap goes over your head. Uh-huh. Now, breathe through your mouth. You can talk, too. These masks are the latest type. Talk? Yes, I can, can't I? There. Now, we're all set. Have your flashlight on. Mm-hmm. We mustn't turn on any lights. The least spark would explode the gas and blow us sky high. I know. Come on. He's dead. Of course he is. Where's the raven? Oh, what does it matter? Come on. Help me move the bed. You take that end. All right. Take it easy now. He looks as if he were asleep. Oh, forget him. Where did he keep the money? There's a loose board. This... Listen, the raven, it's still alive. It can't be. I don't hear it. There, it's perched on that chair. Flapping its wings. Oh, get away from me. Get away. Ned, get hold of yourself. There's nothing there. Nothing, I tell you. There is. It attacked me. Look out. Here he comes again. Trying to get at my eyes. Keep it away. Keep it away. Ned, stand still. You back just right up against the window. I tell you, there's nothing there. It's just your imagination. It's coming in my eyes again. I'll stop it. I'll stop it. Ned, that gun, where'd you get? I brought it with me in case of an emergency. I'll stop that raven. Oh, don't use that gun, you fool. This room is full of gas. The shot would make it explode and kill us both. Look out, it's coming at me again. Don't stop it. short time later, Mrs. O'Rourke, wife of the superintendent, was telling the police her strange story. Just at midnight it was, officer. And I'm standing at me window when up above there's an explosion, fair to wake the dead. And outside me window I see a great flash of light. And what else do you suppose? You've already told us, Mrs. O'Rourke. You saw a man and a woman blown clear out through the window and into the river down there. Blown out nothing. They was flying through the air, holding on to each other. And that raven had his claws in the man's hair and was flying away with them. His eyes blazing fire as he took them off to the devil, his master. Now, Mrs. O'Rourke, you're letting your imagination run away with you. I know what I saw. But you can't have seen that. Because we found the raven dead on the floor beside the old man's bed. The gas had killed the two of them, both together. about Ned and Helen, wasn't it? Their bodies were never recovered from the river. It was almost as if they really had been carried off to some place not on this earth. But since Lucifer the Raven was found dead beside his master's bed, uh, what do you suppose it was that flew with Ned in the darkness? Birds never have ghosts. Or do they? Oh, you have to go... And perhaps you'll drop in again soon. Just look for the house on the other side of the cemetery. The house of Dr. Weir. While Dr. Weir prepares his statement of next week's thriller, I'd like to read a brief statement from the makers of Adam Hat, who bring you this program. Quote, Our purpose is to offer hats of the finest style, made of the finest material, and executed with the finest workmanship. We want you to know that your Adam hat is a quality hat. At the same time, we want your purse to know that Adam offers a great value. So we present our smart line of Adam hats at prices which we honestly believe give you the most for your money. Millions of men agree with us, and we're sure you will too. Step into any of the thousands of Adam Hat stores and authorized dealers all over the nation. And our hatters will be glad to show you our latest line of fine-looking Adam Hat. Price from $3.45 to $10. Unquote. Now, Dr. Weird. I hope you'll drop in again next week. I want to tell you a story I call The Secret Room story about two escaped Nazi prisoners who were quite sure they were smarter than the... the... But the rest of the story will have to wait until your next visit. Good night. Join us again next week at this same time for another visit with the strange Dr. Weird. (laughs) 
Strange Doctor Weird, directed by Jock McGregor, is presented by the makers of Adam Hats, the hats that are always top in quality. Dick Willard speaking. This is Mutual. The Strange Doctor Weird. Good evening. Come in, won't you? Why, what's the matter? You seem a bit nervous. Perhaps the cemetery outside this house has upset you. But there are things far worse than cemeteries. For instance, knowing that you are cut off from the world and that death awaits you inevitably. As in the story I want to tell you tonight, story I call The Secret Room. My story begins late one night in a lonely section of the Hudson Valley. A few yards away from the huge old Baxter Mansion, two men hide behind a large elm tree, studying the mansion closely. By the half-light of the moon, Initials can be seen on the backs of their blouses. The initials P.W. Standing for Prisoner of War. Carl, why are you wasting time watching that house? Any minute now, they discover back at the poison camp that we killed that guard and escaped. I'm not wasting my time. See that little gray-haired man there in the house? Talking to the big fat man? Yeah, sure. What about him? He's going to supply us with money and clothes and food. Ah, one of our secret agents? No, it's my father. Your father? Yes. Brought me into this country as a child. He's caretaker of the house. For 15 years I lived in the house. If I was old enough to run away and join the army the Third Reich. Oh, 15 years in America. That's why you speak such perfect English. Yes. Carl, it's your father. He's a Nazi. No. The old man's one of those stupid fools who believes in democracy. And the other man in there, who's he? John Baxter, the owner of the house. Come on. What are we going to do? We're going to get food, money, and clothes from him. He'll give it to us because I have this gun. Well, Hans, I'd better start back for the city... You're sure you won't come with me? No, thank you, Mr. Baxter. I don't like leaving you all alone in this house now that you're ill. But, Mr. Baxter, I don't mind. There's a telephone here. Really, I'll be quite... Good evening, gentlemen. Well, Carl. Carl. No, it can't be. Yes, Father. Carl. I... I thought you were in Germany. What are you doing here? Hans, don't you understand? Look at their uniforms. They're escaped prisoners of war. So, Carl... You fought with the Nazi scum against humanity. You are one of the scoundrels who... Perhaps that'll teach you to speak with more respect to a soldier of the Third Reich. Why, you dirty coward. Striking your own father. Quiet, you. You get the same thing. Now, listen to me, both of you. My friend and I need food, clothes, money. If either of you gives us the slightest bit of trouble, I'll kill you. Mother, you stand guard over these two men with this gun while I get some food in the kitchen. Ja, wohl, Herr Leitner. Oh, old man, you actually believe that the United States can defeat the armies of the Third Reich? Ha, <laughs> what a fool you are. <laughs> Here, Hans. Here's some food for you. I'll oh, got... Hans, where's Baxter? Baxter? Well, he's sitting right... He's gone. You fool, he escaped. Give me that gun. But he was sitting right in that chair. Come on. We've got to find him if he... Listen. That's right, Sheriff. Two escaped war prisoners. One of them has a gun. You'd better hurry over here before... So they... here you are. Put that down. Put the phone down or I'll... Sheriff, they've caught up. It'll teach you, you swine. Mr. Baxter. Mr. Baxter. You killed him. Yes. Franz, hang up the receiver. Jabor. Carl, what will we do? The sheriff knows we are here now. Oh, you fool. If you'd watched Baxter closely, this never would have happened. But I only turned my back to him for a moment. I had no the idea. The sheriff will be here in a few minutes. There's no use our running for it. They'd have every road blocked. But we can't stay here. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. We can stay here. There's a secret room in the cellar of this house. A secret room? 
In the cellar? Yes. I remember when I was a boy, the, the high and mighty Baxter family had an uncle who wasn't right in the head. They were ashamed to let the world know about it, so they kept him a prisoner in a secret room. My father can show us where that is. Where is it, father? I'll never show you. Oh, yes, you will, or I'll kill you just as I killed Baxter. Then go ahead. Shoot. Oh, no. No, no. That would be quick, easy. I believe in putting a man to death slowly, like this. <coughs> oh, oh, Carl. <coughs> Get go of me. You see, this way, it, it takes hours. No. Oh, yes. No. Would you show us that, the secret room? Yes. Yes. Now oh, you're being sensible. But hurry. That stupid sheriff and his men will soon be here. While Dr. Weird looks for skeletons in the closet, let's take a quick look into your wardrobe. If there's an Adam hat in there, that's fine. If there's more than one Adam hat, that's even better. Because it takes more than one good hat to make a man's wardrobe complete. Every well-dressed man knows this, and well-dressed men also know that you can't go wrong with Adam hats. For there's no better hat value anywhere in America. Adam hats are made of fine fur felt, smartly fashioned, smartly blocked. You can choose from a wide variety of shades and a complete assortment of all the latest styles. You can easily afford more than one Adam because they are sensibly priced. You're welcome to stop in and look at the latest Adam hats in your nearest Adam Hat Shop. Now, Dr. Weird. And now to continue my story, The Secret Room. It is a few minutes later, holding a flashlight in one hand, Hans Reiner leads the two escaped Nazis through the huge, musty old cellar. Karl, his gun in his hand, cautiously follows a few feet behind his father. In front, Staggering under the weight of John Baxter's body brings up the rear. At last, Hans comes to a stop. Here we are. Oh, very clever. One would never suspect there's a sacred room behind that solid stone wall. How do you make the section of the wall open, old man? I press this concealed button here. Carl. Hello. The wall has opened. Yes. Old man, shine your flashlight into the room. It's rather small, but it'll do for a few hours. All right, Franz, go on in. You too, father. Very well. All right, all right, old man, close the door. Very well. Now, it cannot be opened from the outside unless you know where the button is. Good. Now, all we have to do is stay in here until the sheriff and his men have searched the house. When they find it empty, they'll leave. Then you and I, Carl, will be able to make plans. Yes. Plans that will take us back to the fatherland. <laughs> yes. Once again, we shall have proven the superiority of the master race. Carl, well, they've been gone for over an hour. Surely it's safe to leave now. Yes, I think it's safe. All right, old man, open the door. Open the door. I'm afraid I can't. Uh, you can't? What do you mean? This door only opens from the outside. It only opens from the outside? No. No, I forced it open. Franz, you fool, stop throwing yourself against the door. But, stop it, I said. But he said the door only opens from the outside. That means we're trapped. What kind of a Nazi are you? Going to pieces like that? Can't you see he's lying? Would he be here if there wasn't any way to open the door from the inside? Yeah, yeah, you're right. He would not have allowed himself to be trapped in here, too. So, you swine, you lie to us, would you take this? <coughs> now, open that door quickly before I hit you again. I told you, the door can only be opened from the outside. So, you're going to be difficult, huh? Well, we're quite experienced in making men talk. Franz, hold his arms back. Double card. Before I'm through with you, you'll wish that you'd open that door when I first asked you to. No, 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 no. Carl, he's regaining consciousness. Yes, we'll have to get it out of him this time. 
He can't last much longer. Yeah, he's already half dead. Well, are you ready to show us how to open that door? I tell you, it can't be opened from in here. You're lying, I tell you. If that were true, you wouldn't have allowed yourself to be trapped in here with us. Do you think I mind dying in here? What do you mean? My heart. The doctors gave me only a few months to live. What's that? Yes. That is why I was willing to show you this secret room. I don't mind dying as long as you two die with me. You, you deliberately led us into this trap. Yes. I can think of no better way to die than taking you two Nazi rats with me. No. You'll never no. get out of here. No. Never. Someday, they'll find us still here. Poor white skeleton. Why, you... Oh. Carl, he's dead. Uh, yes, Carl, we trapped. Trapped, you understand? He wasn't lying. We can't get out. We're going to die in here, for Carl. We're going to die. Too bad about Carl and France, isn't it? Imagine being trapped in a small room with solid stone walls, hour after hour, day after day, growing weaker all the time, until finally... But perhaps they both took the easy way out and used the gun they had. By the way, if you're thinking of buying an old mansion in the Hudson Valley, I'd look very carefully in the cellar for a secret room if I were you. After all, you wouldn't want to live in a house that was haunted by the ghosts of two... Oh, you have to go now? Well, perhaps you'll drop in on me again soon. Just look for the house on the other side of the cemetery. The house of Dr. Weir. The Strange Dr. Weir. Good evening. Come in, won't you? Why, what's the matter? Surely you're not nervous. Perhaps the story might calm your nerves a little. This story is about a strange spell and a stranger magic. I call it the summoning of Shandor. In a moment, you and I will take a deep breath and step into the strange world of Dr. Weir. And while you brace yourself, I'd like to do right by my sponsor and say something nice about Adam Pack. That's not very hard to do, especially right now with the breathtaking fall and winter line of up-to-the-minute Adam Pack now on display in the thousands of Adam stores and authorized dealers from coast to coast. Why not stroll by your nearest Adam shop and take a quick look at some of that quality headgear? Believe me, when you buy an Adam, you're buying real quality and correct style, as well as perfect fit. An Adam is one of America's greatest hat values. Now, here's Dr. Weird. My story, The Summoning Shandor begins in a curious circular room at the top of a deserted lighthouse near San Francisco. There are three men in the room. One is bound tightly to a chair, his face wet with the perspiration of agony. The second is small and ferret-like. The third man is squat with a soft, pulpy body and blubbery countenance that makes him look like a frog in his feet. Well, Compton, are you ready to tell us where your wife is yet? You'll never find her, Freddy. She's out of your reach. Let me put another splinter under his fingernail, Tron. Oh. Pat ought to make a tell us where he's got a head. Now, Spot, I've got a better idea. Oh. Yeah. yeah. You ever heard of Shandar? That old Hindu who lives down in Chinatown? Yeah. yeah, I heard plenty about him. I don't want nothing to do with that guy. They tell me one little trick of his called the summoning. It's supposed to make anybody you want come to you, even from the furthest ends of the earth. You, you mean he can bring him here even if we don't... Yes, Spot. Suppose you go get this Shandor. We'll have him work his spell. And no matter where Thompson has his wife hidden, she'll come to us, whether she wants to or not. And so, half an hour later, 
corridor, the door of a tiny, strangely furnished room deep in the heart of Chinatown, slowly opened. Yes. What is it, please? Santo? I am called by that name. My boss has got a job for you. He wants you to work him a spell. The one called the summoning. Summoning? Yeah. That is a powerful and dangerous charm not to be lightly attempted. And yet it has been ordained for a thousand years that I shall go with you and do as you wish. A few minutes later, Shandor, followed by Spock, was climbing the end of steps that led to the top of the deserted lighthouse, where Frog Stanton and his prisoner were waiting. Madam, this is madness. This obsession of yours about Alan, my wife. Yes, obsession. For five long years, I've waited for this moment. The moment when Alan will come to me. Come to me and tell me she's willing to be mine. And if she does that, you'll die tonight. Painfully. Slow. That's madness, Clinton. Just because you asked her to marry you once and she turned you down, it'd have been mine if you hadn't come along. No. No, she wouldn't. She was just sorry for you because you... Because I love the way I do. Like a frog. I know. She said it made her skin crawl just to have me touch her hand. You think I could forgive that? I went to prison because I was caught stealing money to have my face changed so she liked me. I told her that. She told you and you told the police. You expect me to forgive that? Fenton, listen to me. Forget this crazy idea of revenge. Turn me loose. I've told you the price of your life. It's for your wife, Ellen, to come to me gladly. Kiss me. Me, whose very touch made her skin crawl. If you won't do that, you'll die. Now, for the last time, where is she? She's where you can never find her. Never. You fool! Oh. Yeah. Thompson. You're yeah, unconscious. So, you think you can keep her hidden from me, oh. are you? What? Oh. Oh. It's you. Yeah. Go on in, Shambo. I obey. You know what you're here to do? This man has told me, Doug. We have a friend. A young woman. She's lost and we can't find her. We want to bring her here. You'll be well paid. I do not use my knowledge for pay. Have you a picture of the one who is to be summoned? Yes, yes. Yes. Yes, she's young and fair. Now, get busy and get her here. And if your spells don't work, I'll throw you out that window down to the rocks below. Understand? Sandor has no fear of you. First, the incense must be lighted. Lyle, Lyle, Bonsa, Baba, Lyle. Hey, let's go and stop. Shut up, Spot. Go down below and wait there. Okay. Two snakes, first. First, you must call the one who is wanted and ask her to come. All right. Ellen. Ellen. Come to me. Ellen, come. Ellen, come. Ellen, come. Ellen, come. We'll learn what happens in just a moment. First, I wonder if we could have a word with you, Dr. Weird. Yes, yes, young man. What is it? Well, your program really scares me tonight, Doctor. I uh, I want you to give me something for my frenzied nerves. Just a... Say, what's that thing you're carrying around? Is it? Just a human skull. A skull, huh? Uh, look, Doc, ne- never mind about my nerves. Just, just go away for a minute and we'll all think about something nice. Gentlemen... I hope the next time you stroll by your nearest Adam Hat store, you'll find time to step inside for a brief look around. Believe me, that fall and winter line of hats just arrived really represents a fine assortment of quality. Prices, you'll notice, run from only three forty-five up to ten dollars. Try your size in a famous Adam Five, one of America's greatest hat values, which features the most correct, up-to-the-minute styles in genuine fur felt. Men choose Adam because an Adam just naturally does something for a fellow. The ladies certainly agree with that. That's why so many ladies are giving their men Adam Hat gift certificates for Christmas. That way, he makes his own selection of size, color, shape at any time he pleases, just by presenting the gift certificate at any one of the thousands of Adam Hat shops and authorized dealers from coast to coast. This Christmas, madam, give him an Adam. Now, stop the wheel. Now for the rest of my story, the summoning of Shandor. In the tiny room at the top of the deserted lighthouse, the magician Shandor sounds the gong. He summons the missing from wherever they may be. 
Ellen, come. Ellen, come. Ellen, come. She comes. She is almost here. Uh, well, that, that gong. What is it? Oh, you come too. Yeah. It's a Sandor Thompson. And he's been summoning your wife. Ellen is coming. She's almost here. No. No, that's not possible. It mustn't be. But it is. She's almost here now. No. No. Do not distress, my friend. She comes gladly. Uh, but she says she says that she neither see nor hear what is to happen. Look into my eyes. I, I... There. I... Now there is a veil over your senses. Uh, uh, what's that? She is here. She whom you have summoned has come to you dressed in white and veiled as a bride. Ella, you come. You called me, and I came. Yes. I have been waiting five years for this moment, Ellen. I come. I was glad to come. Let me lift this veil away so I can see you. Your face, your eyes, your hair. I will lift it. There. <clears throat> oh. Oh, now take me in your arms. <laughs> you summoned me. You cannot turn from me now. No, stay away from me. I'll shoot you. I'll, I'll kill you. You summoned me. I shall remain with you as long as you live. You're still coming toward me. I'm sure the voice hit you. Why aren't you dead? You summoned me. We shall be together always now. Always. No, no, stand back, please. No, ah! He summoned me, and I came. Now I must go back. Go back. Yes, you must return once more from whence you came. It was a great distance, but I was glad to come. Tell my husband not to grieve. I was glad to come. I... Glad, but now I must go back. Now, my friend, you may awaken. Oh, oh sure, though. What happened? Oh, thank you. It's rather like one whose soul was evil uh, gone. When your wife came to him and he saw her face, mad over to him, he leaped to his death on the rock below. Her face, it was horribly mutilated in the accident in which she was killed. She was buried in her wedding dress and veil. She said she was glad to come. But she couldn't have come. She's dead. She's been buried. Yes. Well, do you feel calmer now? Quite a powerful spell, wasn't it? So powerful that it could even call the dead from the grave. Oh, you don't believe a word of it? I'm glad. You'll sleep better tonight. Or perhaps. Drop in on me again soon. I'm always home. Let's look for the house on the other side of the cemetery. The house of Dr. Weir. That man will be back in a moment with a word about next Tuesday night's program. Meanwhile, between now and then, why not buy an Adam Hack Christmas gift certificate for the man in your life? These certificates come inside a miniature hat box with a miniature hat. It can be redeemed at any time at any of the thousands of Adam hat shops and authorized dealers throughout the nation. Get an Adam gift certificate so that he may choose exactly the size, color, and shape he wants at any Adam hat store or authorized dealer. Prices, $3.45 to $10. For Christmas, madam, give him an Adam. Now... Dr. Weir. I hope you'll drop in on me again next week. I want to tell you a story I call Death in the Everglades. A story about a young couple who couldn't wait for their uncle to die and leave them his money. They went into the Everglades to get it. But their uncle's a friend persuaded them to stay. Because they... But the rest of the story will have to wait until your next visit. Good night. Join us.
next week at the same time for another visit with the strange Dr. Weird. The strange Dr. Weird, directed by Josh McGregor, is presented by the makers of Adam Hat, the hats that are always top in quality. This is Mutual. The Strange Dr. Weird. Good evening. Come in, won't you? Why, what's the matter? You seem a bit nervous. Perhaps the cemetery outside this house has upset you. But there are things far worse than cemeteries. For instance... An hypnotic force which drives a person to murder, as in the story I want to tell you tonight. A story I call The Knife of Death. My story, The Knife of Death, begins several years ago in the city of London. All London is blacked out waiting for the nightly visit of German bombers. Henry Hawkins, an air raid warden, slowly makes his way through a street filled with wreckage with the aid of a blackout lantern. As Big Ben strikes the hour, Hawkins stops and listens. Is that you, Albert? Yep. None other, Henry, my lad. It's 10 o'clock and I'm here to relieve you. Look at this street, will you? Pretty much them Jerry's made of it last night. Aye, he's hardly outstanding. Well, I'd best be getting on home now, but before the missus begins worrying. I'll walk a bit of the way with you, Henry. Thanks, Albert. Yeah, you mind the wreckage now, Henry? Oh. This slantering ain't much, but without it, we'd break our necks. Yeah, half a minute, Albert. Shine your light this way, will you? Oh, uh, what's up? I kicked something that was... Here it is. Blimey, it's a knife. Aye, we'd like to clean it up a bit. Henry, look, the handle of that knife. Why, well, it's blood red. Aye, the handle seems to be carved out of some kind of stone. Looks like ruby to me. Now, oh, does it, that? Look at the way it gleams and glitters, Henry. I've never seen anything like it. Nor have I. The handle looks like a pool of blood. And when you hold the lantern close to it, the fire of the stone seems to go right through you. Henry, what's come over you? Come off it, will you? Fire of the stone. Makes me feel all warm inside. And strong. It does, eh? Let me hold it a bit, Henry. No. Now, just a minute, Henry. Half of that knife is mine. I hoped you find it, didn't I? Stop reaching for it. It's mine, I tell you. Half of that knife is mine. i got a right to hold it. Now, give it here. Well, try to take it from me, will you? Well, take this, Henry. Yeah. Don't... Ah! Oh, what? What have I done? Albert. Albert, speak to me. Oh, I didn't mean to stab you, Albert. He's dead. I murdered him. If they catch me, they'll hang me for this. I've got to get out of here. Is that you, Henry? Yes. Where have you been? It's half past twelve. I stopped at the corner pub. Henry, you've been drinking. Well, what if I have? The man has a few drinks and yet as though he's murdered someone. Well, I've got a right to take a few drinks. Stop. Shorten, Henry, I'm not deaf. Here, I'll hang up your coat for you. I can hang it up myself. <gasps> what fell out of... Why, it's a knife. Henry, what are you doing with a knife? I found it. Here, let it alone. It's mine. Why, there's... There's fresh blood all over the blade. Aye. Oh, look, Millie. It's just the colour of the ruby handle. Henry, how did blood get on that blade? It blows and it is like it was alive. Mm. It makes me feel all warm inside. Mm. Warm and strong. Henry, you frighten me when you talk like that. You'd best give me that knife. No, take it anyway. It's mine. Henry, you're drunk. Now give it here. Give it here, I say. No, I'll give it to you. Like this. Ah! Oh. oh. <gasps> Henry, you... You stabbed me. What? What have I done? Millie, speak to me. Oh, I didn't mean to do it, love. It's this knife. It's a cursed knife that made me do it. Oh, Millie, what have I done? Poor Millie. Poor Henry. What's going to happen, Dr. Weird? 
Well, I'll tell you. Can you keep something under your hat? Somehow, Doctor, you remind me of something I was going to say, if you'll uh, pardon the brief interruption. Under more and more hats these days, right inside, you'll find the familiar Adam crest of quality. It's no coincidence that these Adam hats are worn by well-dressed men. Men who know quality instinctively recognize the genuine superiority of an Adam in the fine fur felt, the expert craftsmanship, and the correct styles. What's more, Adam hats come in a wide choice of styles and colors and shapes. Triple assurance that you'll get the hat that's right for you. Next time you go stepping out, wear an Adam. People will notice the difference. Now let's step into the Hawkins house again. Dr. Weir. And now to continue my story, The Knife of Death. The neighbors, hearing Mrs. Hawkins cry out as she was stabbed, called Corporal Mason, a bobby who was on duty nearby. When Mason entered the Hawkins house, he found Henry sitting in a chair, his face buried in his hand. Mrs. Hawkins was dead, the murder weapon on the floor beside the body. Corporal Mason notified Scotland Yard, and 20 minutes later, there was a knock on the door. Here we are, Hawkins. I'll answer the door. Oh, good evening, Corporal. Good evening, sir. I'm Inspector King of Scotland Yard. This is Sergeant Roberts. How do you do, sir? Good evening. Mm, nasty mess. Nothing's been touched? No, sir. I presume this is the dead woman's husband? Yes, sir. Henry Hawkins, his name is. Uh, now then, Hawkins, I must ask you a few questions. I warn you, however, that anything you may say may be used in court against you. You understand? Yes, sir. Very well. Hawkins, you confess to the murder of your wife? Yes, Oh, I killed her. But it wasn't my fault. The knife, it, it drove me to it. The knife drove you to it? I'm afraid I don't understand. It not. With its cursed blood red handle, it made me do it. Mm. It is a most unusual looking knife with that blood red handle. Strange. What is that? In some report or other in our files, I recall reading something about a knife with a blood red handle. Now, where did I read that? Oh, well, never mind. Um, Hawkins, where did you get that knife? While I was coming off air aid duty tonight, I stumbled on it. It's a wreckage. Eh? Where was this? Miller Court, sir, right off Dorset Street. Miller's Court? Miller's Court, you say? Yes, sir. By Jove, now I remember where I read about the knife with the blood red handle. Really, sir? Yes. It was in the file of Jack the Ripper. Jack the Ripper? Yes. In 1886, Jack the Ripper attacked a woman near Hanbury Street. The victim was found dying, but before she died, she muttered a few words about being stabbed by a knife with a handle... Red as blood. Sure it is, sir. You don't think there's any connection between Jack the Ripper's knife and that one lying there on the floor? Now, there's more to my story, Mason. Do you remember the name of Jack the Ripper's last victim? Why, yes, it was Marie Kelly. She was murdered in November 1888. Quite right, Corporal. Do you remember where her body was found? Why, no, sir. Can't say as I do. Her body was found in Miller's Court right off Dorset Street. Miller's Court? Why, that's where Hawkins said he found the knife that's lying there on the floor. Exactly. Are you trying to tell his inspector that the knife Hawkins found belongs to Jack the Ripper? Or that he's been lying in the street these past 50 years? No, no, no. Not lying in the street, Corporal. What if, after Jack the Ripper had murdered Marie Kelly, he had lost the knife at the scene of the crime? Say, for example, it dropped into a drain and the bombs that fell in Miller's court last night... Turned it up again. Oh, come now, sir. Why next you be saying that Hawkins is right, that there is something about that knife that drives people to commit murder with it? There is, I tell you. There is. When you hold it in your hand, it seems to come alive. Drives you against your will to kill. Oh, you're daft. No, meaning, of course, that you think I'm daft, too? Oh, no, sir. I didn't mean that, sir. Well, only... I'll admit it's rather a wild theory. But what if it were true? Don't you see that might account for Marie Kelly being the Ripper's last victim? Once he lost the knife, he was no longer driven to murder. But, sir, you don't really believe that knife had an evil force behind it, do you? No, no, I suppose not, and yet... Well, it's an interesting theory. Oh, yes, sir, yes, sir, quite. Yes, yes, quite. <clears throat> uh, Sergeant Roberts. Yes, sir? You remain here with Corporal Mason while I take the prisoner to Scotland Yard. Yes, sir. Nothing's to be touched, mind you. I'll send the technical staff over at once. Very good, sir. All right, come along, Hawkins. Yes, sir. I say, Sergeant, 
Isn't it about time they were retired in the inspector? <laughs> he acts a bit balmy. Here, here. Have a little more respect there. Oh, come off it. Even you've got to admit the old man sounds balmy. <laughs> Imagine, say, that the knife there on the floor once belonged to Jack the Ripper, <laughs> and there's an evil force behind it. <laughs> the old man's always getting queer ideas. Well, that's just about the queerest I ever heard. Yeah, it's an unusual knife, all right, with that, that red handle, but <laughs> evil force behind it. <laughs> Here now, don't you go picking it up. Take, take it easy, will you? I'm using a handkerchief to pick it up, ain't I? Just want to take a closer look at it. You heard what the inspector said. Nothing was to be touched. You know, the handle does seem to sort of glitter and glow. It makes you feel warm inside. Oh, now you've done it. You put your hand all around the handle and spoil the fingerprints. It feels good to hold it like this. Mason, as your superior, I order you to put that knife down. Put it down, do you hear? Makes you feel strong. Here, give me that knife. No, it's mine. Keep away. You're... Are you daft? Give it to me. Uh, stay away from me. I'll teach you to disobey an order. You'll hand it over or I'll... I'll just take it from me, would you? All right, take it! Ah! He's, he's dead. I killed him. This bloody knife. It drove me to kill him. I didn't want to do it, but it made me. Inspector, he must have been right. It's the knife. It is the knife of Jack the Ripper. Too bad about poor Mason, wasn't it? But as everyone knows, a knife is a dangerous thing to play with. Particularly a knife with a blood-red handle that glows and glitters with a hypnotic force. What happened to it? It's under lock and key at Scotland Yard. And strangely enough, when Henry Hawkins and Corporal Mason were tried for murder, a death weapon wasn't offered in evidence. Inspector King was afraid to have anyone handle it. Oh, by the way, if you should ever come across a knife with a blood-red ruby handle, oh, you have to go. Perhaps you'll drop in on me again soon. Just look for the house. On the other side of the cemetery, the house of Dr. Weir. The Strange Dr. Weir. Good evening. Come in, won't you? What's the matter? You seem a bit nervous. Perhaps the cemetery outside this house has upset you. But there are things far worse than cemeteries. For instance, a mad desire to kill. It's in the story I want to tell you tonight. A story I call Murder Will Out. My story, Murder Will Out, begins in a large park of an eastern metropolis. It is late at night, and the park is all but deserted. Near a small underpass, a young man stands leaning against a tree, whistling softly. As he hears the approaching footsteps, he becomes tense. Good evening. What, what do you want? You're very young and beautiful. Please let me pass. Your throat is white and soft and lovely. If you don't get away from me, I'll scream. I only want to put my hands around your throat. Hey, stay away from me! I... <laughs> That's it, struggle. I like it when they struggle. But they never break my grip. I'm too strong. Good morning, dear. Good morning, Philip. Did you have to work so late in the office last night? Why, it was after one when you got home. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, Helen, but you know how busy I get towards the end of the month. Uh, morning paper come yet, dear? Yes, here it is. Philip, they found another girl strangled to death last night. Oh, you don't say. Isn't it horrible? Five young girls in less than two months. It's getting so I'm afraid to go out alone at night. Mm, 
Oh, Philip. Speaking of going out, will you be working tonight? Well, I, I don't know yet. Why do you ask? Well, Claire Winthrop made an appointment for me tonight with that marvelous new fortune teller, Andre Duval. And I want you to go with me. Uh, Helen, you know what I think of fortune tellers. They're all a pack of frauds and charlatans. Oh, but Duval isn't a fraud, Philip. Oh. He's predicted some of the most amazing things that have come true. Oh, Helen, that's nonsense, pure nonsense. I tell you, he's a fraud, just like the rest of them. All you're doing is wasting your time and money. Nevertheless, I want to try him. And I want you to go with me. Please, Philip. But uh, I, I may have to work tonight. Well, my appointment with your Val isn't until 10 o'clock. Surely you can manage to meet me there by then. Well, all right, Helen. I'll be at Duval's tonight, and I'll prove to you that he's a fake, just like all fortune tellers. <laughs> just want to look at oh, you. Oh, please let me buy. You're beautiful, just like the others. My see others. Yes, your throat is so soft and lovely. You're it's just the stranger. Help! Help! That's it. That's it. Struggle. I like it when you struggle. But you see, you can't break my grip. Old hat is an expression that means... We've heard that one before. Old hat is also an article of clothing that too many men persist in wearing to the detriment of their personal appearance. We've said it so often. Perhaps you cling to that old misshapen piece of headgear because you think no new hat can be comfortable. Not so with an Adam. Because Adam hats come in a wide variety of sizes and shapes, you're assured of a comfortable fit. What's more, an Adam adds immeasurably to your appearance. Style for fashion, Adam hats are made of richly lustrous all-fur felt in the smartest shades. So toss away that tired old turban and buy a new Adam hat tomorrow. Now, we return to Dr. Weir. And now I'll continue my story, Murder Will Out. In the large, luxurious apartment of André Duval, Helen Arnold waited impatiently for the arrival of her husband, Philip. The grandfather clock in the foyer showed the time to be 25 minutes past 10. Miss Philip entered. Hello, darling. Sorry I'm late. I, I was delayed. Are you feeling all right? Uh, of course, of course. Why do you ask? Your eyes are so bright and your cheeks are flushed. You look as if you have a fever. Oh, no, nonsense, nonsense. I'm perfectly well. Now, uh, where's your friend Duval, the great fortune teller? Oh, <laughs> you were right, Philip. He's nothing but a fraud. I paid him $10 <laughs> and he prophesied nothing but unhappiness. <laughs> this grows more and more interesting. Tell me, what exactly did he tell you? He said that someone very near and dear to me was destined to die within a year. <laughs> Well, this Duval's a cheerful fellow, is he? I must have him tell me my fortune, by all means. Oh, it's just a waste of time and money. Come on, please, Philip, let's go home. Oh, nonsense, nonsense. I wouldn't miss this for the world. Now, where is he? Come on. <laughs> Through that door over all there. All right, just you wait where you are. This shouldn't take long. All right, Philip. Come in. Oh, Mr. Duval, I'm Philip Arnold. Oh, yes. Come in, Mr. Arnold. Thank you. If you will sit here, please. Of course. Ah, oh, I see in your eyes, Mr. Arnold that you have no faith in. <laughs> Frankly, Mr. Duval, I haven't. But I'm perfectly willing to have my mind changed. Perhaps if I were to tell you something of your past, something only you know, it might help. It might. If you will run the palm of your left hand across this pile of sand, please. Oh, well, all right, all right. There you are. Well, come on, what are you reading the sand? I see many things in the sand. But even I may be wrong... Uh, would you mind running the palm of your hand across the sand again? Oh, very well. There. Huh. Oh, come on. Why do you keep staring at the sand like that? What do you see? Uh, the sands reveal a dark and tortured past. Uh, you have taken human lives. Uh, you're wrong. No. It is all here in the sands. You have murdered the innocent. Who are you? What's your game? Look, if you're trying to... You needn't be afraid, Mr. Arnold. 
Whatever I tell you will not be revealed to anyone else. How can I be sure of that? There is an old Chinese proverb. In the end, justice works itself out. What is meant to be, will be. Nothing can change that which is ordained. You mean... You mean because you believe that, you wouldn't go to the police? Yes. Uh, uh, I was a fool to get excited. What if you did go to the police? They wouldn't believe you anyway. Shall I read your future for you now? That is what you came for, no? My, my future? So. Well, all right, all right, go ahead. Uh, please to run the palm of your right hand across this pile of sand. Oh, very well. Ah. There, there. So. And what do you see? Oh, sometimes it is better not to know what the future holds. Well, whatever it is, I want to know. Now, come on, let's have it. Well, as you wish. The sands are not altogether clear, but I can see that you are going to commit one more murder. Uh, and that when you do, you will be caught. Caught? Yes. You will be caught and executed. And nothing you can do will change it. <laughs> What's wrong with you? Ever since Duval told your fortune the other night, you've been nervous as a cat. I'm, I'm perfectly all right, I tell oh, you. you're not. You haven't slept a wink for three nights. Why don't you tell me what Duval said? Look, I, I've told you over and over again, it was just a lot of gibberish. Now, stop asking so many questions, please. But I'd like to know what he told you. Will you be oh. quiet? Oh, oh, I'm... Don't kick me. I'm... 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 Oh. Helen, I, I'm sorry. I, I don't know what came over me. I... You know, I didn't I didn't mean to choke you, Donnie. I I'm sorry if I made you. Helen, my my head aches. What I need is some fresh air. I, I'm going out for a walk in the park. Good evening. Oh you startled me. I'm sorry. What do you want? Please let me pass. You're so young. You have such a lovely white throat. You're, you're the strangler. No, don't. Oh, such a lovely throat. You are going to commit one more murder. No. And when you do, you will be caught. No. Help. Help the strangler. Wait. She's gotten away. It's all Duval's fault. Yes, Duval. I had my hands around us throat, Duval, when suddenly I heard you speaking to me. You said, you're going to commit one more murder. And when you do, you'll, you'll be caught. <laughs> and thus it shall be. Nothing can change that which is ordained. But I didn't murder her. Don't you understand me? I, I lost my nerve and I let go of her. She got away from me. Nevertheless, you will commit one more murder. And when you do, you will be caught and executed. Duval, tell me... Well, whose death will they execute? Uh, the sons are confused. I can't be sure. Well, don't you see? If I know the name of the person, I, I won't go through with the murder. Then I can't be executed. I tell it. you, I cannot tell the name of the person for whose death you will be executed. You're lying. You can, but you won't. I cannot do it. It is useless for you to insist. I'll make you tell me. I'll make you. I'll make you. Now, Lance, if you tell me what, what I want to know, I can't. You can and you will. You're so hot in the sand. Give me the name. No. No, I give it to me. Yes. Now I know. That's better. Now, now what's the name? The sons are confused. I didn't know before, but now suddenly I know. Come on, what is it? The name is Andre Duval. You? Yes. You? Yes. But, but the man, you're not going to die. You're going to be all right. No. No, I am dying. The strain and the shock have been too great for my weak heart. No. I have only a few moments. Duval. Duval. He's dead. I, I murdered him. Oh, hang on in there. Open up. It's the police. Too bad about Philip Arnold, wasn't it? When he was sentenced to death for Duval's murder, his friends were all mystified because he didn't appeal his case. But, of course, Philip knew it was hopeless. What is written in the sands of time cannot be changed. And sure enough, 
bright and early one morning, they did hang him. Oh, by the way, if you know any fortune tellers, you might be wise to give them a wide berth. If you don't, you too might... Oh, you have to go? Perhaps you'll drop in on me again soon. Just look for the house on the other side of the cemetery. The house of Dr. Weir. The strange Dr. Weir. Good evening. Come in, won't you? Why, what's the matter? You seem a bit nervous. Perhaps the cemetery outside this house has upset you. But there are things far worse than cemeteries. For instance, a woman with murder in her heart is in my story tonight. A story I call The Voice of Death. story, The Voice of Death, begins in the snow-covered wilderness of Canada. In a high, narrow canyon, a man and woman on skis sit resting on the trunk of a fallen tree, catching their breath. Blanche, I, I can't tell you how sorry I am that Uncle John didn't leave you anything in his will. Well, there's nothing to be sorry about, Gerald. After all, I was only your Uncle John's second cousin. Well, I only wish Jane and Dan had taken it as well. They certainly were downcast after the reading of the will this morning. Well, naturally. They were your uncle's niece and nephew, too, and they had hoped to share the estate with you. You can't blame them for being disappointed. No, I suppose not. We'd better be starting back to the lodge. I can see you're a little uneasy about being in this canyon. Well, isn't it a bit dangerous being here? Look at the way the snow's piled up above us on both slopes of this canyon. If there was a snow slide, we'd be buried alive. It isn't that dangerous. Of course, a loud noise or someone shouting might start a slide. Come on along. There's some sort of scientific explanation for that, isn't there? Hmm? I mean, vibrations set up by the voice? Yes, that's right. I've often stood outside the mouth of the canyon and started snow slides in here by shouting. Uh, snow slide must be quite a sight. Hundreds of tons of snow roaring and crashing down. Oh, it is. Well, <laughs> you can breathe easily now. We're out of danger. Oh, dear. Blew something? Oh, yes, my camera. I think I left it back on the trunk of the tree we were sitting on. Oh, Gerald, would you mind getting it for me? No, of course not, Blaine. You say it's on the trunk of the tree? Yes, yes, that's right. Uh, do you see it, Gerald? No, Blaine, I don't. Well, perhaps it fell into the snow. Look around. I am looking. But I don't see any sign of it. Brad, get it. Brad, the snow. Gerald, run this way. Help, help, help. Too bad, Gerald. But that's what happens to people who stand between me and a million dollars. <laughs> Blanche, it's so horrible. Gerald buried under all that snow. Perhaps we should have stayed into the canyon until they found the body. Oh, nonsense, Jane. There's nothing we could have done there. Dan and I will share Uncle John's estate now. But I'd gladly give up my share if it would bring Gerald back alive. Oh, I know you would, dear. Uh, we crossed the river here, Jane. But, but the ice looks so thin. Blanche, we didn't cross here on the way to the canyon, did we? Uh, no, dear. This is a shortcut. Blanche, it looks too dangerous. It does, the water. I'll tell you what, I'll cross first. Oh, Blanche, I wish you wouldn't. That ice is going to break any minute. Nonsense. See, I'm already halfway across. But I could see cracks in the ice under your skin. So can I. But the ice is still strong enough to support me. There, see? I made it. All right, Jane, it's your turn now. Blanche, I... I'm frightened. Darling, there's nothing to be afraid of. Now, come along. Well, all right. Look, you better take off your skis. I think you'll find it easier to walk than ski over the ice. You're not as good a skier as I am, you know. Oh, 
Very well, Blanche. If you say no. Hurry, dear. It will soon be dark. I've got him off now. Here I come. That's it. I told you the ice would hold you. Oh, Blanche, the, the ice feels as though it's going to give way under me any second. Oh, it felt the same way when I crossed, but as you see, I managed to get Blanche, here. the ice is breaking. Tell me. should have known better than to take off her skis before crossing the ice. Well, now, that leaves only Dad. Will Blanche succeed in getting rid of Dan? Will she get Uncle John's estate? Will Dr. Weird be back to tell us about the rest of this chilling tale? Yes. Yes, I'll be back. But with all these questions, aren't you going to ask one about Adam Hatch? No, Doctor, I'm not. You see, there are no questions about Adam hats because Adam is unquestionably the finest hat value in America today. Seriously, every Adam, regardless of price, offers outstanding quality in workmanship, choice of material, attention to detail. The style features of Adam are just as remarkable, tailored and blocked by experts in an amazing variety of distinctive shapes and shades. Adam hats offer the latest word in smart fashion. No man can afford to neglect the appearance of his headgear. Every man can afford an Adam. Now, let's see what chills the rest of your story will afford, Dr. Weir. And now to continue my story, The Voice of Death. It is the day following the tragic deaths of Gerald and Jane. In the living room of the luxurious lodge of the late John Drake are Blanche, Dan, and Sidney Rand, attorney for the estate. There is a strange look in Mr. Rand's eyes as he speaks to Blanche. All I can say is it looks very odd, Blanche. First you go skiing with Gerald and he dies under a snow slide. And a few hours later, while alone with you, Jane drowns crossing a river. I don't like your attitude, Mr. Rand. You act as though I caused their death. Blanche is right, Mr. Rand. You haven't any right to say that. The village coroner said their deaths were accidental. I know what the village coroner said. But that doesn't mean that I have to agree. Well, look, it's, it's five o'clock now. If you don't stop at the station right now, you're going to miss your train. Dan, won't you change your mind and come with me? No. I told you I'm staying up here for another week. I, I need the rest. I just hope you won't find permanent rest up here. And just what do you mean by that? Just this. If anything were to happen to you, Blanche would be heir to everything. Think it over. Oh, Dan, you don't believe I had anything to do with their deaths, do you? Of course not. Blanche, it's absurd to think that you could have been to blame in any way. Four days passed. Days in which steadily falling snow kept Blanche and Dan cooped up in the lodge. With each day that passed, Blanche seemed increasingly nervous and jumpy. For no reason is that was apparent to Dan. When the fifth day dawned bright and fair, Dan suggested a long ski run, and Blanche eagerly agreed. After skiing a few minutes, she called out, Dan! Dan, we aren't going through the canyon, are we? Hey, of course we are. Dan, let's go around it this time. Oh, that's three miles further on. What's wrong with going through the canyon? Oh, uh, is it because that's where Gerald died? Yes, I, I guess that's it, Dan. Well, now, look, I, I hope you aren't brooding about Gerald's death, Blanche. You mustn't be. I, I'm not brooding, but I... Dan, have you heard a voice calling outside the house the last few nights? A voice? Yes. I've waked up several times thinking I heard Gerald's voice calling out in the storm. Oh, Blanche, look, you, you heard the wind howling. Now, come on, will you? You've got to get through the canyon. That's the only way to conquer your nerves. Girl, now only another couple of hundred yards and we'll be out of the canyon. Oh, let's hurry, Dan. This is where it happened. Come on along, then, if you want to hurry. It's Gerald. Gerald's voice. Blanche, come on. Oh, no. No. Blanche, why have you stopped? Come on. Oh, 
I don't hear anything. I don't. It's just my imagination. Blanche, come along. That snow slide, you almost killed yourself. Mr. Ranch, she's dead. She's buried under all that snow. Yes, I know. Well, you heard her confess, didn't you? Yes, but when I agreed to follow the instructions you left for me in the mailbox, I, I never dreamed it would end like this. I kept on telling myself she was innocent. Yes, but she wasn't. I knew all along she couldn't be. That's why I made her think I was clearing out. Instead, I went down to the gamekeeper's cottage by the lake. That's where I've been the last few days. Yes, I guess that after I got your first note asking me not to show any surprise no matter what happened. But, Mr. Rand, the... The voice that Blanche heard in the night and the voice just now, I could have sworn it was Gerald's voice. I counted on that. I knew Gerald well. And vocal limitations are a sort of a power trick of mine. My scheme was a wild one, Dan, but it was the only possibility of getting a confession from her. Those murders she committed were perfect. Two perfect murders. And she was so beautiful. Her own screams brought down a snow slide that killed her. And I don't think all the judges in the world could have found a more fitting punishment than the one her own conscience provided. Too bad about poor Blanche, wasn't it? It looks as though the man who said the female of the species is more deadly than the male knew what he was talking about. By the way, if you're an heir and you know someone who stands to gain by your death, I'd be very careful to stay away from... Oh, you have to go now? Perhaps you'll drop in on me again soon. Just look for the house on the other side of the cemetery. The house of Dr. Weir. <laughs> The Strange Dr. Weird. Good evening. Come in, won't you? Why, what's the matter? Not nervous, are you? I don't want you to be nervous. Uh, perhaps if I told you a story, it might help to calm you. I know a very nice story about a man who tried to live another man's life for him. I call it The Two Faces of Death. And now for my story, The Two Faces of Death. In an office high above the city, George Post of the financial firm of Post and Jones is dictating to his secretary, Nelson Smith, when the telephone rings. Shall I answer it, Mr. Post? No, I'll get it, Nelson. Hello, Post speaking. Who? Oh. Yes. Yes, I see. Monday morning, you say? And the tip came from... Yes, yes, I get it. I'll take the necessary steps. Goodbye. Nelson, where are you going? I was going to the washroom, Mr. Post. Come back here. Yes, sir. Nelson, that phone call was from a friend of mine. He says the authorities are going to investigate the firm's books Monday morning. They got a tip that we're indulging in phony stock deals. And that tip came from you. No. No, no Mr. Post, it wasn't me. You turned us in, Nelson. Please, Mr. Post, I, I don't know what you're talking about. I... 
What are you doing with that paper knife? I'm just going to teach you a little lesson. No, no stay away from me. Stay. <laughs> that, Nelson, is how a stool pigeon always winds up. Dead. Is there anything wrong, George? I thought I... Good Lord, what have you done? Listen, Waller. Nelson tipped off the feds that our stock deals have been phonies. We better clear out. I had to kill Nelson or he'd have had the cops right after us. Yes, but murder... Don't worry, I have a plan. We'll hide Nelson's body in the closet. This is Friday. It won't be found till Monday. But then what? All right, you'll see. Right now, we're going to drive up to my lodge in the mountains. I have a new lodge keeper up there named Tony Amato. And Tony's going to surprise you, Walter. He's going to surprise you very much. Late that evening, the two partners reached the lonely hunting lodge in the Adirondacks. And when Walter Jones got his first glimpse of Tony Amato, the lodgekeeper, he could scarcely conceal his astonishment. George Post gave Tony orders to prepare dinner. Uh, just whip up anything you've got, Tony. We're stalled. Yes, Mr. Post. I'll have something ready in half an hour. Good. We'll wash up meanwhile. Right, Mr. Post. Great gosh, George. Is that the surprise? Mm -hmm. Why, he looks just like you. He could be your twin brother. That's the surprise, Walter. You know, fate works in funny ways. I was driving back from Chicago last winter when I picked up a hitchhiker, Tony. He was broke and desperate. He confessed to me the police wanted him for petty larceny. When I offered him this job as lodge keeper, he was so grateful he almost cried. I see. Both Tony and I recognized that we looked alike. He thought I was helping him because of that. Actually, I figured I might need a fall guy sometime soon... And he'd be it. Now the time is here. <laughs> right. Suppose the police raid this lodge and find Tony Amato dead wearing my clothes. Beside him, there's a note confessing everything. What'll it look like, huh? Suicide, of course. <laughs> They'll bury him and stop looking for you. Exactly. And you can go on back to town and claim you didn't know what was going on. I'll take all the blame and clear you entirely. Why, that's perfect, George. But after you've uh, taken care of Tony Amato's identity, what will you do? I'll go back to Chicago and give myself up to the police. What? Yes. I'll claim amnesia. Oh. Say, I can't remember what happened. Uh, just that I committed some kind of crime and I want to clear myself. If necessary, I'll go to jail for six months for petty larceny. It'll be the perfect hiding place. Well, I'll be jiggered. It's brilliant, George. Positively brilliant. <laughs> yeah. Well, suppose we get ready for dinner. It's going to be an important dinner for Tony Amato. His last. If George spends a few months in jail, we can certainly spend a few seconds on an important detail or two. Details can be important, you know. In hats, for example, such details as these. How wide is the brim? Is the edge evenly stitched? Is the hat band distinctive? And does the shade harmonize with the rest of the hat? If the size label says seven and a quarter, is it exactly seven and a quarter or more like seven and three eighths? Gentlemen, these may seem like small details, but add them up and you have the difference between an ordinary hat and one that really looks right on you. The makers of Adam hats know this well. They take a special care in the fashioning of every detail in their long line of smart hats. It's this sort of style testing that assures you of correct hat styling when you buy an Adam. Now, Dr. Weird. Now I'll continue my story, The Two Faces of Death. Dinner at the hunting lodge is over, and George Post has invited Tony Amato, who looks so strangely like him, to sit down and have a drink with them. Tony is almost pathetically grateful to his employer. Gee, Mr. Post, I don't know what I'd have done if you hadn't picked me up that day. I, I can't tell you what this job means to me. George is like that, big-hearted. You <laughs> like it here, Tony? Oh, it's swell, Mr. Jones. So quiet and peaceful. Uh, you, uh, you haven't been into the village much, have you, Tony? Oh, no, Mr. Post. You warned me about that. I haven't been to town once in the whole three months. Good. Well, let's finish our drinks. Here's to crime. <sighs> Gee, that's good. Well, Mr. Post, if you'll excuse me. Uh, uh, I'll clear off. I feel so funny. What? What's wrong with me? You're dying, Tony, that's all. 
dying. Yes, there's poison in that drink. You see, Tony, I need your life. You're going to die and become me. I'm going to live and become you. Simple, isn't it? You're going to become me? That's how Well, I, I hope you enjoy it. I, I hope you enjoy being Tony Amato. I, I... Well, he's gone. Very nicely done, George. Yes, I think so. In a moment, you'll join him, Walter. No, I'll join him? What do you say? Just that I poison your drink, too. You... Poisoned my drink? Yes, you don't think I could leave you alive to double-cross me for the money we've got hidden away, do you? <laughs> I was going to double-cross you, George. I... But you beat me to it. I... <laughs> you clever, George. Very clever. Someday, you'll be too clever. Someday. Two days later, in the early evening, George Post, dressed in clothes that had belonged to his ex-lodge keeper, Tony Amato, descended from a bus in midtown Chicago. He walked a few blocks, then stopped to buy an evening paper. Yeah, it should be here. They've had plenty of time to find the bodies. Oh, yes, yes. Yeah, here it is. Banking firm partners and suicide pact. Police disclosed today that George Post and Walter Jones, the stock brokerage firm of Post and Jones, took their own lives. And... <laughs> Save for a complete auditing of the books to determine the size of the swindle, authorities have marked the case closed. Well, that's that. George Post is dead. Now to carry out the rest of the plan, to give myself up to the police and clear Tony Amato's record. Uh-oh, here comes a policeman now. He'll do. Oh, um, officer. Huh? What is it? Officer, I, I want to give myself up. Give yourself up? What for would you be giving yourself up to? Oh, Tony Amato, is it? What? Well, what brings you back to Chicago, Tony? Oh, you you know me? Sure I know you, Tony. Uh, didn't I see you often enough hanging out in the pool rooms here in me beat? Oh, uh, then you must know what I did. Uh, what I'm wanted for. Huh? Well, well, you see, I was in an auto accident. I hit my head. I can't remember much except my name and that I was running away from the police. So it was the police you were running away from? Yes, I think I stole a little money. I want to clear myself. So you think you stole a little money? <laughs> That's a hot one. Well, maybe you did. But we don't want you, Tony. You're what? free as the wind for all week here. You, you mean I'm, I'm not wanted for anything? Not as far as we are concerned. Why, well, well, that, that's fine. I, I, I guess my hey, memory. Tony, is... Look out! That car! What? Ah! Here he is, Inspector. Hmm. Yeah, it's Tony, all right. So the Scarlet Mob got him, did they? Yeah. I saw the car coming. I ducked just in time. I wonder what brought Tony back to Chicago. He must have known Joe Scarlet was after him for holding out on his numbers collections. I sure can't figure it out, sir. He was trying to tell me something about losing his memory when they got him. Yeah. One of the boys must have seen him on the street and recognized him. Well, I guess we'll never know. Hey, wait a minute. His lips are moving. He is trying to speak. <laughs> What is it, Tony? I... I... not... You're going to become me. That's a hot one. You're clever, George. Very clever. Uh, no, I'm not... not Tony. Can't catch what he's saying, Inspector. I hope you enjoy being Tony Amato. Someday, George, you'll be too clever. Too clever. <laughs> He's dead, Inspector. Tony is dead. Yes, our friend George was clever. But when you try to live somebody else's life, you can never be sure what you're letting yourself in for, can you? That's why it's always best just to be yourself. So if you ever meet somebody who looks exactly like you, don't let yourself be tempted to try what George did. I knew a man once who thought he could... Oh, you have to go now. 
Perhaps you'll drop in again soon. Just look for the house on the other side of the cemetery. The house of Dr. Weir. The Strange Dr. Weir. Good evening. Come in, won't you? Why, what's the matter? You seem a bit pale. Uh, have you been working too hard? Possibly a story might help relax you. A story, say, about a man who could read other men's minds and who felt sure his strange power would make him tremendously wealthy. I call his story The Man Who Knew Everything. My story, The Man Who Knew Everything, begins in the Crystal Club, a lavish nightclub. A small man, very old, clad in robes of yellow silk, moves from table to table. He carries a small crystal ball into which he peers as he tells diners their most secret thoughts. He calls himself Randor the Mystic. Watching him from the doorway are three men. Nick Thompson, owner of the club, Rocky Brogan, his bodyguard, and Jerry Fenton, the press agent who handles Randor's affairs. It's really an act Randor has there, Jerry. What I'd like to know is, is it a gag or is it on the level? It's on the level, all right. You really can look inside your mind, Nick. And I'm staying away from him. I don't want anybody reading my mind. I know too much about myself already. And if he's on the level, what's he doing working in a nightclub act? Why doesn't he use his little trick to clean up big? Eh, he says it's dangerous to use powers like that for yourself. If you ask me, I think he's bugs. Yeah, I'll say. Imagine being able to read the combination of a bank vault from the cashier's mind. Gee. It would be handy. Nick, I gotta do an errand. If Randor asks for me, tell him I'll be back before the midnight show, will you? Slipping from the club, Jerry Fenton, a few minutes later, let himself into the small apartment where his employer, Randor, lived alone. Taking a sheaf of papers from a desk, he settled down to read. An hour passed, and then, unexpectedly, he heard the door open. Ah, Randall. Yes, my friend. I felt unwell. My heart pained me, so I returned to my home to find you reading my secret document. Well, so what? You have pried into my secrets. I can see it clearly in your mind. This is not the first time. All right, then I have. And listen, you nightclub swami. I've found out how you do your mind reading stunt. That crystal ball you carry has got nothing to do with it. It's those cough drops you're always chewing. They're doped. True. They are doped with a specialist Indian drug which keys up the brain so that it can receive the delicate thought waves from another mind. Yeah, and I know how to prepare those cough drops of yours. It's a very neat trick, being able to hear another man's thoughts right inside your own skull. I can do it myself now. And you intend to use your knowledge for evil? No, it must not be. Swear to me you will forget what you know, or else... Or else what? Or else you must die. Ah, so that's how it is, huh? Well, two can play at that game. What are you doing? If one of us has got to go, it won't be me. This cushion, Randor. Eh? If I hold it over your face for a minute, uh, when they find you, they'll think your ticker gave out on you. No, you dare not. This power you have stolen, it will turn on you. Men's thoughts are not to be trusted. You are... Uh, 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 sorry, Randor. But nothing's stopping me now. Nothing, do you hear? Jerry Fenton had foretold the death of Randor the mystic was ascribed to natural causes. But for several days, Fenton stayed in seclusion, studying the notes he had stolen from the dead man. Then, one evening, he dropped in on Nick Thompson and his bodyguard, Rocky Brogan, in Thompson's office. Hello, Jerry. Sit down. Thanks. Nick, I've decided to take over the Crystal Club and your little numbers racket. Yeah. Hey, what kind of a gag is this? It's no gag. You see, Nick, I happen to know 
You're wanted for murder in California. How'd you know that? I know. That's why you're turning the club and your organization over to me. Rocky. Yeah, boss? Get out your gun. We're taking care of this rat now. I, uh, I hate to tell you this, boss, but I'm working for Jerry now. You know what? Yeah. You see, I know things about Rocky, too. He's decided it's smart to stick by me. That's right, boss. He knows too much about me. Well, in that case... Right, I... All right boss. No! Well, that took care of him. Yeah. Now, I'm boss around here, understand? Oh, yeah, 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 boss. And, Rocky, I'm on my way. In a year, I'll own this town. <laughs> Uh, Dr. Weir, the first part of your story about Jerry makes me wonder, uh, do you know anything about reading minds? A little, a little. Mm -hmm. For instance, right now, I can see you have something on your mind about hats. Adam, hats. Doctor, how did you guess? You know, I was just thinking that Jerry, or any man for that matter, would feel as if he owned the town if he owned an Adam. And it doesn't take mind reading to see why. One look at the flare and dash of Adam hats will make any man glow with enthusiasm. A man who knows quality appreciates such Adam features as the fine tailoring, the lustrous all-fur felt, the distinctive styles, and the softly harmonized shades. And there's more to an Adam than just meets the eye. Put one on and feel how comfortably it fits, as if it were made expressly for you. What's more, an Adam keeps its fine shape. You'll always feel confident of your appearance when you wear an Adam hat. Now, our mastermind, Dr. Weird. And now to continue my story, the man who knew everything. It is a day or so later, and Jerry Fenton, confident now of his ability to accomplish anything he desires by being able to read minds, is closeted with Rocky Brogan. All right, now, Rocky, we're ready to get underway. What are you figuring on, boss? I want to get a bankroll together. A big bankroll. So I'm going to start planning a few really big jobs to get quick money. If um, I can make a suggestion, yeah. boss. If there's a job I've been kind of thinking about for a long time. All right, what is it? It's a payroll job. The S&J Company across the river. Now, every Friday, they send an armored truck to the bank here in town, pick up a hundred grand and cart it back. Now, if we was could pick off that truck some nice, safe way... A hundred thousand dollars. Yeah, that'd be a swell beginning. And tomorrow's Friday. Tomorrow night, that payroll is going to be ours. The next morning, Fenton, on a pretext, interviewed the treasurer of the S&J Manufacturing Company. And as they talked of... Harmless matters. Fenton's keyed up senses plucked from the other's mind. Fact so astounding that Fenton was still laughing to himself when he returned to the crystal club. <laughs> well, Rocky, it's all set. We're going to pick up that payroll this afternoon. That's yeah, fast works. Boys, will we knock off the armored car? We're not even going to bother with that armored car. It's just a bluff. The payroll is really delivered in an old truck marked. Tropical Towel Supply Company. You're kidding. An hour after the armored car leaves, the laundry truck drives up at the rear of the bank. The driver carries in a bundle of clean towels and comes out with a bag of dirty ones. The payroll is hidden among the dirty towels. Well, I'll be a monkey's uncle. Follow that truck and pick it up when it reaches the warehouse district. Take it to our own garage. Get the payroll, then get rid of the truck and the driver. After that, report back to me. It'll be like taking candy from a baby. Okay, boss, I'm on my way. That afternoon, as Fenton waited for Rocky Brogan's return, he let himself daydream a little. A hundred thousand dollars delivered in a bag of dirty towels. And I learned about it as easily as if that fool treasurer had told me in so many words. <laughs> I will own this town in a year. Why not? There's no one to stop. Yeah, who is it? Hey, boss, Rocky. Come in, Rocky. Boss, it's the driver of the towel supply truck. Brian, what you bring him here for? I tell you, you're making a mistake, a bad mistake. Yeah, we took the laundry truck smooth as ice cream, boss. 
We got it in our garage. But we can't find the payroll. You can't? Why not? Because there isn't any payroll. That's why. Yeah, the boys, you know, the boys are wondering maybe if you didn't make a mistake, boys. I haven't made a mistake. Rocky, step outside. I'll find out where that payroll is. Okay, boss. Call me when you made him talk. I don't know what your game is, but you're making a terrible mistake, mister. Really, you're... I can't be wrong. I know it. <clears throat> Pardon me, I need a cough drop. Ah, there we are. Now we'll get the truth. But I told you the truth already. Be quiet. So, the bag with a payroll in it is hidden in a secret compartment under the truck body. <gasps> no, you can't know that. Nobody in the world knows that but me. But I do know it now. No, you won't get away with it. I'll stop you. I'll stop you with this. A gun? Huh? Yeah. And you're going to let me go or I'll shoot. I'll shoot to kill. Then shoot, why don't you? I'll tell you why you don't shoot. Because the gun's empty and you know it. It's not true. Stay away from me. I'll pull a trigger. I will. Go ahead and pull it. You see, the bluff is no good. I know the gun is empty just as well as you do. In fact, I know it's empty because you do. Now, give it to me. No. Damn wreck. I'll shoot. I'll shoot. Uh, uh, who are you? You shot me. The gun wasn't empty. But I... I thought... You thought... Uh... He's dead. I've killed him. The gun was loaded. I, I thought it was empty. I was just bluffing. All along, I thought it was empty. So that was what Randor the mystic meant when he said men's thoughts couldn't be trusted. When a man doesn't even know his own gun is loaded, what good is it going to do to read his mind? Poor Jerry... Perhaps his fate will be a lesson to you. Don't depend on anyone else to do your thinking for you, because sometimes... Oh, you have to go. Perhaps, uh, perhaps you'll drop in again soon. Just look for the house on the other side of the cemetery. The house of Dr. Weird. <laughs> Strange Dr. Weird. Good evening. Come in, won't you? Why, what's the matter? You seem a bit nervous, uh, pale and distraught. Perhaps a story would help calm your nerves. Yes, a delightful little story about a dead man who acts just as if he were alive. I know you like it. I call it, He Woke Up Dead. My story, He Woke Up Dead, begins with two men pacing back and forth at the top of a high cliff overlooking the Pacific. They are John Raymond and his brother Gregory, a gaunt man in whose eyes gleams a fanatical fire. Gregory, the answer is no. You're asking for $100,000 from the Raymond Foundation to spend on fake yogis and swamis trying to get in touch with the dead. Well, you're not getting it. But, John, all my life I've been studying death and what is in the life beyond. And now, with just a little money, I know I can penetrate its mysteries. The Raymond Foundation would be the laughing stock of the world if it went in for such a crackpot idea. So, you think I'm a crackpot? Well, when you die, John, according to Father's will, I'll be head of the Raymond Foundation. Then you'll see, I'll turn the whole foundation into a great research laboratory to study death. That will never be. I intend to have the courts change the will. So you'll never be head of the foundation, Gregory. No. No, you can't. You're blocking a tremendously important piece of work. But I won't let you. So? Just what can you do about it? This, John. I can do this. No, no, break go. No! Uncle Gregory, you say father had a dizzy spell and fell from the cliff before you could catch him? Yes, Jack. 
It happened so fast. I, I could do nothing. But Father never got dizzy. He, his health was perfect. A groundkeeper says he saw you push Father off the cliff. Jack. That's nonsense. I was trying to catch him, pull him back. Jack, you know Uncle Gregory wouldn't do a thing. I'm not so sure, Susan. Now listen to me, both of you. The coroner said your father died accidentally, and that closes the matter. Not with me, it doesn't. No? Well, I'm now head of the Raymond Foundation. And I'm going to pour all the resources of the Foundation into an effort to contact the dead. Why, that's insane. The Foundation scientists are on the verge of a cure for cancer, for tuberculosis. You can't stop their work now. I can, and I will. Oh, no, you won't. We'll stop you somehow. Because you did murder Dad. You killed him to get control of the Foundation for your crazy schemes. Get out. Get out, both of you. Get out before Jack, I... Jack, get out! Jack, he tripped on the rug. His head hit against the fireplace. Wait. See how badly he's hurt. Jack, what is it? Is he... is he dead? Yes, Susan. All his life, Uncle Gregory's been trying to find out what happened when you die. Now, now he's going to find out. Uh, Dr. Weird, before you give us the second half of tonight's tale... Can you tell me why you're called doctor? Easy. When people listen to this program, I show them how to avoid such uh, unhealthy things as being murdered and... Uh, well, be... somehow, doctor, I doubt whether that would cure anybody of anything, especially a case of nerves. But I'd like to tell the men in our audience how to cure something that can be cured. It's old hat-itis. Being addicted to the same old weather-beaten hat. The only real remedy for old hat-itis is to go out and get yourself a good new hat, or two or three. Now, Adam hats are priced so sensibly, only $3.45 to $10, you'll easily be able to afford more than one. Combining distinctively smart styles with fine quality materials and craftsmanship, Adam hats are a truly outstanding value. You'll find it more than worth your while to discard your old headpiece for a brand new Adam hat, or two, or three. Now, back to Dr. Weir. And now I'll continue my story, He Woke Up Dead. When Gregory Raymond returned to consciousness, he was alone in a great dim room. The thick, cloying scent of flowers was heavy in the air. Startled, he saw at the other end of the room three coffins resting on trestles. One of the coffins was banked with flowers and tall candles burned at either end of it. Dazed and bewildered, Gregory Raymond strode toward the three coffins. This room, where am I? Stained glass windows, it's like a church. Who's in this coffin with all the flowers on it? Why, I, the body in this coffin is mine. No. No, it's impossible. I'm not dead. I, I can't be. You mustn't be upset, mister. Most of us feel that way at first. Huh? Yes, we did. But it will pass soon. What? Who are you? Turning, Gregory Raymond was astounded to see dim figures coming toward him from the shadows. A man and a woman, both very old. They smiled at him sympathetically. I... I'm Joshua Benson. This is my wife, Nellie. These are our bodies in these other two coffins. I, I don't understand. Oh, you will. Look, here in this coffin. Oh. See? It's my body, isn't it? It looks just like you. It is me. The earthly me, I mean. Oh. And now this one is Nellie. Oh. You mustn't be so upset. You'll soon be used to the idea. We're... we're really dead? All three of us? Why, of course. You died yesterday morning. You slipped and fell and hit your head. Yes. Y yes, I remember. It's taken you until now to... well, to become aware of things again. Death is a great shock, you know. But where am I? What is this place? This is the mortuary chapel at the cemetery. 
they'll be coming for your body soon to bury it. Joshua and I were killed two nights ago in an auto accident. But they aren't going to bury us until tomorrow. I never dreamed death would be like this. Why, why I can still see and hear. I can breathe. My heart still beats. Oh, not really. You're used to those things, so they let you think there hasn't been much change until you've had a chance to get over your shock. They? Who do you mean? Uh, the ones in charge. You'll know more about them soon. Uh, Mr. Benedict will be coming for us and... I expect he'll take you along, too. Mr. Benedict? Who's he? The guide. He stopped by last night just to tell us not to worry and to wait for him here. He'll take us on to... well, to the place where we go next. I... I see. Uh, shh! Someone's coming. Come, come back here, out of the way. Four men. And Jack, and Susan. Oh, they've come to take your body away to bury it. All right, men. Take it easy now. That's it. All lift together. No, no, they can't bury me. I'm not dead. I, I can't be. Jack, Susan, listen to me. It's Gregory, your uncle Gregory. They've gone. They didn't hear me. Because you're dead. The dead can't communicate with the living. It just isn't possible. But it must be. All my life I've worked to establish such communication. Now, now I have so much to tell the world. The people I've worked with. I must find some way to communicate with them. I must, I must. Are you ready? Huh? You feeling better, Mr. Raymond? This is Mr. Benedict. He's come for us. Yes, it is time. We must go. <laughs> but I can't go. I've got to tell people. The people I work with. I've worked so hard to find the truth, and now, now I... It may not be. There can be no communication. Now, Mr. Benson, Mrs. Benson. Yes, sir. It is time. Oh. Yes, Mr. Benedict, we're ready, but Mr. Raymond here is coming with us, isn't he? It is impossible. He is doomed to stay here on Earth. What do you mean? What are you saying? That is your punishment. To remain forever a spirit that moves unseen and unheard among men. It is the punishment of all who murder no. and die unrepentant and unconfessed. Oh, no. He, he's a murderer? I can't believe it. That is not for me to say. Come, we must be going. No, wait. You've got to take me with you. I, I can't stand it being here, seeing, hearing as if I were alive and not able to make anybody see or hear me. I have to go with you. I have to find out what comes next. It may not be. But you've got to take me. If I confess, if I repent, will that make a difference? It may. I cannot promise. Then I do confess. I killed my brother John. I pushed him off the cliff. I'm sorry now, but it seemed so important then that I just had to do it. You are confessing to your brother's murder? Yes, yes, I killed him. I admit it. Now take me with you. You can't leave me here. You can't. Gregory Raymond, listen to me. You're under arrest for murder. You huh? understand? Under arrest for murder. What? What are you saying? I'm dead. We're all dead. You're not dead. You're very much alive. And you're under arrest. These two people are witnesses to your confession. Now come along with me. No. No, you can't arrest me. Don't you understand? You can't arrest a dead man. And I'm dead. 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 <laughs> Was Gregory Raymond dead, or was he alive? Well, the doctor said he was alive. For you see, when his nephew found that the fall had only knocked Gregory unconscious, a strange scheme came to him. And with the aid of three coffins and three clever wax dummies that looked exactly like corpses, plus several excellent actors, he really made his uncle Gregory believe he was dead. In fact, uh, Gregory became so convinced of it that when they told him he was really alive, he wouldn't believe them. To this day, nothing can convince him he isn't really dead. <laughs> it's probably the strangest punishment a murderer ever had. Though I did know another man who... Oh, you have to go? Well, perhaps you'll drop in again soon. Just 
look for the house on the other side of the cemetery. The house of Dr. Weird. The Strange Dr. Weird. Good evening. Come in, won't you? Well, what's the matter? You seem a bit nervous. Perhaps the cemetery outside this house has upset you. But there are things far worse than cemeteries. For instance, men with murder in their hearts. As in my story tonight, a story I call The Devil's Caverns. My story, The Devil's Caverns, begins in the desolate and remote mountain country of New Mexico. It is early morning in a large hunting lodge. John Drake, the noted naturalist and explorer, is speaking to his two nephews, Victor and Paul. You two have just wasted your time coming to New Mexico to see me. I told you both a dozen times I won't increase your allowances, and that's final. But Uncle John, you can hardly expect Victor and myself to live on five thousand. Now be quiet, Paul. Uncle John has always been most generous to us. If he feels that he can't give us any more, we should be satisfied. Thank you, Victor. Hear me, it's nine o'clock, and I'm not even at work. I must leave now. Oh, you're going to those caverns you discovered in the mountains? Yes. Would you take care to come with me? No, thank you, Uncle John. Exploring caverns is hardly in our line. But you can't go back to New York without seeing the Devil's Caverns. The Devil's Caverns? (laughs) Yes, I call them that because they're so huge and dark. I imagine to anyone but a scientist like myself, the caverns would be rather terrifying. I see. Well, thanks anyway, Uncle John. Uh, Perhaps some other time. Very well. I'll see you both this evening when I return. The old fool. Worth millions and he wastes his time exploring caverns. Perhaps we made a mistake in not going to the caverns with him. What do you mean? Last night, Uncle John spoke about finding holes in the caverns. Holes hundreds of feet deep. What are you getting at? Suppose Uncle John were to accidentally fall into one of those holes. You and I would inherit his millions. Say, I hadn't thought of that. Well, I have. Yes, Paul, tomorrow you and I will accompany Uncle John into the caverns. Who knows? Perhaps he will meet with an accident. Just a little further to the entrance to the caverns. But, Uncle John, why did you make us wear leather gloves and high shoes? Well, they're for protection against the rats in Devil's Caverns. You mean the rats in there are dangerous? Oh, not really. It's just that now and then one of them will take a nip at you. Oh, oh. And then there's the bats. A most remarkable species. Now, ah, here we are. Well, you just lead the way. It was just by sheer luck that I stumbled on the entrance. Oh, it, it certainly is dark in here. Now, just a second. I'll turn on my flashlight. There. Well, I can understand now why you call these the Devil's Caverns. Something terrifying about this place. Yes, and there are others even more terrifying. Come along, I'll show them to you. Uh, Just a minute, Uncle John. What for, Paul? Paul, why in the world are you lighting a candle? I'm going to leave this candle here by the entrance. I figure we'll stop every 50 yards and leave a burning candle so we won't get lost. Yes. The candles will serve as beacons to guide us back to the entrance here. But that isn't necessary. Why, I know every inch of all the caverns by now. Nevertheless, Uncle John, we'd feel safer this way. (laughs) Very well. It'll make you feel better. Now, come along. There's so much I want to show you. If you'll come over here, boys, I'll show you one of those holes I was telling you about. Uh, We'll be there just as soon as we light another candle, Uncle John. How many candles does this make, Paul? This is the tenth candle. I figure we've come well, more than a quarter of a mile. Everything's working out perfectly. Now, look back. You can see four of the candles burning, and the other six are around that turn. Yeah. Well, come along now. We mustn't keep Uncle John waiting. Ah, there you are. Now I'm going to show you another of the wonder of these caverns. This hole I'm shining my flashlight on. Oh. Is... Oh. 
something just brushed against my foot. <laughs> that was just one of the cavern reds. They discovered we're here. Listen. Sounds like there are thousands of them. Yes, there are. Nasty little fellows, too. And our leather gloves and high shoes will protect us if they grow too bold. I hope so. Now, yesterday I measured the depth of this hole, and much to my amazement, I discovered that it's 920 feet deep. 920 feet? Well, if anyone fell in, it, uh, it'd be quite a fall. Shine your flashlight down the hole, Uncle John, so we can see what it looks like. Very hey, well. Of course, you won't be able to see the bottom, but at least you'll get an idea of how... Why are you taking my arms, boys? Well, we just want to make sure you don't fall in. Yes, Uncle John. After all, you're awfully close to the edge. Nonsense, boys. I won't fall in. Now let go of my arms so I can... Stop pushing me. What's come over you? Don't! I'll fall if you... Poor Uncle John. But then accidents will happen. Uh, Doctor, after listening to the first part of your story, don't you think some of our listeners may be a little uh, shaky? Well, I can't understand why. Uh, but if they are, I suppose we ought to suggest something to uh, bolster their confidence. Uh, Doctor, that's a good idea. And then there's nothing that gives a fellow more confidence in himself than correct attire. For that reason, may I suggest that your wardrobe include at least one of the many smart, correctly styled Adam hats. Made of lustrous all fur felt in a wide variety of soft, harmonizing shades, Adam hats are the epitome of fine quality and good taste. You'll appreciate, too, the distinctive hat bands and other important details of your Adam hat. Top off that well-dressed look, gentlemen, with an Adam hat. Now, back to Mystery and Dr. Weir. <laughs> And now I'll continue my story, The Devil's Caverns. After John Drake's death scream had faded away, only the shrill squeaking of the rats and the heavy breathing of the two men remained. For a moment, the two stood in darkness. Then Victor spoke. All right, Paul. Turn on Uncle John's flashlight and let's get out of here. Oh, I, I haven't got his flashlight. He fell in before I could take it away from him. What? You stupid fool. I might have known you'd bungle it. Now, what have we got? Wait a minute. I have my cigarette lighter, if it only works. There. It doesn't give much light, but it'll do. Oh, come on. Let's get out of here. The place gives me the creeps. Yes. Now, there's the first candle a few yards away. Come along. Victor, look. The first candle just went out. Yes. That draft probably blew it out. Candle was right over here on this rock. Oh, Victor, it's gone. Gone? Nonsense. You probably left it on another rock. Well, let's not waste time. There's, there's the second candle, 50 yards ahead. Oh, all right, but I tell you, that was a rock I left it on. And now it's gone. Oh, look. The second candle, it it seems to be moving. It's falling over. It's gone out. But that's as though someone blew it up. Don't be a fool. The third candle's beginning to flicker. It can't go out. It mustn't go out. Hurry. Oh, Victor. It has gone out. Now there aren't any candles to guide us out of here. Get hold of yourself. I've got my eye fixed on the spot where the third candle went out. Once there, we merely have to turn the bend to see the other candles. Yes, but suppose... Suppose there are two. They won't be. It's Uncle John. He's going ahead of us, blowing out the candles, so we can't escape. How could it be, Uncle John? He's dead. It's his ghost that's doing it. He's getting revenge on us for what we did. Be quiet, do you hear? Listen. The rats. That's it. They're the ones who are knocking the candles over. They're carrying them off. They, they're they hungry. They're attracted by the wax in the candles. Why are you stopping? Can't you see? The path divides into three here. Do you remember which is the way out? I don't remember these three paths at all. We must have come by the middle path. Yes, I'm sure that's the one. Come on. We're bound to find the entrance. After all the hours we've searched, we're, we're bound to. Why do you keep on saying that over and over? We're lost, and you know we are. We're never going to get out of here. Never. Uncle John, listen to that. Stop talking about Uncle John. He's dead. Dead? No, he's all around us. I can feel him. He blew out all the candles. Now he's waiting for us to die. Shut up. 
Even the rats know that we're going to die. Listen. My cigarette lighter. It's gone out. It's Uncle John. He blew it out. It, it won't work. The fuel's all gone. Paul. Paul, where are you? I'm over here. You have some matches, haven't you? Yes. Those matches are a matter of life and death. We don't dare walk in the darkness, not with all those holes around. But Paul, keep talking so I can find you. How can you find me when I'm lost? You'll never find me. Oh. Paul, what is it? Uncle oh, John. He just brushed past me. He's come to take me. Don't be a fool. It was a bat that brushed past you. No. No, it's Uncle John. He's come to take me. No. No, stay away from me. Stay away. Paul, come back. Come back here, here. It's dangerous to run like that. <laughs> Paul. He's fallen into a hole. He's gone. No, I'm all alone without any light at all. So, Uncle John, you think you've gotten the better of me. Well, you haven't, you haven't, you hear? I've got to get a hold of myself. I must. If I go to pieces, I'll never get out of here. I, I, I've got to take this thing out. There must be some way that I can... Ow! Oh, let's play. Oh, one of those rats bit me. But they're swarming all around me. Ow! Oh, I've got to fight them off. If I don't, they'll... Ow! Oh, Ow! Oh, oh, get away! Get away! Ow! Oh. Too bad of our poor Victor, wasn't it? Such a horrible way to die. For two weeks later, when a searching party entered the cabin, they found a clean white skeleton lying a few hundred yards from the entrance. Unfortunately, they were never able to find a trace of John Drake and Paul. It was as if, as if they had vanished from the face of the earth. Now, I once knew a dead man who... Would... Oh, you have to go now? Perhaps you'll drop in on me again soon. Just look for the house on the other side of the cemetery. The house of Dr. Weir. The Strange Dr. Weir. Good evening. Come in, won't you? What's the matter? You seem pale tonight. Perhaps you're working too hard. Suppose I tell you a story I've just heard that might relax you. It's about a killer who provided, prided himself on being too clever to be caught. And what happened when he met another murderer who was equally clever. I call the story... <laughs> When Killers Meet. My story begins in a small Midwestern city. It is late afternoon, and two men are crouching in the shadows of an alley in the downtown section. They are Nick Randolph, clever jewel thief, and his companion, Mike Nelson and they were being hunted by the police. Nick, listen. Those patrol cars, they're all around us. Nick, we're trapped. I'll get us out of it. Have I ever slipped up yet? No, but you did this afternoon when you plugged that jeweler. Oh, what did you have to kill him for? Because he saw me substitute that phony diamond for the real one. His testimony could have sent us to the pen for ten years. Yeah, and now he's dead. And if we are caught, we'd get the rope instead. A dead witness can't testify. And we're not going to be caught. Once we get hold of a car, I know every back road around here. I can get us onto one where they'll never dream of looking for us. Yeah? And where are we going to get a car? We're going to have one inside of one minute. Look at that guy walking this way. He's taking keys out of his pocket. He's going to unlock that car parked there at the end of the alley. Here. Here he is stopping. And it's his car, all right. Come on, follow me. I'll handle this. Okay, Nick. Oh, excuse me, sir. Yeah? What is it? <gasps> a gun. What is this, a hold-up? Not exactly. Call it an emergency borrowing. Yeah. I can't. <clears throat> All right, Mike, pick up his keys. We're on our way. Well, Mike, you getting your confidence in me back yet? <laughs> All right, Nick, I admit it. You got what it takes. I've never been caught, never been jailed, Mike. Why? Because I'm too clever. No witness has ever testified against me. I've never left a possible witness alive. See? 
Yeah. Yeah, I see, Nick. What's the next move? This road will take us out of the state in another hour. We have to go through a couple of villages, but nobody will stop us. They're not looking for us here. Besides, it'll be dark in 20 minutes. Uh, I suppose you turn on the radio. There might be some news. Okay. Just time for the news, too. Time of the invasion. And now, please, attention, everyone. Attention, everyone. Be on the lookout for two men fleeing the state in a stolen black sedan. These two men are wanted for the hold-up murder of John A. Smith in Central City this afternoon. Nick, they know about the car. Please take down this license number. K-3-7-0-1-5-4. K-3-7-0-1-5-4. That is the license number of the stolen car in which the killers are And fleeing. they got the license number too, Nick. Shut up, Mike. The owner, now in City Hospital, near death from a bullet wound, reports that the left headlight of the stolen car is burned out. So if you see a black sedan with only one headlight, report it at once to the nearest authorities. And now, back to the new... Blast the luck. I should have fed him more slugs. Then he wouldn't have done any talking. That's bad. What are we going to do now, Nick? Well, first, let's make sure about that headlight. I'll turn it on and... Yeah, the left one is burned out. Well, that means we've got to get another car or they'll nab us sure. Well, how are we going to get another buggy way out here in the country? I'll tell you how. Look, up there on top of that hill ahead of us. Huh? A bungalow with lights in the window. Here, in a car parked in the yard. That's the car we're going to get. And nobody's going to know we have it because we're going to make dead sure there isn't a living soul left in that bungalow to tell about it. Hardly two minutes later, the two men stopped their car in the driveway outside the little bungalow and stared with hard eyes toward the brightly lighted windows. Well, here we are. See anyone around? No. Everybody must be inside. What's up, Lee? We'll go up and knock, pretend we've lost our way. Get inside, then make sure we have everybody in the house spotted. And then we start blasting, huh? That's right. And this time there'll be no slip-up. Okay, let's go. Nick and Mike strode up the gravel path and knocked on the door of the bungalow. A little man, whose face was twisted by horror and remorse, opened it for them and then startled them by crying Sheriff, out. Sheriff, you're here. Thank heaven you came so quick. What the... Sheriff, what do you mean, Sheriff? Sheriff, I didn't mean to do it. I really didn't mean to do it. Nick... What's the guy talking about? Here, Sheriff, take it. Please take it. It's a poker I killed her with. A bloodstained poker. She's been nagging at me all day, telling me what a failure I was. How sorry she was she ever married me. And then I hit her. She fell and there was blood all over. Say, what is this, Nick? Mike, look. Good grief. It's a woman lying on the floor at the foot of the stairs. And there's blood all over her hair and on the floor beside her head. Yeah, don't you get it? We've stumbled onto a murder. This little punk has just killed his wife. <laughs> Uh, doctor, with all your experience, what is the first thing you notice about people? Whether they're living or dead. Well, that does make a difference, doesn't it? And you know, Doctor, I notice the same thing only with hats, not people. Some hats look alive. Some are dead. A hat that stays lively and in fine shape a long time after it's been bought will naturally make the rest of your clothes look worlds better. A colorless and dead-looking hat can kill the good effect of even the most fashionable apparel. Hats can make a difference. Gentlemen, wear a smart-looking hat that will keep its shape and help you look your best. Wear an Adam hat. They are made of fine, quality material, tailored and blocked in the latest styles. And an Adam will fit your head perfectly. You're not always tugging at the brim and adjusting the crown. Remember the name, Adam. An Adam hat does make a difference. Now, back to the strange Dr. Weird. And now I'll continue my story when killers meet. For a minute, Nick Randolph and Mike Nelson, startled by stumbling onto a murder in the very house where they had planned to eliminate all the residents and steal another getaway car, could only stare at the dead woman lying in the hall and at the little man blurting out his pitiful confession. I didn't mean to kill her. I didn't, I tell you, I didn't. Then brutally, Nick grabbed the little man and shook him. Listen to me. You hear? Listen to me. Yes, Sheriff. What's your name? 
Harry Williams. But I told you that over the phone just now when I... Yeah, I know, but now let me get this straight, Williams. Your wife's been nagging you all day. So just now you hit her with a poker, is that it? Yeah, I just couldn't stand her nagging me anymore. Something in me snapped, but I didn't mean I didn't. didn't Now, get control of yourself. You say you telephoned the sheriff 20 minutes ago? Yeah, but aren't you the sheriff? No, I'm not the sheriff. I was just passing, see? The sheriff will be here in a minute. Now, you sit down and wait for him. Wait for him? Yes, I'll stop in town to make sure that he's coming. Now, you go back in and sit down. Go back and sit down? Yes, yes, that's right. All right, did you say so? Nick, what is this? Don't you understand? This guy's a murderer. The sheriff and his deputies will be here any second. We've got to get away from this place, but fast. <laughs> But, Nick, I still don't get it. Why didn't we bump him off? Why didn't we even take his car? Because we didn't have the time, you dummy. Don't you see he'd committed a murder? He'd sent for the cops. If we'd hung around even a minute more, we might have bumped into him. Yeah, and that's the last thing we want to do now, to bump into any cops. As it is with the sheriff hustling out there to pick up this Williams guy, he won't be thinking of us. We can get into the next town, maybe pick up another car there. But the one place we had to get away from fast was that house back there with that dead woman in it. Sure, I see that now. And Nick, if I... Nick, look, down the road. A car pulled right across the road. And a bunch of guys with rifles. A trap. Well, we're not stopping. We're not going to be caught. Yeah, what are we going to do? I'll swing it around and I'll hit the ditch. Hold on, here we go. Nick, Nick, they're shooting at us. Well, hang on, we're going to make it. No, 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 Nick, that's me. We're going to hit it. A few minutes later, the local sheriff was interviewing little Harry Williams, whose murder of his wife had thrown such a monkey wrench into Nick Randolph's plans. Now, Mr. Williams, I'd like to get this whole story straight, if you don't mind. Well, you see, Sheriff, I was sitting here in the living room with Nancy, that's my wife, listening to the radio, when the broadcast came on warning everybody to watch for the two men in the sedan with one burned-out headlight. Yeah? And that instant, I happened to look out the window there. Way down the road, I saw the single headlight of a car blink on for a moment. I get you. Go on, Mr. Williams. Well, I realized it must be the two killers in that car. And I knew they might decide to stop and take my car. Now, if they did, I was sure they'd kill both Nancy and myself so we couldn't warn anybody. Right. Why they didn't do it, I still don't know. Well, you see, Sheriff, it's like this. Uh, Nancy is recovering from a broken leg, so we couldn't run out of the house and hide. Yeah? Yet, if we stayed here, the two killers might murder us. I had to think fast because it was a very tight spot. (laughs) I'll say it was. So I quickly carried Nancy out and put her down on the hall floor. I told her to play dead. Then I emptied a a bottle of ketchup on the floor in her hair to look like blood. Now, when those two killers knocked on the door half a minute later, I opened it and pretended to be a man who had just killed his wife in a sudden rage. Holy smoke. Yeah, I told him I just murdered Nancy and phoned you to come at once. They thought Nancy was really dead and that you and your men were actually on the way. So they turned right around and got away from here just as fast as they could. Well, I'll be darned. You see, I I figured to myself, when a killer is trying to escape, the one individual he most wants to avoid is another murderer whom the police are closing in on. Yeah? They were so anxious to give me a wide berth that they never even touched me. As soon as they left, I phoned you. You set the trap for them. Yeah, well, I, I guess everything worked out pretty well. Why, oh, it worked out perfect. Say, Williams, with an imagination like yours, you ought to be a detective story writer. <clears throat> well, uh, to tell you the truth, Sheriff, <laughs> that's just what I am. So that's what happens when one killer meets another. He gives him as wide a berth as possible. Only, of course, poor Nick was fooled. Harry Williams wasn't really a murderer at all. Now, what would have happened if, instead of being just a make-believe killer, little uh, Harry had uh, really been the real thing? Do you suppose that... uh... Oh, you're leaving now. I'm sorry. I hope you'll drop in again soon. Just look for the house on the other side of the cemetery. The house of Dr. Weir. The Strange Dr. Weir. Good 
Good evening. Come in, won't you? Well, what's the matter? You seem a bit nervous. Perhaps the cemetery outside this house has upset you. But there are things far worse than cemeteries. For instance, being lost in a wilderness. A wilderness where death is never more than a few inches away. As in the story I want to tell you tonight. A story I call Dead Man's Paradise. My story begins in the wild and desolate swamplands near the mouth of the Mississippi River. In a small Cajun shack, all but hidden by the overhanging cypress trees, Andre Morel speaks to his son, Paul. <coughs> Paul, the sun has been up for an hour already. You must see to our traps. Yeah, but, Father, you're ill. I don't like leaving you here alone. I'll be all right. <coughs> No, please, tend to the traps. Very well, Father. I'll be back just as soon as I... Take him up, over here. Uh-huh. Who, who are you? What do you want? You'll find out soon enough, old man. Do get that rifle of theirs over the fireplace. Okay. Well, you must be the two bank robbers the radio was warning everyone about. That's right, bright boy. Now every cop in Louisiana is looking for us. How far are we from New Orleans? Forty miles. Forty miles, huh? Well, you're taking us there in your boat. But we lend our boat to Pierre Duvel... Besides, no boat can get through swamps. Hey, Ace, what are we going to do? We figured on sailing right through to New Orleans with no trouble at all. Yeah, we'll have to make it on foot, that's all. These Cajuns know every inch of the swamp, so Bright Boy here will guide us. No, no, it's impossible. Well, you must. He will kill you if you do not do as he asks. That's right, kid. Your old man's talking sense. But you don't know the swamps. We must travel by narrow Indian trails through bad stretches of quicksand where a single misstep means death. It can't be that bad. Why, on my road map, this region is listed as Paradise Swamp. Yes, but the old name, the name the Indians gave it, was Dead Man's Paradise. Because no stranger who ever entered it came out alive. There's the quicksand, pools of it, waiting to trap strangers. And there are the insects, the mosquitoes that drive men mad. <laughs> there are the birds, whose shrieks sound like the screams of dying men. Hey, listen to that. That's a lot of malarkey. Right, boy, here's going to guide us, and that's that. But I can't leave my father here alone. Can't you see he's ill? I don't want to leave him alone any more than you do. He might talk. So I'm going to see to it that none of us have to worry about him anymore. What do you mean? Just this. Father! You... You've killed him. Yeah. And that's what's going to happen to you if you don't do exactly as I tell you. Now let's get started. I want to be in New Orleans by tomorrow night. Welcome for seven hours now, Ace. How far yeah. do you figure we've come? Hey, bright boy. How far we come since this morning? Ten miles. Ten miles? Hey, that ain't bad. Hey, Ace, what's that? That's just a bird, not a ghost. Pull yourself together, Duke. There's nothing to be scared of. Just trees, underbrush, and swamp pools. Yeah, yeah, I know, but everywhere you turn, everything looks the same. Yeah. If we didn't have that Cajun kid to guide us. Hey, look, the huh? kid's trying to give us a slip. Oh, he is, is he? Well, this will teach him. Ace, you hit him. Yeah, I could hardly miss him at this distance. Come on. Should have kept a closer watch on him. Might have known he'd try something like this. Ah. Well, here he is. Yeah, his head's all covered with blood. He's dead, all right. Yeah. You never know what hit him. Yeah, but Ace, what are we going to do now without the kid to guide us? Well, we'll just have to go on the rest of the way by ourselves. But how we find our way every way you turn is nothing but swamp. We can't go on without a guide. Get hold of yourself, you fool. If you lose your head, you're done for. Yeah, but Ace, what chance we... Shut got? up, will you? Listen to what I have to say. Now, by keeping our eyes on the sun and doing a little figuring, we can keep going in the right direction. As for the quicksand, well, we'll just have to watch our step. Just keep saying one thing to yourself. New Orleans is only 30 miles away, and we're going to make it. Uh, Doctor, may I comment upon the verisimilitude demonstrated by the introductory sections of your dramatic effort? Explain yourself, young man. Your story, its design is excellent. Such fine style and expert handling of details. And you know, Doctor, it's those very same qualities that make Adam Hat so outstanding, too. That's because the designs for Adam Hats are created by experts in their field. 
The smart styles and carefully handled detail you see in every atom is the product of years of experience. And just as each listener will find a different shade of meaning in a story, so will every man find the shade of color he prefers in the large selection of Adam hats. Gentlemen, there's only one logical conclusion to this story about Adam hats. Buy one for yourself. An Adam hat has character. Now, back to Dr. Weird's story. And now I'll continue my story, Dead Man's Paradise. Five hours have passed. Five hours of nightmare for Ace and Duke. The shadowy cypress trees and underbrush seemed to become thicker every mile they pushed on. And they were constantly forced to detour around swamp pools and lakes, ever mindful of the treacherous quicksands they must avoid. Uh, How far you think we've come, Ace, since we left that cage, kid? Uh, about four or five miles, I guess. Well, look, the sun's going down. It'll be dark before long. What do we do now? Uh, we'll stop pretty soon and wait for dawn. In the morning, we'll push on. Uh, Neither of you will ever get out of these swamps alive. Uh, did you hear that? Yeah, that sounded like... You have committed murder, and you must... Hey, 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 it's the voice of that Cajun kid. No, no, it can't be. I knocked him off. It's the voice of his ghost, that's what it is. Ah, oh, don't be a fool. The ones who have died in the swamps, say you too must die. Hey, you see, I told you he's come back to get us. Both of you will die in the quicksand. Only 20 feet ahead of you is a pool of quicksand. Hey, you see, you hear that? There's quicksand. Ah, oh, don't be a fool, I tell you. You really think this quicksand ahead he'd warn us? Just a trick to get us to walk in another direction where the quicksand really is. Uh, yes, I, I guess you're right. I sure I am. Now keep going straight ahead. Oh, okay. We've still got an hour or so until it gets too dark to travel. we got to make the most of it. Yeah, yeah, but just the same way you think. Hey, hey, what's wrong? I stepped into some quicksand. Ace, help me. I'm sick. Uh, Duke, try crawling out. I can't. It keeps sinking deeper. Hey, hey, help me. No, if I only had a rope or something. Wait till I look around. No, no, don't leave me. Look, how can I help hey, you? Hey, you're sucking me down. It's already up to my chest. Give me a hand and pull me out, will you? I can't do that. You'd pull me in with you. Why, do something. There's nothing I can do without a rope. No, there must be. Hey, don't let me die like this. Help me, will you? There's only one thing I can do for you, Duke. And this is it. Uh, Duke. He, he's dead. Yeah. He's paid. For his crime. Now it is your crime. No. No, you may have gotten Duke. But you won't get me. You won't get me. With an effort, Ace pulled himself together, determined not to suffer Duke's fate. Taking a bearing from the twilight rays of the sun, Ace continued on his way, cautiously scanning the ground before him. Time and time again, the voice of the Cajun boy came echoing through the swamps, mocking Ace's efforts to escape, telling him of the quicksand that lay waiting on every side. There's no escape for you. Just ahead of you lies quicksand. And you are going to die in it. Shut up! Shut up, you hear? Death is waiting for you. In the quicksand ahead. Maybe this will keep you quiet. <laughs> you should have saved one bullet for yourself. Be quiet. Be quiet, you hear? You're dead. You can't talk. You seem confused now. Is the quicksand ahead of you? <laughs> to the left? <laughs> to the right? <laughs> if I were you, I'd turn to the left. Oh, trying to outsmart me, aren't you? Well, you can't. I'm going straight ahead. <laughs> You're making a mistake. There is quicksand just ahead. If it was, you wouldn't be telling me. I know better than to... Uh, I'm caught. It is quicksand. I'm sinking. Yes. Uh, it's quicksand. 
And in a minute, you will sink beneath the surface. Then your crimes will be paid for. You... You're... You're not dead. You're alive. I didn't kill it. No. That bullet you fired at me only creased my scalp. Knocked me unconscious. I recovered in time to trail you. Get my revenge. Oh, don't stand there. Get me out of here. I'll confess to anything. Only get me out of here. Why should I help you? You killed my father. No! This is the same pool of quicksand that Duke died in. And now you're going to join him. No, no. You've been wandering around in circles for hours. But I knew you'd end up here. No, no. Oh, don't let me die. Don't let me die. Now, the quicksand is up to your neck now. In a minute, it will reach your mouth. And then, it'll be all over. Save me. I, I don't want to die. No, my father didn't want to die either. But you killed him. Help me. You, you must help me. Nobody can help you now. Don't no, let me die. I'm sorry I didn't have a chance to tell you that this is the only quicksand hole in all the swamp between here and New Orleans. <laughs> Grace had only known there was just one pool of quicksand. He might have reached New Orleans. But you see, he let his imagination run wild, envisioned death on all sides. No wonder he traveled in circles and ended up dead. I know another case where... Oh, you have to go now? Too bad. But perhaps you'll drop in on me again soon. I'm always home. Just look for the house on the other side of the cemetery, the house of Dr. Weir. The Strange Dr. Weir. Good evening. Come in, won't you? Why, what's the matter? Your hand is shaking. Surely you're not afraid of me. Uh, perhaps it would steady you to hear a little story that was just told to me. The story of a strange ship that sails the seven seas with no crew save death and no passengers except the dead. I call the story The Ghost Ship. My story, The Ghost Ship, begins in a badly battered lifeboat, pitching and tossing on the surface of the South Atlantic. Three men wearily bail out the water which the breaking waves constantly pour into the boat. A fourth man, burly and broad-shouldered, is at the tiller. All right, bailer, man, bailer. The water's gaining on us. What's the use of bailing? We'll never make land. Why don't we admit we're done for and get it over with? Stow that, bosun. We may sight a ship any minute. You've been saying that every day for a week, man. Captain, Captain! Yeah, what is it, Cook? Hey, Tank, it's a ship. You snow it's here. They're to port. All right, look sharp, man. Oh, I don't see anything. Just another false alarm. No, no, it's not. Captain Arce, you're... Uh, it's a small steamer heading this way. Yeah, yeah, I can make her out now. She's heading straight for us. It's a ship, all right. But she looks mighty funny. Look how low she is in the water. See the way she steers. She does kind of stagger back and forth. Maybe her steering gear broke. And there's no smoke from her funnels either. If you ask me, she's a derelict. Well, maybe she is. Even a derelict is better than this lifeboat. The wind's carrying across our cords. And we're going to board her. Half an hour later, the lifeboat rubbed against the side of the strange ship. The four hungry, weary men clambered aboard her and found themselves greeted only by the uncanny silence of a deserted ship. See? What did I tell you? This thing is a derelict, a blooming derelict. Yeah, she's a derelict, all right. Look at her ironwork, covered with rust. I'd say she's been drifting about for a good many months. Suppose there'd be no grub or water aboard her. That's what worries me. Now, that's what we're going to find out right now. 
Cook and I'll search the starboard side of the ship. You other two search the port side. Look lively now. We'll meet in the chart room in 30 minutes. All right, bosun, what did you find? Uh, we didn't find nothing. Not a single solitary thing. That's all right, Captain. Of course, we're so low in the water that all the holes in the cabins below deck are half flooded. But we searched everything else, and we didn't find a thing. Well, Cook and I had better luck. We found the galley dry and plenty of canned grub in it. I left Cook rustling up some chow. He'll be bringing us a hot meal any minute now. Hot food, doggone. That's what I was wanting to hear. What I want to know is why was this freighter abandoned? That's it. What? What? This is the mermaid girl. What? Yes. There's a name on the logbook. She's a ghost ship. Do you hear me? We come aboard a ghost ship. We've got to get off her or we'll die. Most and get hold of yourself, well, will you? Well, it's true. This is the mermaid girl. And every seaman in the world knows about it. Well, sir, I don't. Captain, what is this here mermaid girl business? Well, about? the story of the mermaid girl is a curious one. Two years ago, she had her hell stove in in a hurricane, but she's loaded with lumber and cork which is why she never sunk. Well, the first night out after the storm, one of the crew disappeared. The next night, two more men went, and two more the night after. I'm telling this, Bosun. It's true, every word of it. It's true, the men disappeared. The rest of the crew mutinied and abandoned ship. Only one lifeboat with five men in it ever made port. They're the ones who spread the story. And ever since then, the mermaid girl's been drifting. A ghost ship with death at the helm. I tell you, we've got to get off her, or we'll die too. Captain! Captain! That's a cook! <laughs> Quick, outside, something's happened to him. <laughs> Captain! Look! There on the deck, a tray, dishes and food. Cook was bringing us grub, and now he's. he's vanished. <laughs> Say, Doctor, do you know you've been on the air for 25 weeks now? Evidently, uh, people like your radio show. That makes me very happy. And I thank them uh, from the bottom of my uh, cold-blooded heart. Coming from you, Doctor, that's really warm sentiment. And while we're about it, the makers of Adam Hats would like to thank the many men who have recognized the superiority of Adam Hats this season. Gentlemen, you've been keeping our thousands of stores and authorized dealers mighty busy. And no wonder, wide varieties in 100% correct styles combined with finest quality materials and craftsmanship make Adam Hats America's outstanding hat value. The well-dressed man particularly appreciates the wide choice of shapes and shades available at their Adam Hat store. Tomorrow, step into the Adam Hat store nearest you and ask to see the new line of Adam Hats, priced sensibly from three forty-five to ten dollars. Now, Doctor Weird, on with the show. And now to continue my story, the ghost ship. It is night, and in the inky darkness, half submerged, the derelict steamship Mermaid Girl drifts onward across the wave-tossed surface of the South Atlantic. Huddled in the chart room, with two flickering lanterns for light. The three shipwreck survivors discuss the strange disappearance of the cook, the fourth member of their group. I tell you, the spook got him. Or the devil or whatever it is that's put a curse on this ship. It takes more than a spook to make a grown man vanish without trace, bosun. The sea's different from the land. There's devils that haunt the ocean no land lover can know about. You've heard of the Flying Dutchman, haven't you, Tex? Uh Uh-huh. Reckon I have. What about her? For a hundred years or more. Manned by phantoms, she's been sailing the seven seas, full rigged and always running with the storm dead astern. The devils of the sea put a curse on her, and so the Flying Dutchman will sail on forever. The Flying Dutchman is just a sailor superstition, bosun. You know it. And I suppose this ship we're on now is just a superstition, too. And the fact that she's been drifting for two years with no end at her realm, I tell you, we've got to get off her, or else we'll die. We can't get off her. Our lifeboat swung when we came aboard. So stow that kind of talk, Bosun. That's what I say, too. I don't believe in spooks or devils. Fact is, I got me a notion to go down to the galley right now and rustle up some grub. You want the same thing that happened to the cook to happen to you? Oh, nothing happened to me. Captain, you got an extra revolver in your pocket? Yeah. Well, now, just you let me take it and I'll face anything to get me some grub. 
Watch three days since we had food, and I'm too hungry to wait for morning. All right, here's the extra gun. It has three shells in it. And take this lantern, but look sharp. I'll do that, Captain. And I'll bring back whatever I can carry. Good. And if I meet any spooks, I'll bring them back, too. You shouldn't have let him go, Captain. He'll be all right with a light and a gun. We don't need food. You'll see, Captain. This ship's a ghost ship. And... Here, listen. Come on, we gotta go to his... No! Captain, it's too late. It's got him, whatever it is that's on in this ship. And if we got out there now, it'll get us, too. All night, the two men huddled in the chart room, the doors bolted, the memory of Texas screams ringing in their ears. In the morning, with a fog covering the sea, they cautiously emerged and searched the ship, the captain keeping his revolver always ready. And they found... Nothing. That's what we found, Captain. Nothing but a smashed lantern and the empty gun line on the deck where Texas dropped them. Well, frankly, I think Tex and the cook went out of their heads and jumped overboard. There's absolutely nothing on this ship that could have harmed them. But there is. Only it's something you can't see unless it wants you to see it. Ah, oh, that's ridiculous. Bosa, listen to me. I tell you that... Wait. What is it? Listen. What is it, Sharp? It's a foghorn. It's a steamship someplace in the fog off the starboard of us. Set in this way. But you'll never see us. Look how fast the fog's thickening. Yeah, yeah, we gotta work fast. There's a hand-operated foghorn up in the bow of this vessel. Get up forward and start sounding it. I'll hunt for distress rockets. We've got to attract attention before that ship gets too far away. Aye, aye, sir. I'll signal an SOS with the oars. Good man. Oh, she's passing the stern of us. Blast this fog. If it hadn't thickened up so fast, we'd have been sighted. Yeah, what is it, Boston? Captain, he's on me! He's dragging me to all the old captain! Help! Help! I'm coming, Boston! Ah! Boston! Boston! Boston, where are you? Oh, captain! Captain! Down here! In the hole! Help me! In the hole? Boston! What's happened? Captain, it's... It's an octopus! What? A giant octopus! It's got me down here in the hole! A tentacle caught me. You know, you know, about pulled me in. An octopus. So that's it. That's the devil that's been haunting this ship. I can see it, Boston. Just under the water. I'm going to try and shoot it. All right, the devil, take that. And that. And that. You're me up It's going to... Ah, my gun's empty. I've got a... A tentacle. A giant tentacle around my legs. I can't get loose. It's pulling me down into the hole, too. If I can only... I can't. Uh, uh, help. Under the shipwrecked sailors who boarded the mermaid girl could find nothing. The devil who haunted her was an underwater devil whose presence they couldn't guess. And so the mermaid girl still drifts on across the seven seas with death in the shape of a giant octopus, her captain, and dead men, her only crew. Oh, perhaps someday... Oh, you have to go now. But I do hope you'll drop in again soon. Just look for the house on the other side of the cemetery. The house of Dr. Weir. The Strange Dr. Weird. Good evening. Come in, won't you? What's the matter? You seem a bit nervous. Perhaps if I told you a story, it might help calm your nerves. A story, say, about a man who found a new and amazing way 
hiding from the police. I call the story The Man Who Played Dead. My story, The Man Who Played Dead, begins in the dimly lighted interior of a strange room in a big amusement park. The room is a waxworks museum known as the Chamber of Horrors, and wax figures of history's most diabolical murderers stand motionless all about it. The only living figure is the proprietor, Pop Molloy, who moves slowly from dummy to dummy, dusting them in preparation for the big spring opening. As Pop approaches a figure in a dark corner, the figure unexpectedly speaks to him. All right, Pop, <gasps> put up your hands. Hey, Morgan. Burke Morgan. Yes, Morgan, and not a dummy either. But I don't understand. You were in prison. You're supposed to go to the electric chair tonight. I was supposed to, but I broke out, see, after they had me all prepared for the hot seat. Well, what do you want here? Just to hide for a while. The cops are right behind me, so since this is the only place in the park open, I slipped in ten minutes ago when your back was turned. There's no place to hide here. There's just this one big room. No arguments. You go ahead of me while I look around. All right, look around. Say there's no place to hide at all. I'll find one. Hey, these three dummies here. They look like my old partners. Joe Norton, Marty Phillips, Tony Benson. Yes, Bert, that's who they're supposed to be. The ones you shot in the back last year. What do you got them standing around this phony electric chair for? Well, you see, to, tomorrow I was going to make up a dummy of you, Bert, and, and sit it in that electric chair. Then I was going to put up a sign saying, Execution of Burke Morgan on the night of May 1st, 1944, as his murdered partners look on. Why, you... Don't you like it? <laughs> You're a little previous, Pop. I'm not sitting in any hot seat tonight. No, I guess not. It was a cute idea, though. Too cute. Hey, their faces seem to shine in the dark. What causes that? Well, you see, I painted them with phosphorus paint. The idea was the lights would be turned down low and the customers would see the faces shining in the darkness the way they do now, as if they were ghosts. Give the yokels a big cake. Uh, Somebody at the door. It's an officer. He's coming in. Hey, Pop! Pop, where are Listen, Pop. I'm going to stand right here, absolutely still in the shadows here, like a dummy. You get rid of him. If he spots me, I'll plug in. Get it? Yeah, yeah, I get it. Hey, Pop, are you there? Hey, come in. Oh, it's you, Flanagan. Yeah. Say, Pop, did you know that Burke Morgan's on the loose? Oh, is he? Yeah, and he's someplace in this park. Somebody smuggled him a big shot of cocaine and a gun at the prison, and he blasted his way out an hour ago. Oh, that's bad. Oh, I'll say it's bad, but we'll get him. Orders are to shoot on sight. And I'm the... Hey, Pop. What is it? That dummy back there. Huh? It moved just now. No, no, it couldn't have. I saw it move. I'm going to have a look at that dummy. He's trying to get away. Don't, don't. All right, copper, you <laughs> short. Oh. You, you've killed him. Yeah. Well, if you want to stay alive, you better listen fast. There'll be more cops here in a second. But they won't find me because I'm going to hide right out in plain sight. They're pretending to be myself. What do you mean? I'm hiding right here in this little imitation electric chair of yours. See? I'm going to play the part of a dummy again. I'm going to pretend to be myself in the great electrocution of Bert Morgan. Oh, oh, I see. This time I won't move either, because I'll be sitting down. There they are at the door. Yell to them to come in. And don't forget, I've got a loaded gun right here beside me. Stay close to me or I'll let you have it. And make it good, Pop. Make it awful good. Dr. Weird, I'm breathless. You mean the beginning of my story as you excited? Well, yes, but it isn't only your story that leaves me breathless, Doctor. It's those Adam hats so many men are wearing this season. Gentlemen, I honestly doubt whether you'll see hats with more distinctive styles, fine quality material, and bright jaunty shades. They're like a new breath of life. And such variety. Gentlemen, you'll find most every shape and model in the new hats now on display at the thousands of Adam hat stores and authorized dealers from coast to coast. So get into the swing of things. Buy your new Adam tomorrow. Now, back to Dr. Weird. And now I'll continue my story, The Man Who Played Dead. With Burke Morgan hiding in plain sight by pretending to be a wax dummy, the three policemen who had come running at the sound of the shots were completely deceived. And Pop told them 
that the dead officer on the floor was just another wax dummy, and they believed him. After warning him to be on the alert, they left. And Burke Morgan chuckled as the door closed behind them. <laughs> Good work, Pop. But you're not through yet. What do you mean? Oh, look at that squad car. They parked right outside the door. If I even get out of this chair, the driver can look right in and see me. Hey, I guess that's right. He can. Well, since this is the only place I have to hide, I'm going to sit right here until the search is over. You're the boss, Morgan. You bet I am. And you sit down right there. Okay. Now, I'm going to sit here, and you're going to sit there until they give up hunting for me. If they come in again, stall me. If you try to move without permission, I'll blast you. I won't move. I don't want to die. Well, that's being smart. Pop, you haven't got a shot of dope on you, have you? No, Morgan. What's the matter? Nerves getting jumpy? None of your business. Now settle down. we got some waiting to do. <laughs> Two men settled themselves to wait. Burke Morgan sat in rigid silence, ever alert for the return of the police. Half an hour passed, then an hour. His taut nerves cried aloud for the drug they craved. His muscles twitched. Two hours passed, and Burke Morgan's tortured nerves were screaming. The three waxen faces which Pop Malloy had covered with phosphorus paint glowed in a ghostly fashion before his eyes. And then Burke Morgan, Burke Morgan thought he heard an eerie voice speak to him. Burke. Burke Morgan. Pop. Pop Malloy, did you say something? No. Now Pop's asleep. It's just my nerves. I need... Burke. Burke Morgan. Who's that? Who said my name then? I did, Burke. Your old pal, Joe Norton. Norton. Norton's dead. I killed him. It's my nerves. This spooky room, those faces. I've got to get a grip on myself. Tony Phillips is here too, Burke. No. Tony's dead too. I'm not hearing anything. I'm not. What do you know, Norton? He doesn't know us. He doesn't recognize his old pals. He killed us and now he won't even speak to us. Look at us, Burke, standing here in front of you. Don't you recognize us now? No. You're dead. You're just wax dummies. You're not real. But how can we be talking to you if you weren't real? You're not talking to me. Just my nerves. Just my nerves, that's all. Go away. But we're never going away, Burke. We're waiting for you to die. Then you'll be with us again. No, I don't believe it. This is Pop Malloy's Waxworks Museum, and you're... You're all just three wax dummies. Maybe, Burke, but did you ever hear a wax dummy talk before? Oh. Now that you've seen us and heard us, Burke, you'll always see it. No. no matter where you go. You'll always no. know we're with you, waiting for you to die. No. Waiting for you to die. No, thought no. thought of us a lot lately, haven't you? No. You had nightmares about us. You were no. worrying about what would happen after you die. And now you know that we'll be waiting for you. No, get away from me. You killed us once to be rid of us, but now you can never be rid of us again. No. Never. <laughs> never. Never. I can. I'll show you. Never. I'll show you. Take that, take that, take that. Now, go away, because I've killed you. I've killed you, do you hear? I've... Oh. So you see, Lieutenant, Burke Morgan was covering me with a gun the whole time. I knew he'd shoot if I made a move, so I pretended to be asleep and, and awake. I could see his nerves were jumpy because he wanted more cocaine, and I... Figured that maybe with the dummies of the pals he murdered standing there and looking like ghosts, he might crack. Mm, I see. I had just about given up hope, though, when he started talking out loud, as if he could hear those dummies talking to him. And all at once, he lost control of himself and emptied his gun at him. Then I ran for the door. Yeah, mm. Lieutenant. As soon as I heard the shots and pop yell, I come busting in. And you know, Burke Morgan had fainted. Mm. Yeah, fainted dead away there in that fake electric chair. So I handcuffed him, and there he is. Not even come to yet. Uh, I see. Well, I'd hate to have to sit here myself looking at those three green faces glowing in front of me. Not surprised Morgan cracked. Uh, me neither. The green faces on them three dummies give me the creeps. And my conscience ain't bothering me either. Well, anyway, I'm glad we've caught him. 
Now I can go ahead with my plans for my exhibit. Hmm? <laughs> you know, execution of Burke Morgan as his murdered partners look on. Oh. Yeah, I wouldn't want to waste all that phosphorescent paint of yours. Mm, that's one way of looking at it. Well, we'll take him away now. Hey, Pop. Pop, come here. Yes, Lieutenant? Well, it looks like you're going to have even a bigger thing in this exhibit of yours than you ever figured on. I don't understand, Lieutenant. What do you mean? I mean that Burke Morgan's fright when he thought those dummies were talking to him was too much for his drug-weakened heart. Look at him. He hasn't fainted. He's huh? dead. What? Dead in the electric chair. And right on schedule. <laughs> Burke Morgan died in the electric chair, just as the law said he would. Apparently, fate had decreed that he was to die that way, and nothing he could do could change it. But then, waxworks museums are rather frightening places, even when you haven't got a lot of murders on your conscience. I remember a perfectly innocent young man who got locked in one, and in the morning he... Oh, you have to go now. Well, perhaps you'll drop in again soon. Just look for the house on the other side of the cemetery. The house of Dr. Weir. Adam Pat presents... Outside my house, this has upset you. Uh, speaking of cemeteries, reminds me of a story I want to tell you. A strange murder and a strange burial. The strangest ever known. I call the story Murder One Million B.C. In a spirit of reverence, we of Adam Hatt join our fellow Americans and allies everywhere in a tribute of humble gratitude to the brave men and women in our armed forces. Let us pray that they who have brought us so far along the road to freedom have not sacrificed in vain. And finally, let us hope that the end is near, that Japan will soon be defeated, and that our men and women overseas will return to a safe home in a peaceful world. And now for the story on tonight's Adam Hat program as told by Dr. Weir. My story, Murder One Million B.C., begins in a house on the outskirts of a small city in New Mexico, the home of Professor Timothy Jordan, a renowned scientist, inside his laboratory, engaged upon a mysterious experiment. In the living room, his wife, Florence, and his financial advisor, Harry Smith, confer with each other apprehensively. But, Flo, you say you don't know why Timothy asked me to be here at 11 this morning? No, Harry, I haven't any idea. I'm sure he doesn't suspect anything about us. It must be about his money. Money? What do you mean? Well, you know, I've been handling all his business affairs for the last two years. Yes? Well, a lot of money's been coming in from those new x-ray machines he invented. So much that I didn't think he'd miss a little of it. You mean you've been taking it? Well, just Borrowing some of it for some investment that'll make me rich. Harry! Finds out I'm sunk. Send me to jail. Will, too. What are you going to do? I don't know, but if you were only out of the way, it could be you and me together always. Be careful. Here he comes. Oh, Harry! Is that you? Uh, yes, Tim. Um, Harry just got here. Oh, good, good. Excellent. Harry Flo. I'm about to show you the most amazing thing science has ever achieved. What do you mean, Tim? <laughs> I'm going to show you why I've had to ask you for all that money lately and why I'll need another 100000 immediately. Another? Come along, both of you, in here in my laboratory. Tim, what's this all about? Tim, 
darling, this room, all this machinery. What have you been doing in here? Suppose I told you that I've been building a time machine. A time machine? Yes, yes. Look, both of you. You see this big archway of white? A doorway that leads back into the unknown past as far as the year 1 million B.C. Tim, you're not serious. I'm perfectly serious. All I have to do is to close this switch. Now, watch. The archway. Uh, it seems to be getting all misty. Yes. That's a sign the current flowing through the, these coils is opening a hole into the past. A hole we can step through as if it were a doorway. Now come, follow me, and in ten seconds, you'll find yourself on this earth as it was a million years ago. <laughs> Startled, Harry and Florence saw Professor Jordan step into the amazing machine he had built and vanish. Then fearfully, they followed him and abruptly found themselves standing at his side on hot, dry desert sand. A brilliant sun burned in the sky overhead and strange birds flew through the air above them. Half a mile away to their left lay a vast body of water in which Monstrous, nightmarish creatures were flashing. Harry and Florence stared about them as if they could not believe their eyes. Tim! Tim, is this real? This is New Mexico, as it was a million years ago. Tim, I don't know what to say. Well, I just can't believe it. The past. We've come a million years into the past. And just by stepping back the way we came... We'll be in the present again, in my laboratory, in the year 1940 A.D. Think what that means. Think of being able to watch the burning of Rome, see Columbus discover America, view the signing of the Declaration of Independence. But it'll all be possible as soon as I can get more radium. More radium? Yes, radium provides the power my time machine needs. That's why I have to have $100,000 at once, Harry. Yes, I see. Uh, excuse me, Tim, this... Huh? Oh, Stone? Oh, that, that's just sandstone covered with clay. Well, Harry, uh, about the money. There isn't any money. No money? What do you mean? Just what I say. You've stolen it. Embezzled it. You'll go to jail, do you hear? I'll send you to the jail if it's the last thing I oh, do. Oh, no, you won't. No, Harry, don't! Oh. Oh. His head, it's all crushed in. I had to kill him. It was that or go to jail? Oh, well, what are we going to do? I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to bury him right here. But his body, it may be found. And then... Oh, listen, don't you understand? This is a world a million years in the past. We'll bury him at the year in the sand and step back through the time machine into the laboratory. When we get there, he'll have been dead for a million years. Don't you see? He'll have been dead and buried for a million years. And there won't be any body left to be found. There won't be any evidence at all. <laughs> After Harry had struck down Professor Jordan, he and Flo hastily dug a deep grave in the sand with their hand. They put the body and the blood-stained rock into this grave and covered both with sand. Then hastily they stepped back through the time machine into the laboratory and partly dismantled the machine so no one else could stumble on the secret. Then, after waiting, they announced Professor Jordan's disappearance. Everything went just as Harry planned. It was true that uh, Inspector Leroy of the local police department seemed a little uh, suspicious of Professor Jordan's disappearance. But, of course, he had no evidence. So in due time, Harry and Flo were married. As they were returning from a long honeymoon, Harry said, Flo, I've been thinking about that time machine of Timothy's. What about it, Harry? That machine can make me the richest man on earth. For example, suppose I took it to New York and used it to go back a hundred years. Then suppose I bought up all the land where Times Square now Harry! Is. What is it? This clipping Grace Miller sent me. I just opened her letter and... Look at it. Let me see. Bones of ancient man found near residence of late Professor Jordan. While excavating for Highway 37, workmen today found fragments of the skeleton of an ancient man buried in a formation of sand and rock. 
Robert Thompson, state geologist, states geological formation indicates the bones between 500,000 and a million years old have been preserved by the extreme dryness of the soil. The great interest of scientists was the fact that a rock found beside the crushed in skull of the skeleton was apparently the weapon with which the prehistoric man was killed. Timothy's bones. And the rock you killed him with. Harry, you said there wouldn't be any evidence left after a million years. We have nothing to worry about. Even if they did find a few old bones. Just the same, Harry. Let's not go back home. Let's get off the train. Turn around. Go someplace far away. That's absurd. In the first place, it would look suspicious if we didn't go back. In the second place, we've got to go back to get that time machine. Because it's going to make me the richest man in the world. <laughs> Harry succeeded in calming Florence's fears, and next morning they arrived home. They were having breakfast when an unannounced caller, Inspector Leroy, walked in. Uh, good morning, folks. Welcome home. What's the idea of barging in like this, Inspector? Uh, Mrs. Smith, uh, do you recognize this locket which was found and turned into the police department? Locket? Why, that's my gold locket that's been missing for months. But what happened to it? It's a worn and scratch. Looks a million years old. Yes, doesn't it? Oh. And we found an inscription inside as good as new, indicating your former husband gave it to you for a birthday present. All right, so it's Florence's locket. So what? As a matter of fact, I want to talk to you about that skeleton which was found out back of this house last week. You know about it, I suppose. Yes, we know about it. So what? It was a very interesting skeleton, Mr. Smith. A million years old, the scientists say. But this locket was found lying underneath it. Oh, no. What? It's impossible. Another thing about that skeleton, which is puzzling the scientists, it has gold fillings in its teeth. Gold fillings Professor Jordan's dentist identifies as fillings he put into the professor's teeth himself. Oh, Harry. You're crazy. No, it's the scientists who are going crazy trying to figure out the answers. But I'm no scientist, so I didn't have any trouble. My answer is that that body is Professor Jordan's, and you two killed him and buried him there. And, Mrs. Smith, that's when you lost that luck. No. No, it isn't true. It isn't true. I said you're crazy, and I mean it. Not crazy enough to believe dentists were putting gold fillings in people's teeth a million years ago. Those are Professor Jordan's bones, Smith, and I can prove that you murdered him. You can't. I didn't. Yes. You see, that rock that killed him just fits the wound in the skull. And you know what? The killer left his fingerprints on that rock. Fingerprints? It's not possible. But it is. The scientists say that a million years ago, that rock was covered with clay, and that the murderer left four nice, clear fingerprints in the clay. Since then, the clay has hardened to become part of the rock itself, and those four fingerprints, there in that solid rock, match specimens of your prints that I got from your office. How's that for evidence? Fingerprints embedded for all eternity in the solid rock with which a murderer struck down his victim. The jury found Harry and Florence guilty without even leaving the box. The evidence was so conclusive. Of course, nobody believed that Professor Jordan's bones actually had been buried for a million years before they were found. But nobody could explain how Harry's fingerprints came to be embedded in a solid chunk of rock. Perhaps Harry could have, but he didn't dare to, for fear of making matters worse. I remember another scientist who... Oh, you have to go now. Perhaps you'll drop in again soon. Just look for the house on the other side of the cemetery. Of Dr. Weir. Dr. Weir returns shortly to tell you about next week's story. Meanwhile, here's a thought for all of us. While the war in Europe is over, the war in the Pacific is far from won. Our land troops still have many hundreds of miles of tough island hopping to go, and may even have to fight Japan's armies in China. That means we must continue to keep up the flow of ships, guns, munitions, and food to our far-flung Pacific outposts. And that means we must continue to buy bonds. The mighty seventh war loan drive is now on. Let's support it to the utmost. Buy till it hurts, and then some. Now, let us hear again from Dr. Weird. 
I hope you'll plan to drop in on me again next week. I want to tell you a story I call Picture of a Killer. It's an unusual tale about a killer who had never had his picture taken. And when a photographer finally did snap his picture, it was... But the rest of the story will have to wait until your next visit. Good night. Join us again next week at this same time for another visit with the strange Dr. Weir. The Strange Dr. Weir, directed by Jock McGregor, is written by Bob Arthur and David Cogan. It's presented by the makers of Adam Hat, the hats that are always top in quality. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. The Strange Dr. Weir. <laughs> Good evening. Come in, won't you? Well, what's the matter? You seem nervous tonight. Perhaps the cemetery outside my house has upset you. But speaking of the cemetery reminds me of a story I want to tell you. About a murderer who was dead and buried, but who kept on killing people just the same. I call it Revenge from the Grave. story, Revenge from the Grave, begins in a suburban section of a large city. It is just midnight, and a full moon casts dark shadows beneath the trees that line the street. John Rogers, a businessman on his way home, turns a corner, but stops abruptly as a man with a scarf about his face steps out of the shadow. Just a moment, Rogers. Who are you? What do you want? I want to talk to you. Get out of my way. Not so fast. A gun? What are you threatening me with a gun for? What have you got that scarf covering your face for? Because my face? Well, my looks have changed in the month since I was executed and buried. But you recognize my voice, don't you, Roger? Yes. Ronaldo the Great. But you... You're dead. You died a month ago in the electric chair. Exactly. You were foreman of the jury that found me guilty. Guilty of murder. So... No! <laughs> <laughs> John Rogers' strange death remained a complete mystery to the police for a month. And then, early one evening, a pale-faced young man called upon Henry Wilson, the district attorney who had successfully convicted Ronaldo the Great, to tell him a story that Wilson found uh, quite impossible to believe. Now, wait a minute. Let me get this straight. You say your name is Walter Jones and that you used to be assistant to Reynaldo the Great. That's right, Mr. Wilson. I, I was his assistant for three years. I see. And you're trying to tell me that last month Reynaldo climbed out of his grave and murdered John Rogers? Is that it? Yes. You see, Mr. Wilson, the day of Reynaldo's execution, I visited him at the prison. He sent for me, you see, and I, I can still hear his voice as he greeted me. Well, Walter, so you came. Yes, Reynaldo. What can I do for you? Tomorrow... After I'm gone, you must get the names and addresses of the judge, the prosecutor, and the twelve jurymen who sent me to my death. Their names and addresses? Yes. Write them down in my secret notebook and be sure to bury that notebook with me. I... I don't understand. Each month, on the night of the full moon, I shall return from my grave to execute one of the fourteen... I shall not sleep in peace until they are all dealt with. And did you put the names and addresses in his coffin when he was buried? Yes, and now I'm positive that Ronaldo is using them to get in touch with the 14 men he sworn to kill. Please, Mr. Wilson. Tonight the moon is full. Unless you do something, Ronaldo will kill someone else. Perhaps even you. Oh, my boy. Go home and get some sleep and forget all this. <laughs> Nobody's going to be murdered tonight by Ronaldo's spook. I personally guarantee it. Only partly reassured, young Walter Jones left. 
District Attorney Henry Wilson went on with his interrupted reading until he heard the clock strike midnight. Suddenly, a loud knocking at his door startled him. All right, just a moment. Who are you? You don't recognize me, Wilson. Not with that scarf wrapped around your face, no. The scarf is to keep from innocent passers-by a sight that should remain forever hidden within the darkness of a moldering coffin. But my voice, surely you recognize that. Your voice? Ronaldo the Great. Oh, no, that's impossible. Yes, Ronaldo. Come to call on you tonight, the night of the full moon, to kill you. Like this? So you refuse to believe in the powers of the great Ronaldo, did you? Just as the others on my list still do. But they shall learn that not even the grave can stand between them and the fate that is theirs. Say, uh, Dr. Weird, what kind of a doctor are you? Well, I'm an M.D. of a different kind. Doctor of madness. And I am a D.H., doctor of hats. My counsel to all men is this. If your hats never seem to fit properly, if you're always tugging at the brim and fussing with the crown, remember that trying to doctor up a sick-looking hat isn't going to remedy the case. The best prescription is to get a hat that's designed from the start to keep in good shape and fit neatly. An Adam hat. Made of finest quality material, Adam hats have the stamina to wear well and are styled to the best taste. Color shades are distinctive and appropriate. For hats that reflect perfect craftsmanship, see the latest line of smartly fashioned Adam hats. Prices only $3.45 to $10. At all of the thousands of Adam hat stores and authorized dealers from coast to coast. Now, the good Dr. Weird. And now I'll continue my story, Revenge from the Grave. After the mysterious murder of District Attorney Wilson, young Walter Jones went to Judge Dexter, who had sentenced Ronaldo the Great to death. He told Judge Dexter the whole story of Ronaldo's vow of vengeance and was greeted, as he feared, with skepticism. Now, Jones, you want me to believe that Ronaldo the Great, dead and buried for two months, emerged from his coffin that night to strangle Wilson? It's true. I know it's true. If you really believe that, why didn't you go to the police immediately? They just have laughed at me. Besides, I didn't want to believe it was true. But tonight the moon is full again. Huh? And tonight he'll kill someone else unless we stop him. I know he will. Just what do you propose we do? We must go to the cemetery tonight. Just the two of us. And open Ronaldo's coffin. Take away that list of names and addresses that I buried with him. Then he'll be helpless. I see you believe all this, Jones. Well, just to set your mind at rest, I'll go to the cemetery with you and prove to you once and for all that Ronaldo the Great is dead and quite incapable of coming back to harm anyone. An hour later, the two men stood outside the small marble mausoleum where the body of Ronaldo the Great lay in its coffin. Walter Jones opened the door with a key, and they stepped inside. Then he shut it again and turned on the flashlight he had brought. Look, Judge. That's Ronaldo's coffin. Look at it, Judge. It's solid bronze, and it can be opened from the inside as well, well as from the outside. Pro- from the inside? Yes. That was Ronaldo's last instruction. The lid is fastened with a catch that can be worked from the inside. I see. Well, we're going to open it now. And I'll prove to you that in spite of everything, what you believe is impossible. There. Now shine the flashlight inside. You see? Ronaldo. There's Ronaldo the Great. Dead if I ever saw a dead man. Now, are you convinced? Look. There's the notebook with the names and addresses of the men he swore vengeance on. And in his hand, look, Judge. Merciful heavens, a revolver. The gun he shot John Rogers with. It, it must be. Oh, no, no, it's impossible. Quick. Oh, the flashlight. What's happened to it? Something. Something knocked it out of my hand. You fool, you dropped it. Pick it up and turn it on again. It's black as pitch in here. I. No. No, Ronaldo. I. Oh. Jones, what is it? 
Where are you? Jones, answer me. He cannot answer you, Judge Dexter. I have silenced him for the time being. <laughs> No, no. At your service, my dear judge. No, I don't believe it. It's not possible. You're dead. I saw your body there in the coffin. Quite true. I'm dead and I'm also alive. An interesting paradox, isn't it? Time now for you to suffer the fate to which you sentenced me. Don't no, let me go. Let me go. Oh, I die. I call the rape. The corn that you shall die and you shall. No, if you won't let me go, I have to shoot you. Now, where are my matches? Oh, yes. There, now I can see. Jones! Jones! Speak to me! Judge, what happened? I feel so funny. So weak. My chest hurt. Jones, I shot you with the gun we found hidden in Ronaldo's coffin. I had to. You would have killed me if I hadn't. I'd have killed you? Yes. I don't understand. What I do now. Listen, my boy. That last interview you had with Ronaldo in his cell, he hypnotized you before you left him. He ordered you to carry out his mad scheme of vengeance for him. I, I don't understand. He that. hypnotized you and told you that each night of the full moon, you would believe you were he, Ronaldo. That you'd talk like him and act like him. It was you who killed John Rogers and the district attorney. Just as you tried to kill me a moment ago. You couldn't help it, my boy. You were just carrying out a condemned man's diabolical scheme. I, I... <laughs> Jones. Jones. It's no use. He's gone. And Ronaldo the Great is really dead. At last. <laughs> Secret to how a dead man could continue to kill after his death. By hypnotizing his assistant into acting for him. <laughs> Clever, wasn't it? Lucky Judge Dexter found that gun where poor Walter Jones had unknowingly hidden it in Ronaldo's coffin. Oh, Ronaldo might still be coming to life on nights of the full moon to continue his diabolical plan of revenge. Hey, you weren't on that jury that convicted Ronaldo, were you? If you were, I'd certainly... Oh, you have to go now. But perhaps you'll visit me again soon. Just look for the house on the other side of the cemetery. The house of Dr. Weir. Adam Pat presents... to the brave men and women in our armed forces. Let us pray that they who have brought us so far along the road to freedom have not sacrificed in vain. And finally, let us hope that the end is near, that Japan will soon be defeated, and that our men and women overseas will return to a safe home in a peaceful world. And now for the story on tonight's Adam Hat program, as told by Dr. Weir. My story, Murder One Million B.C., begins in a house on the outskirts of a small city in New Mexico, the home of Professor Timothy Jordan, a renowned scientist. Inside his laboratory, engaged upon a mysterious experiment. In the living room, his wife, Florence, and his financial advisor, Harry Smith, confer with each other apprehensively. But 
Flo, will you say you don't know why Timothy asked me to be here at 11 this morning? No, no, I have no idea. I'm sure he doesn't suspect anything about us. It must be about his money. Money? What do you mean? Well, you know, I've been handling all his business affairs for the last two years. Yes? Well, a lot of money's been coming in from those new X-ray machines he invented. So much that I didn't think he'd miss a little of it. You mean you've been taking it? Well, just borrowing some of it for some investment that make me rich. Harry! You find out I'm stuck. Send me the chair. Will, too. What are you going to do? I don't know, but... If you were only out of the way... I could be doing it together all the way. Be careful. Here you come. Oh, Harry! Is that you? Uh, yes, Tim. And Harry just got here. Oh, good, good. Excellent. Harry Flo. I'm about to show you the most amazing thing science has ever achieved. What do you mean, Tim? Uh, I'm going to show you why I've had to ask you for all that money lately, and why I'll need another 100000 immediately. Another? Come along, both of you, in here in my laboratory. Tim, what's this all about? Tim, darling, it's wrong. All this machinery. What have you been doing in here? Suppose I told you that I've been building a time machine. A time machine? Yes, yes. Look, both of you. You see this big archway of white? A doorway that leads back into the unknown past as far as the year 1 million B.C. Tim, you're not serious. I'm perfectly serious. All I have to do is to close this switch. Now, watch. The archway. It seems to be getting all missed. Yes. That's a sign the current flowing through the these coils is opening a hole to the past. A hole we can step through as if it were a doorway. Now come, follow me, and in ten seconds, you'll find yourself on this earth as it was a million years ago. <laughs> Startled, Harry and Florence saw Professor Jordan step into the amazing machine he had built and vanish. Then fearfully, they followed him and abruptly found themselves standing at his side on a hot, dry desert sand. A brilliant sun burned in the sky overhead and strange birds flew through the air above them. Half a mile away to their left lay a vast body of water in which monstrous, nightmarish creatures were flashing. Harry and Florence stared about them as if they could not believe their eyes. Tim! Tim, is this real? This is New Mexico, as it was a million years ago. Tim, I don't know what to say. I, I just can't believe it. The past. We've come a million years into the past. And just by stepping back the way we came, we'll be in the present again in my laboratory in the year 1940 A.D. Think what that means. Think of being able to watch the burning of Rome, see Columbus discover America, view the signing of the Declaration of Independence. But it'll all be possible as soon as I can get more radium. More radium? Yes. Radium provides the power my time machine needs. That's why I have to have $100,000 at once, Harry. Yes, I see. Yes. Is it in this huh? stone? What's interesting? Stone? Oh, that's, that's just sandstone covered with clay. Well, Harry, uh, about the money. There isn't any money. No money? What do you mean? Just what I say. You've stolen it. Embezzled it. You'll go to jail, do you hear? I'll send you to the jail if it's the last thing oh, I do. Oh, no, you won't. No, I don't! <laughs> <laughs> It's all crushed in. Had to kill him. It was bad to go to jail. Oh, well, what are we going to do? I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to bury him right here. But his body, it may be found. And then... Oh, listen, don't you understand? This is a world a million years in the past. We'll bury Timothy here in the sand and then step back through the time machine in the laboratory. When we get there, he'll have been dead for a million years. Don't you see? He'll have been dead and buried for a million years and there won't be any body left to be found. There won't be any evidence at all. After Harry had struck down Professor Jordan, he and Flo hastily dug a deep grave in the sand with their hands. They put the body and the blood-stained rock into this grave and covered both with sand. Then hastily they stepped back 
threw the time machine into the laboratory and partly dismantled the machine so no one else could stumble on the secret. Then, after waiting, they announced Professor Jordan's disappearance. Everything went just as Harry planned. It was true that uh, Inspector Leroy of the local police department seemed a little uh, suspicious of Professor Jordan's disappearance. But, of course, he had no evidence. So, in due time, Harry and Flo were married. As they were returning from a long honeymoon, Harry said, Flo, I've been thinking about that time machine of Timothy's. What about it, Harry? That machine can make me the richest man on Earth. For example, suppose I took it to New York and used it to go back a hundred years. And suppose I bought up all the land where Times Square now. Harry! What is it? It's clipping. Grace Miller sent me. I just opened a letter and... Look at it. Let me see. Bones of ancient man found near residence of late Professor Jordan. While excavating for Highway 37, workmen today found fragments of skeleton of an ancient man buried in a formation of sand and rock. Robert Thompson, state geologist, state geological formation indicates the bones between 500,000 and a million years old and been preserved by the extreme dryness of soil. Great scientists suspect that a rock found beside the crushed in skull of the skeleton was apparently the weapon with which the prehistoric man was killed. Can it be bones? And the rock you killed him with? Harry, you said there wouldn't be any evidence left after a million years. We have nothing to worry about. Even if they did find a few old bones. Just the same, Harry. Let's not go back home. Let's get off the train. Turn around. Go someplace far away. That's absurd. In the first place, we look suspicious if we get to go back. In the second place, we've got to go back to get that time machine. Because it's going to make me the richest man in the world. <laughs> Harry succeeded in calming Florence's fears, and next morning they arrived home. They were having breakfast when an unannounced caller, Inspector Leroy, walked in. Uh, good morning, folks. Welcome home. What's the idea of barging in like this, Inspector? Uh, Mrs. Smith, uh, do you recognize this locket which was found and turned into the police department? Locket? Well, that's my gold locket that's been living for months. Well, what happened to it? It's a war and scratch. That's a million years old. Yes, doesn't it? Oh. And we found out an inscription inside as good as new, indicating your former husband gave it to you for a birthday present. All right, so it's Florence's locket. So what? As a matter of fact, I want to talk to you about that skeleton which was found out back of this house last week. You know about it, I suppose. Yes, we know about it. So what? It was a very interesting skeleton, Mr. Smith. A million years old, the scientists say. But this locket was found lying underneath it. Oh, what? Possible. Another thing about that skeleton, which is puzzling the scientists, it has gold fillings in its teeth. Gold fillings for Professor Jordan's dentist identifies those fillings he put into the professor's teeth himself. Oh, you crazy. No, it's the scientists who are going crazy trying to figure out the answers. But I'm no scientist, so I didn't have any trouble. My answer is that that body is Professor Jordan's, and you two killed him and buried him there. And Mrs. Smith, that's when you lost that lock. No. No, it isn't true. It isn't true. I said you're crazy, and I mean it. Not crazy enough to believe dentists were putting gold fillings in people's teeth a million years ago. Those are Professor Jordan's bones, Smith, and I can prove that you murdered him. You can't. I didn't. Yes. You see, that rock that killed him just fits the wound in the skull, and you know what? The killer left his fingerprints on that rock. Fingerprints? It's not possible, but it is. The scientists say that a million years ago, that rock was covered with clay, and that the murderer left Four nice, clear fingerprints in the clay. Since then, the clay has hardened to become part of the rock itself. And those four print fingerprints, there in that solid rock, match specimens of your prints that I got from your office. How's that for evidence? Fingerprints embedded for all eternity in the solid rock with which a murderer struck down his victim. <laughs> found Harry and Florence guilty without even leaving the box. The evidence was so conclusive. Of course, nobody believed that Professor Jordan's bones actually had been buried for a million years before they were found. But nobody could explain how Harry's fingerprints came to be embedded in a solid chunk of rock. Perhaps Harry could have, but he didn't dare to, for fear of making matters worse. I remember another scientist who... 
Oh, you'll have to go now. Perhaps you'll drop in again soon. Just look for the house on the other side of the cemetery of Dr. Weir. <laughs> Dr. Weird returns shortly to tell you about next week's story. Meanwhile, here's a thought for all of us. While the war in Europe is over, the war in the Pacific is far from won. Our land troops still have many hundreds of miles of tough island hopping to go, and may even have to fight Japan's army in China. That means we must continue to keep up the flow of ships, guns, munitions, and food to our far-flung Pacific outpost. And that means... We must continue to buy bonds. The mighty 7th Wall on Drive is now on. Let's support it to the utmost. Buy till it hurts, and then some. Now, let us hear again from Dr. Weir. I hope you plan to drop in on me again next week. I want to tell you a story I call Picture of a Killer. It's an unusual tale about a killer who had never had his picture taken. And when a photographer finally did snap his picture, it was... But the rest of the story will have to wait until your next visit. Good night. Yep. Can the dead return to life? Listen to the weird circle. Circle Time at the Ogden's Playhouse. Tonight we are to hear a radio adaptation of the Frederick Marriott story, The Werewolf. There's an eerie and unusual atmosphere to this story which makes it a good choice for this Weird Circle series. It's a story that recommends itself for good listening. In its own field, Ogden's Fine Cut Tobacco is the recommended choice for good smoking when rolling your own cigarettes. There's no substitute for quality. That's why Ogden's wins consistent top preference. Ogden's is the choice of smokers who demand the best. Try a package. You'll find Ogden's easy to roll, delightful to smoke. Yes, easy to roll, delightful to smoke. And now our story, The Werewolf, by Frederick Marriott. again the immortal tale, The Werewolf. raving mad by the time I got him to the hospital. It was brain fever. How's the boy? Poor little lad. He says they walked all the way from the Hearts Mountains. And he's only 11. He was starved. Ate his supper as if he'd never seen food. Oh, there's tragedy back of all this, good wife. When the boy stopped me on the road and asked for help, there was terror in his eyes. <laughs> Quiet, boy, quiet. Nothing to fear. 
You are safe here by the sea. There are no wolves here. Just lie quietly, boy. I want to talk to you. Yes, sir. By what name are you called? Herman. Herman Clarence. Well, Herman, I'm afraid I have sad news for you. My father is dead? Yes. That is not sad news. I thank heaven. What? Why? Because... Because my father is free of the evil one and his curse. Now there's only me. But I must go. I must hurry. I must get far away from the forest and the mountains. Now lie back, child. Wait a bit. There are no mountains or forests here. Only the calm sea. What do you fear, Herman? Let me sit beside you. Don't be afraid. You... You kissed me. Is that so strange? Oh, it is very strange. You're kind and good, and, and yet you are a woman. Poor oh, motherless little one. Oh, it might help you lose some of your fears, boy, if you told us something about yourself. You were born in the Hearts Mountains? No, my dear. We lived in Hungary on the state of a great noble. My father was steward. And what about your mother? She ran away from us when we were very small. My brother Caesar said it was because of her that my father killed his noble lord. Oh, I see. Now go on with your tale. Uh, father took all the money we owned and put us in the sleigh. We drove fast and far until we were out of Hungary. Then he bought a cottage among the tall firs deep in the Hearts Mountains. And there we grew up. Mm, your brother and you. And our little sister, Marcella. We loved her very much. Weren't you very lonely? Oh, the winters were long and dark. Father went hunting every day, but shut us indoors for safety from the wolves. He also forbade us to light the fire, so we used to creep under heaps of bear skins to keep warm. We'd talk of that happy time when, when the snow would melt, the leaves burst out, the birds sing again, and we could go outdoors and play in our garden. Mm, a sad life for children. No, not sad. We were happy with each other, we three. Until... Yes, Herman, until... The howl of wolf. Father had come from his hunting and had kindled a fire. And we were sitting around it when suddenly a wolf howled close under the window. My father seized his gun, looked to the priming, and ran out, shutting the door behind him. We waited hours. And it was nearly midnight when my brother Caesar went to the door. I've heard no report of a gun. Father must have chased the wolf a long way. Or else... Oh, no. Father's all right, Marcella. I will look out and see if he's coming. Take care, Caesar. The wolves may be close and we cannot kill them. I'll be careful. Hmm. I see nothing but moonlight and snow. Come in, Caesar. Father will come when he can. I'm hungry. We've had no supper, but we'll be punished if we do not wait. Father will be glad to have food ready. Let's cook it for him and for ourselves. Very well. I'll get down some venison. But, Marcella, can you dress it? Surely. Haven't I often helped Father? Get the iron pot, Herman. There. I've cut off lots of slices. Now, put the fat in the pot. Oh, be careful of the fire, little sister. Mm, look out the window, Herman. Someone's coming. It's Father. And there's a man with him leading a horse. Yes, and there's a lady in the saddle. See how the moon shines on her white face and that lovely flaxen hair. I'm frightened. Why, Sister Darling? She's beautiful. Hola! Hola! Caesar, open the door. We have guests. Enter, good sir. I have little to offer, but you and your daughter are welcome. Friend Hunter, it was good fortune for us that you were out so late. We had ridden far in fear of our lives. And we would have died of cold and hunger in those mountains had you not heard our horn and saved it. Come, mistress. Seat yourself by the fire. The warmth is pleasant. And the smell of food is pleasanter still. You have young cooks here, mine herr. <laughs> yes, these are my children. Caesar, Herman, and Marcella. Welcome, sir. We have supper already, Father. Before I eat, I must put up my horse. Oh, I will take care of him. Let me go with you. Oh, you needn't trouble. But if you like, come along. I have a shed outside. What fine boys you are. Come close to me. Mmm, good strong arm. Sturdy shoulder. 
Why do you tremble, lad? You're so white and shining. There's no reason to fear me. You're a stranger. I'm not strange. We shall be friends, hmm? But where's the little girl? She's afraid. I think she's hidden herself in bed. Gone to bed without any supper? <laughs> she must have been a bad little girl. She's not bad, lady. No, she's good. <laughs> You say you were lured away by a large white wolf which howled at this very window? Yes, I saw it about 30 yards off. The animal retreated slowly and I followed. I didn't like to fire until I was sure that my shot would take effect. A white wolf? Of course you were anxious to shoot such a very rare animal. The wolf would leave me far behind, then stop and snarl defiance at me. Then start off at speed again as I neared it. It led me further and further up the mountain to an open space in the forest. There it stopped and growled. I raised my gun to shoot when suddenly the wolf disappeared. Disappeared? How strange. I thought the moonlight on the snow was playing me some trick. But no, she was gone. And that's when I heard your horn. The creature passed us just as we came out of the woods into that blade. I nearly shot it myself. But since she led you to our rescue, I'm glad I let the wolf escape. Father, that open blade is the home of the evil ones. Evil ones? What does the boy mean? Oh, superstition has it that strange and wicked beings haunt these mountains. Oh, I must hear more of these legends. Evil spirits interest me. Yeah, I confess I was glad to see that you were mortal. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> My daughter, Christine, and I are just creatures of flesh and blood. <laughs> yes, I assure you, I'm only a woman with very human appetites. And right now, I, I have a great desire for sleep. My father made room for all of us, and we crept into our beds. But we couldn't sleep. Father and the strange hunter sat up all night before the fire, drinking and talking. Our ears were ready to catch the slightest whisper. You say you come from Hungary? Even so, my herr. I served a noble house, but my master was cruel. It ended in my giving him a few inches of my hunting knife. So we fled for our lives. Well, we are countrymen then and brothers in misfortune. I too have fled for my life. Your name, ma'am? Krantz. What? Krantz? I, I have heard your story. I am your kinsman, Wilfred of Bonsdorf. Well, a toast then to welcome you, cousin. You and your daughter must stay here as long as you choose. So the huntsman and his daughter, Christine, stayed on in the cottage. The two men hunted each day, and Christine stayed with us and did the household duties. Father was becoming very attentive to Christine. They would often sit up at night talking in low tones before the fire. Then, several weeks later, we learned that Father had asked Christine in marriage. You may take my child, Krantz, and my blessing with her. I will duly value her. Uh, there is no priest in this wild country. Well, there must be some ceremony between you to satisfy your father. Will you? Will you both consent that I marry you after my own fashion? I will. I will. Then take her by the hand and swear. I swear. By all the spirits of the heart's mountain. Nay. Nay, why not by heaven? Because it is not my humor. Surely you will not thwart me. Yes, but... Why swear by that in which I do not believe? Father, no, please don't marry her. She's still Marcella. This is scarcely any affair of yours, child. Well, will you be married, or shall I take my daughter away with me? Proceed. Here is the oath, writ out on this parchment. Read it. And swear. By all the spirits of the heart's mountains, I take Christine for my wedded wife. I will ever cherish and love her. My hand shall never be raised to harm her. And if I fail in this my vow, may all the vengeance of the spirits fall upon me and upon my children. May they perish by the vulture or by the beasts of the forest. Why, why this is horrible. I, I can't... Swear, swear. Oh, all this I... I swear. <laughs> Strange behavior from your children, my husband, on our wedding night. Stop crying, Marcella. 
I'm sorry, Christine. Never mind, my dear husband. I'm not angry. But from now on, the children are my concern. They shall obey me. And I shall love the little darlings. Friends, the legend of the werewolf is one that has lived a long time in the pages of classical folklore. Many of you are familiar with the legend, and no doubt many of you have a preconceived idea of what comprises the climax to tonight's Weird Circle story. Roll your own cigarette smokers everywhere know that there isn't any legend to the story of smoking satisfaction when your choice of tobacco is Ogden's Fine Cut, and you know what to expect every time you light a cigarette roll with Ogden's. You're certain there can be only one result, complete smoking enjoyment. There's a smooth goodness to Ogden's, a distinctive taste and uniform quality that makes Ogden's, O-G-D-E-N apostrophe S, Ogden's Fine Cut Tobacco, the leading choice of people everywhere, discerning roll-your-own cigarette smokers who insist on the very best. Try Ogden's and you're sure of top-flight smoking satisfaction. You'll agree that Ogden's is easy to roll, delightful to smoke. Yes, easy to roll, delightful to smoke. And now back to our story. Krantz, a fugitive from Hungarian cruelty, had fled with his small children, Caesar, Herman, and Marcella, to a rude hut deep in the Hartz Mountains. One winter night, while pursuing a white wolf, Krantz is hailed by a stranger and his beautiful daughter, Christine, who were lost in the mountains. He invites them to his humble home, and being glad for the good company he thinks they will be, he begs them to stay on as his guests for as long as they choose. In the days that follow, Krantz falls in love with the beautiful Christine, and though his little daughter cries out in fearful premonition of things to come, he marries her in a strange pagan ceremony. The next morning, Wilfred the hunter mounted his horse and rode away. Things went on much as before the marriage, except that Christine showed us no kindness now. She often struck us and took special pleasure in ill-treating Marcella. One night, my little sister shook us as we slept. Wake up, brother. Wake up, Herman. Hmm? What's the matter, Marcella? She's gone out. Gone out? Yes, in her night clothes. I saw her get out of bed. Then she looked at father to make sure he still was asleep. Then she went out the door. A wolf. She'll be torn to pieces. Oh, no. Much as I hate her, that would be too horrible. Well, what can have made her go out all undressed in the deep snow? She's strange. She's dreadful. Her eyes flash fire when they look at me. Her teeth are like an animal. She certainly eats queerly. Have you noticed she doesn't like to sit at the table? While well, getting supper, I've seen her tear at a piece of meat that wasn't even cooked. There she is in the firelight. She's in her white nightdress. Washing her face and hands in the water pail. Father hasn't even waked up. Shh. She's going back to bed. We might as well go to sleep now. But we'll watch again tomorrow night. The next night and every night, our stepmother rose from bed and left the cottage. And every night the wolf howled under our windows. And always on her return... Christine washed herself, then crept back to bed, and always my father slept soundly. Well, the, the time came when my brother could stand it no longer. Caesar, why have you come to bed all fully dressed? I'm going to find out about these midnight walks. You'll tell father? Not until I know where she goes and what she does. Caesar, you don't mean that you... Yes, tonight I'm going to follow her. No, Caesar, please don't. Please don't, I'm afraid. I know you're brave, but... I wish you wouldn't go, brother. I'm going now. There's no use talking. She's getting up now. Quiet, you two. There she goes to the door. Be careful, Caesar. Be careful. She took father's gun. Oh, I'm so frightened. So am I. 
I'm shaking all over. I wonder how long we'll have to wait. A shot. Father will surely wake now and find out about her. No. He's still asleep. Someone's coming. Oh, I hope. Oh, it's not Caesar. It's Christine. Shh. Look at her. Marcella. Her dress is all covered with blood. Now, what's she doing? Uh, huh? Who's there? Lie still, dearest. It's only me. Oh. I'm just relighting the fire to warm some water. Hurry back, Christine Line. You should be asleep at this time of night. We watched our stepmother change her linen and burn the garments. Her leg was bleeding. She bandaged it and sat before the fire. But where was Caesar? And how did Christine get the wound and less from his gun? Oh, trembling in our bed, we waited. Waited till dawn. Father awoke. Father? Well, what is it, Herman? Father, where is my brother Caesar? But what do you mean, son? Oh, he went out in the night. Marcella and I waited for him. He's not come back. Merciful heaven. I was restless last night and thought I heard someone lift the latch. Dear me, husband, what has become of your gun? My gun? But, great heaven, it's gone. Caesar took it. Herman, get me the broad axe. I'm going to find Caesar. Oh, I didn't need to go out. What has happened to her? She still. <laughs> your whimpering will not help. Here comes your father now. Father. Father's carrying Caesar. Torn to pieces. Oh. Clear the table. There. The body of my oldest son. <laughs> Quiet, children. Tell <laughs> Husband, your boy must have taken the gun to shoot a wolf. The animal must have been too powerful for him. Poor boy. At that terrible moment, I wanted to tell Father all we knew, but Marcella held my arm and looked so imploringly at me that I kept silent. She and I were sure that Christine had some connection with our brother's death. Father dug a grave and piled stones on it. And for days, he, he just sat and stared at the fire, mourning for Caesar. Our stepmother's wanderings continued. One day, Father again took down his gun to go hunting, but soon returned. Would you believe it, Christine? The wolves, addition to the whole breed, have dug up the body of my poor boy. And there's nothing left of him but bones. Indeed. Then you must build a new grave. Father... A wolf howls under our window every night. Well, what? Why didn't you tell me? Wake me the next time you hear it. I'll get that wolf. Have you not yet learned that it is safest to leave wolves alone? Why, Christine, your eyes are wild and, and you're almost snarling at me. But I'm so afraid for you, dear husband. We never heard the wolf howl under our window again. Oh, and when at last spring came, and I helped my father with our small farm, Marcella was always with us, for we couldn't bear to have her out of our sight. Our stepmother stopped going out on her nightly rambles. One day, she came out to us and said she was going to collect some herbs father wanted, and that Marcella must go to the cottage to watch for dinner. Well, Marcella obeyed, and we saw my stepmother disappear into the forest in the opposite direction, so felt no danger for my little sister. But about an hour later... Marcella! She's by herself! Run, Herman, run! Uh, Good heaven. Look, the white wolf. Freaking out of our cottage. Kill us, Father! I have no gun. We're too late. It's gone. Oh. Oh, my little Marcella. The wolf has hurt her terribly. She's bleeding, Father. She's dying. Marcella. Marcella, my darling. Speak to me. The white wolf. <laughs> What's wrong? 
Oh, how horrible. Poor child. Oh, it must have been that great white wolf which passed me just now and frightened me so. She's quite dead. Oh, my poor husband. How horrible. How horrible. We dug a grave for my darling little sister and did everything we could to protect it against wolves. Oh, I was alone now. So, so awfully alone. But no longer afraid of my stepmother. My heart was full of hate and revenge. That very night, I saw Christine get up and go out of the cottage. I dressed quickly and half opened the door. The moon was very bright, and I could see Marcella's grave. But I saw something else. Something so horrible that I turned cold in my heart and ran to wake my father. Father! Father, get up and dress. Hurry! Uh, what? The wolves again? I'll be right there. Get my gun. I, I have it, Father. Come. Herman, stop. Who is that crouching on Marcella's grave? Christine. Yes. In her white nightdress. She's digging with her hands. She's throwing the stones behind her. Her, her face is as cruel as a wild beast. Oh. Oh, she's destroying Marcella's grave. Your gun, Father, shoot. Yes, my son, yes. Pray that my hand holds steady. <laughs> Heaven forgive me. I have killed my beautiful Christine. No. No, look, Father. The body on Marcella's grave. The body you've killed is, is not my stepmother. It's not Christine. No. No, it's the white wolf. The white wolf which lured me into the forest. The white wolf that killed my children. Oh, I... I see it all now. My oath. My oath to the spirits of the heart's mountains. The spirits of the heart's mountains. I take Christine for my wedded wife. I will ever cherish and love her. My hand shall never be raised to harm her. And if I fail in this, my vow, may all the vengeance of the spirits fall upon me and upon my children. May they perish by the vulture or by the beasts of the forest. <laughs> Poor fool mortal who had a werewolf. <laughs> Your beautiful Christine, a werewolf. A werewolf. <laughs> stop, demon, stop. I shall go mad. <laughs> Come, my son, my little Herman. You at least may escape this awful curse. We must flee for our lives. Away from these evil forests to the sea. There you'll be safe, my son. There you will be safe. of the past, we have brought you the werewolf. Bell keeper, toll the bell. be another Weird Circle presentation at the Ogden's Playhouse next week at this same time. This is your invitation to join our story circle for a half hour of unusual radio entertainment. Meanwhile, remember the name Ogden's when in need of a cigarette tobacco. It's a name you won't forget after trying a cigarette rolled with this choice tobacco. Men who know a quality smoke prefer Ogden's. You too will prefer Ogden's after tasting its unequaled goodness. You'll find Ogden's easy to roll, delightful to smoke. Yes, easy to roll, delightful to smoke. Next week at this time, another Weird Circle story, The Old Nurse's Tale, by Elizabeth Gaskell. Be sure to listen. If you smoke a pipe, try Ogden's Cut Plug. 
It's a rich, smooth pipe tobacco. 